Um, I have a shirt that says save the chubby unicorns. I love it. That is so cool. <laughs> so it made me really happy when I saw that. Darth Luke. I'm probably gonna I'm gonna have to put him up, otherwise he'll be a big part of this broadcast. Oh, see, my mine's behaved. Oh, sweet baby. Yeah, Darth yeah, is you also you also got part of the peak of the costume closet there. <laughs> love it. Love it. Yeah. I was I was rehearsing this morning. Yes. Yeah. Um I, I sing loudly, please. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, let me see. I'm gonna leave this just like it is. Let me go put him up really quick. Come here. Okay. Cool. Yeah. All right. You ready to do this thing? Yeah. Um, Caitlin mentioned that uh, Tatiana wanted her bio short. So I didn't know. I wanted to. No problem. We'll, we'll take that. care of it. I have never emceed virtually, so this is a new experience for me. Tell jokes. Make me laugh. They'll get okay. it. <laughs> laugh at my dumb jokes. Everybody wins. Perfect. See? Already happening. Yeah, time to suit up. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay, let me pull up. Um, for Alyssa's that's recorded. Yeah, Would that should not... be loaded. It should be loaded in um, the panel is normally where it is. Yep. So let me just see. Do you want me to do that or do you want to do it? Uh, either or. Share. Um, it's... Yep, I see it. So I found it. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, if under the um, uh, at the top under sharing, there's the mm -hmm. little like play button. Under that yes. is a drop down that says main screen, and then there is her video. Okay, it's grayed out for me. I can't. Then I guess I'm the only one with those permissions. <laughs> okay. Well, that's easy enough. Uh, by default, looks like I'm doing it. Looks like it's you. Oh, wow, it's already hot. Okay. Yeah, it's getting warm. <laughs> um, I turned the AC down in advance, but you know. Yeah, actually, I should probably do that. Oh, man. My hair's a mess today. All right, let me get up my, our lyrics so that we have them. Yeah, I printed them out. Yeah, the only, the only one I have a little trouble is the, the last, the second to last line, because it's like, it's I think it's like one syllable off. And so like Which you have one? to adjust it. Um, is you ever be free from fighting these guys? Oh yeah, that one. Yeah. Um. Uh, um. Uh, let me look at the. Okay. Uh, for the pro, here we go. Is this all surprise? Second job that I despise. The only guarantee. 
You'll you never will be... never be free from fighting these yeah. hypo. You'll, you'll you never will be free. never be yeah. free. That that sounds better. Because I was I was I kept like. Will never. Be. Yeah, it's yeah. I apologize. I I wrote them, and so here's what I do. Like I'll write them, and then when I'm doing it. Sometimes I'll change words. I'm like, oh, that sounds better. Yeah, and then yeah, I don't go yeah. update the lyrics because I've never yeah. had to show them before. <laughs> yep. Yeah, no. So when I was rehearsing this morning, that was the one that caught me. So I'm glad I mentioned that it to you. That's a good, yes. Yeah. All I'm right. So we'll change that. Good morning, Tatiana. Hello. I'm excited to see what this fun and exciting thing is today. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm still not sure if we're live or not. It says recording. Okay. We might be live. Technical difficulties all around this morning. Let's see. Um, yep, we just lost her. Uh, Caitlin, if you're I'm on. I'm here. Or, I'm just. Okay, are we are we live? No. Yes. If anybody is in the audience and can hear us, feel free to pop in the chat and say that you hey. <laughs> yes, you, you've been live. I mean, it says it's recording, but it usually there's like a go live thing. And I don't see it. Behind the scenes of GrimCon. Oh yeah, we should get our, our pre-shot picture. Oh, 1000%. Oh, <laughs> enter my horn here oh your hair looks so good with that with the thing it's okay cheers <laughs> i'm obsessed and tatiana by the way hi trisha nice to meet you all right let's see how tatiana came out in that pose because yep that's perfect tatiana brilliant god you, you weren't ready for it so it's <laughs> awesome perfect those perfect. are honestly the best photos ever like when i was doing uh -huh. headshots um for theater Fifth. like the uh -huh. best ones were always like unplanned. We are definitely live. Oh, good. I'm glad. Let's get serious, serious, serious. How are you feeling this morning, Tatiana? Any more gremlins? Yeah. <laughs> no, we're good. We're doing good. Doing good. Okay. Gremlins. There's a story here. Uh, it turns out that uh, Tatiana works in security because computers are not her friend. Mm. <laughs> uh, like right before this, my uh, my internet started to like go in and out. Uh, I was on another meeting, and I, uh, I obviously nothing as entertaining as this. And I, uh, yeah, my internet started going in and out. Like it like pushed pushed me out of a pushed me out of the uh, Zoom I was on, and I was like, shit, that's gonna be bad. And oh, so no. should we swear in, in large audiences? So uh, so then I, I tried restarting my computer. Of course, that led to 30 minutes of updates. So oh, now on no. different computer, it's fine. All is well, all is well. Everything's on fire. This is fine. This is a good time. Oh. Bye. I, I'm sad that one, my hair is not a fun color, and two, that I don't have a unicorn hat, hood, sweater. I'm gonna have to procure one of these. I'm gonna have to procure one of these. Yeah, they. Um, I got actually mine for my last GrimCon. That's why I got it. Come in handy. I mean, mm -hmm. I feel like Bryson wears his on a day-to-day -day basis. Right, Bryson? I uh, do wear it a fair amount. Um, and I'm going to be changing into my summer unicorn after this. So I'm wearing the black one because it it matches the song that Trisha and I are going to do after your keynote. Okay. Good. You're good, welcome good, good. to join us in it if you like. Oh, boy. Uh, singing? Um, yeah. Yes. Just harmonize along. You can just hum. <laughs> okay. All right. I'll hum along. I'll I'll, I'll play that game. <laughs> I'm not going to ambush you that way, Tatiana. Oh, it's fine. It's totally fine. I used to be in theater, so I'm totally used to it. Um, oh, is that why, is that why you put up with my hijinks? That's right. 
amazing. Uh, performance, uh, design, yep. Yep. everything. Uh, acting. <clears throat> yep. Amazing. Amazing. Yep. So yeah, you know, you guys are learning all kinds of things about me today. Yeah. My so my one degree is in political science. Uh, <laughs> my other degree is in theater. That's right. Okay, so we have a lot to talk about because my degree is also in theater. Hey, see that? So fun. I've never what been. What about in you? Uh, you should have been. You'd have fit right in. Uh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, Trisha, acting, design, all lighting, of all of it. Okay. Yep. Nice. I got a generalist degree, um, but I focused primarily on performance, um, sang opera. Whole nine. Wow. That's like that's like real skill. That's real skill. I I acted, which also I guess is skill. it's a very real skill. <laughs> it's a very real skill. Different different type of skill. My voice not so great. Not so great. <laughs> well, we're about to test it because we are now officially starting GrimCon. So welcome everybody to the fifth GrimCon. Um, this is also going to be the start of us on the new permanent schedule. So when GrimCon was started back at the beginning of the pandemic, we were there to fill that gap in the the, the conference circuit because there wasn't anything. Everything was canceled. And we're like, well, let's still find a way to bring community together. Um, part of why I'm really excited about Tatiana's talk is, of course, the other part is the new speaker track. And so continuing to try to bring new voices because diversity is so critical to security. So the schedule going forward is going to be continuing to try to find those parts of the schedule where there's nothing else. So we're we're filling that gap and we're going to be in July and we're going to be in that last week of December when there's nothing else going on. And we've already started to have some plans about how we might do a hybrid conference next year in Washington, D.C. Um, and so already started brainstorming some ideas on a different way to do a conference. So it's not like any other conference you've ever been to. Um, some other housekeeping items, um, hashtag GrimCon, feel free to take pictures and highlight what all of our great speakers are doing today. Uh, shout out to Texas Cyber Summit and Hacking is Not a Crime um, for supporting us. If you aren't already on the Discord, go to the GrimCon website, jump into the Discord there and join the conversation. Um, also want to uh, give a shout out to uh, Merrill and Wade, who are the MCs over on track two. So, while Trisha and I are going to be doing shenanigans on track one, they will be just as equally shenanigans on track two. Um, and Trisha and I are also going to, after the, the keynote and before the closing keynote, which is going to be with Chris Trunser, Matt Hussein, and Tim Nadine and me, called The Pale Horseman, uh, we're going to do a special musical number. We intentionally did not rehearse it. We know that the sound is going to be a little bit off, and that's part of what we think matches the analogy of cybersecurity and getting started into it. Um, last shout out to Dwayne Dunstan, who is leading a workshop on the cognitive science approach for teaching cybersecurity. So again, thank you so much to everybody coming on board and helping make this awesome. Tatiana? Uh-oh, she freeze? Oh, no. Ground control. Oh, and we lost her. Uh, right. Wait, technology is great when it works. Tech, tech, technology. Yeah, right. It's not so hard for me. Yeah, shut nice. Up. That was good. I didn't want to be mean about it as I thought about what? the lyric, but then I was just like, you know what? T can take it. She's awesome. Listen, the gremlins on this, in my, I can't. I just, I can't. I can't do it. Last week, I locked myself out of my phone my computer but then i am using a different computer and now this computer won't connect to the internet Ugh. all fine it's fine it's great well you are now officially presenter and we are ready to kick off when you are okay well so uh uh as long as you can see my uh webcam i mean that's all i need to do so um i'll i'll start there um all right so Thank you for having me. I uh, I appreciate you uh, having this very important conversation. Uh, my name is Tatiana Bolton, and I'm the policy director for cybersecurity and emerging threats at R Street Institute, where Bryson is also a senior fellow. 
Uh, prior to joining our street, I was the policy director at the Cyberspace Solarium Commission and the cyber policy lead at CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, which so many people still don't know about. Uh, sad. As part of the cybersecurity workforce, I'm watching emerging threats, uh, things that are going to impact us in the future and perhaps perhaps 20, perhaps two years down the line. And some of what I see matches the focus of policymakers and some doesn't. So I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say that you're not really surprised by all of the high profile ransomware incidents this year. You saw the threat of ransomware coming, although pol many policymakers didn't. Ransomware has now made the top of the list of the most salient threats facing the cybersecurity community today. Both CISA, the White House, and the UK's GCHQ have all put it on the top of their lists of threats facing the global community. Uh, and thanks to the number of recent newsworthy hacks, Kaseya, JBS, Colonial Pipeline, to name the most noteworthy, ransomware is finally getting the attention it deserves. But I'm here today to discuss what I believe is an even greater threat to the cybersecurity community and one that isn't making headlines in the news, our lack of diversity uh, in our workforce. So let's just take a moment to compare the two threats. Yes, so ransomware is a massive threat that has recently affected more than 37% of organizations, according to Sophos. From driving gas panics in June to more recently forcing grocery stores and schools offline, ransomware has affected all areas of public life. But while 37% is a high number, it's nothing compared to the 100% of organizations affected by poor diversity numbers and a tapped cybersecurity workforce. I mean, which one of your organizations isn't affected by it? The Cybersecurity Ventures official annual cybercrime report estimated that ransomware could cost companies approximately $20 billion in lost revenue. But on the workforce side, uh, the United States on the whole is losing somewhere in the neighborhood of several trillion dollars in lost revenue by keeping women, for example, on the sidelines of our workforce. But before we dig into the problem, let's define it. Diversity is partly what you're thinking, race, ethnicity, gender, and other underrepresented communities. But I'm also referring to people with different native language skills, for example. In 2015, researchers discovered the snow globe malware, also known as Babar. And Babar is also the name of a popular French TV show. And this linguistic and cultural clue helped French-speaking researchers trace it back to its original creator, France's external intelligence agency. Teams with language diversity bring a broader understanding to a cyberspace that is global by default. Diversity also means bringing in the neurodiverse community. The Cyberspace Solarium Commission, of which I was part, recommended that the neurodiverse should be included in the cyber workforce as they bring unique skills to the table. Some on the autism spectrum, for example, are adept at spotting patterns where others can't. That's why military, national security, and health organizations in the UK, Australia, and Israel have developed special hiring programs to attract neurodiverse individuals. Companies like Bank of America have gone further, incorporating neurodiverse talent as part of their hiring strategy. It also includes hiring people who come from different economic backgrounds, working styles, and thought processes. Because diversity of thought isn't just relegated to men versus women or black versus white. With a holistic understanding of diversity, we can paint a better picture of how to foster a truly diverse cybersecurity workforce, even if it shows us how much work there's left to be done. Look, diversity is not just about checking boxes or being woke. It's a real concern for the overall security of the industry and its effectiveness. From my perspective, working on cybersecurity through a national security lens, it's detrimental to our defense. A lack of diversity can make organizations weaker to vulnerabilities. A homogenous workforce tends to execute similar working styles, similar perspectives, and similar problem-solving techniques, and that's dangerous. These teams are also more susceptible to groupthink, falling into patterns of behavior, and have a tendency to avoid change. MIT found that this environment doesn't just mean a likelihood of more mistakes. It means that, unfortunately, people are more likely to copy poor decisions within a team. Now that means we may not see uh, the ransomware attack coming because our existing workforce has worked together, learned together, and think the same way. A recent study found that inclusive teams 
made both better and quicker decisions. People still tell me that pulling in diversity is just weakening the talent pool, but that simply isn't true. According to the Harvard Business Review, diverse teams demonstra demonstrably perform better, focusing, focusing more on the facts and processing those facts more carefully. They're also more innovative. In fact, companies that performed best in the last recession were those who had the most women on their corporate boards, helping demonstrate the point that diversity in the workforce leads to improved performance, and cybersecurity isn't any different. Attaining this objective means expanding the concept of what society sees as a cybersecurity professional, including in the leadership ranks. Cyber is about more than computer science. Not that women and minorities are bad at that either and requires skills like analysis, creative thinking, and communication, at which t women tend to excel. New blood and new thinking is advantageous in many ways. In 2021, a new female employee at FireEye caught a discrepancy in an employee file and flagged it for per proper procedure for immediate review as potentially fraudulent. Most veteran, veteran employees, Kevin Mandy, Kevin Mandia argued on the cipher brief, might not have flagged it as a top security priority. But because she had a different perspective, this new employee alerted FireEye to one of the biggest breaches in recent memory. If it hadn't been for her, who knows when we would have discovered the SolarWinds breach. This is just one example of how we're missing out on still having a predominantly homogenous cybersecurity workforce in 2021. Women, for example, were among the first programmers, invented the science of cryptography, and worked as code girls as early as 1941. But 80 years later, the field consists of a mere 24% women. That's not a lot of progress to show for the 21st century. For African Americans, they make up only 11.9% of the information security analysts in 2020. Latin Americans fared little better, taking up only 15.8% of the workforce. These figures don't inspire confidence, and they don't make much sense considering the sustained high demand for talent, which has become so overwhelming to the tune of 464,000 vacancies, that's of today, that companies are struggling to hire competent and trained people. So we're, we've, we're disappointed with two aspects of the hiring process, but the workforce remains woefully homogenous. And with such a gap in the workforce, it's hard not to be disappointed. But it also raises the question of why our cybersecurity workforce looks the way it does. How do we get here? Well, first, I, I think too many people continue to think it isn't a problem. Second, structurally, the winnowing starts early. Reducing, reducing the number of women and minorities in our particular field due to a lack of appeal to girls at an early age, a lack of mentors, and unconscious as well as overt bias. Women are not given constructive criticism to improve and don't get promoted at the same rates as men. Moreover, assertiveness, which is seen as a leadership quality in men, remains seen as a negative in women. Pay inequities continue to persist in the field and the workforce at large according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. What's worse, women of color face even steeper challenges in both pay equity and promotion than their white female counterparts. As the Director of Strategic Threat Development at Recorded Future argued, the wide variety of people and experience we have defending our networks, the better our chances of success. And these barriers prevent women from participating fully in the cybersecurity field. Despite the efforts of organizations like Blacks in Cyber, Black Cybersecurity Association, Empower, and Share the Mic in Cyber, and many, many, uh, many more, many Blacks or minorities with interest in cybersecurities are struggling to break in. And with the growing need for more cyber professionals, it's imperative that we acknowledge the effects of the lack of diversity and take a look at some of the barriers to entry. So along with pipeline issues, barriers to entry have played a role in stifling diversity. No matter the field or person, everyone needs their first break for a job. Understandably, due to its nature, recruiters and hiring managers within the field of cybersecurity must be highly selective with its candidates. However, to diversify the pool of candidates, there should be room to make room. And by making room, I mean that we have to shift and take a look at some of the factors that hinder diverse individuals from considering the field, applying for jobs, or getting hired. 
Some of the things to consider include the lack of mentors, need for technical training, lack of financial resources, language and language and ads and cybersecurity jobs, criteria for entry level roles like traditional educational background, and last but certainly not least, the unwillingness to give someone a chance. In the interest of time, I'll share my thoughts on three barriers, mentorship, recruitment, and entry-level job criteria. To start, people strive to become who or what they can see. It allows them to have a living visual representation of a goal. If you ask children what they want to be when they grow up, how many would say cybersecurity analyst? Answers like firefighter, teacher, doctor, hairdresser aren't shocking because many more than likely, the child has experienced or seen someone working in that role. Cybersecurity is a bit different. While we work in the role, uh, it's not seen as glamorous, and the good guys are in the background, and only those interested in it talk about it. And that's why I started the Making Space Pledge, to ensure professionals that up-and-comers see on stages and panels and Zooms aren't just white men. They're all of us, and they include women and people of color, a pledge to which more than 50 organizations and individuals have signed on. Starting with this small step, we can get more talent interested in cybersecurity and grow the diversity of our workforce from an early age. So what would make the industry appealing to someone who hasn't heard of it and doesn't know anyone who works in it? A mentor. Mentorship is one of the most powerful ways to influence and possibly change the course of someone's life. After all, an HR study found that mentees are five times more likely to get promoted than those without a mentor, and women and minorities are much less likely to have a mentor than white men. We need more and more diverse professionals in the field to make themselves available and to advocate for their mentees, a step that goes beyond answering questions but truly supporting young professionals' careers. And by doing so, the field will seem less foreign and hopefully become more appealing to those who were not previously exposed to its opportunities. Secondly, we need to take a look at how and where the jobs are advertised. If people don't know about opportunities, how will they apply? We need to start looking at traditional and non-traditional ways to get the word out. We're all familiar with popular job search websites, but also in, we also live in the age of social media advertising, where 79% of job seekers use social media in their search. If we've been missing the mark with reaching a more diverse pool of candidates, then it's time to shift the focus. We need to go where the diverse candidates are. If they're going to boot camps, we need to work with their school's career centers. And perhaps that person who took a boot camp and came from a university not normally known to foster cybersecurity talent will have just the right background to respond to the next ransomware attack or think like the attacker. Lastly, we need to take a look at why those who are interested in cybersecurity and who, who do apply for jobs don't get hired. When prerequisites are determined for entry-level roles, how much is taken into consideration about the absolute necessity of required skills versus nice-to-haves? Aptitude and potential to thrive in a role may be, weeded out, may be weeded out early on simply because they didn't have experience or don't meet traditional criteria, like a bachelor's degree from a prestigious university. Or they may simply present differently than a typical candidate. What about your interview process? Focus on competencies and aptitude rather than experience. When candidates make it to the final round of an interview but aren't selected and have talent, what happens? Can those with aptitude be funneled into a training program or a boot camp? When new opportunities arise, do you go back and revisit past applicants or start with a brand new search? All in all, barriers exist that can't be ignored if we truly want to solve the diversity problem. So what should we change and what can we do differently? I think we need to work on building a pipeline at the high school and even middle school level, some of which we do, but we need to supercharge it. We need to work with specialized schools and boot camps to find talent for recruitment. We need to resource government agency hiring departments so that hiring and talent management are a priority for our federal government and make cybersecurity cachet, like the intelligence community. We need to offer uh, scholarships for training to launch careers in cybersecurity. Malwarebytes, for example, was offering 10, $10,000 scholarships to those who applied before July 1st of this year. Uh, we need to identify lower level tasks and the responsibility to help create more entry level jobs where individuals have an opportunity to get their foot in the door and show potential and stop requiring bachelor's degrees and five years of experience.
Uh, can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah, we see. Yep. Yeah. So you all could see us, but we lost. We lost Tatiana again. Right as right as we were getting into the solutioning, right? Like you know, we build up the problem, and then it's like solve it, and starts with. And then it goes away. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually back now. Oh, she's back. <laughs> okay, great. Today is the worst. Um, okay, tell me, tell me where I left off. <laughs> Uh, you were right in the middle of the uh, the second point. Um, um, so we just talked about high schools, middle schools. Yeah, you don't have to like stop requiring bachelor's five years. degrees. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I definitely think we need to stop requiring bachelor's degrees when we're talking about junior uh, level uh, junior level positions. You may not realize it, but there are natural gender discrepancies for applicants, for example. Uh, when women apply for a job, they want to feel like they've met 100% of job requirements. And men apply when they feel like they've met 60% of those requirements. So just at the front end, you're missing a significant portion of qualified applicants by increasing those requirements. We also need to avoid tokenism and performative diversity. Uh, and we need to showcase star employees outside of cybersecurity-focused platforms and mediums. It's important to put a face to those who typically work behind the scenes. Some go to resources and uh, to leverage include the Making Space Pledge on our site, cybersecurity influencers and podcasts, uh, and cybersecurity tech recruiters. And lastly, listen. Take the time to engage with minority colleagues and hear their perspectives and ask them for their ideas. Demand for cybersecurity talent has become so overwhelming that the US government and private industry must as a matter of national security, eliminate the systemic barriers that are preventing employers from tapping into women and minorities as a source of potential cybersecurity aptitude. The math is simple. We must recruit women and people of color into cybersecurity. Just like we've been urging companies for years to take the threat of ransomware and zero days seriously, is where we are now with the threat to our cyber workforce. If we don't ad address the growing gap in cyber professionals and the need to invest in bringing diverse backgrounds and perspectives into cybersecurity, 10 years from now, we may be in a hole we can't fill. Let's not get to a place where it becomes an emergency and let's take diversity as security seriously today. Thanks so much. So how can we get um, the folks that are watching this involved? What can they do? Well, like I said, so one, um, start to think of yourself as part of the solution. Uh, if there are uh, opportunities in your organization, try to target, try to find people that you know that are uh, that are women or people of color that you think might be good for the role and encourage them to apply. You may think they'd apply anyway, but you it's actually not so much, so certain because a lot of, like I said, a lot of women wait till they feel like they're 100% qualified. So if you know if you know a woman who is qualified for a position in your organization and you you believe in that person, encourage them. Tell them that, you know, they don't need to necessarily be 100% perfect for the role. Uh, throw in your resume and see what happens. Yeah, it's very interesting that idea of feeling like you have to be 100%. I mean, I felt it too, right? I think I think it's so interesting. Why do you think that happens? I think we have a culture where we set different standards for women and for men. Um, we have, uh, you know, our culture generally. Uh, sort of encourages women to be quieter and ask less questions and be less aggressive. And so when they're in the classroom, that's a perfect uh, recipe to get great grades and it's a it's a perfect recipe to excel. You don't necessarily need to raise your hand to succeed. But when you get outside of school, that recipe no longer works and men are encouraged to be more aggressive, to uh, apply for uh, positions even when they may not feel as 100% quali qualified. They're encouraged to uh, go, you know, sort of go forth and prosper based on their potential. Um, and they're hired based on potential. They're promoted based on potential. And we've seen through numerous studies that that's not true for women and minorities. Very interesting. Thank you. It was yeah. a really great talk. I was like taking a bunch of notes. <laughs> it was a yeah, the, I the part, I, the, the I part that really got... got yeah, the part that really got attention on Discord was the quote of stop asking for five years of experience. And so that I think is the, the other challenge beyond 
how do we get hiring managers out of that mindset? Because a hiring manager is going, I want to have, see somebody with certifications and the, the talk afterward, we're gonna be talking about certifications uh, because it's it's the CYA for the, the hiring manager, right? I don't get fired for hiring somebody that looked right on paper. I get, I think I'll get fired or I'll get in trouble for hiring somebody that wasn't a fit on paper. And I think that that's also like a, a, a leadership issue, right? From the very top, you need to have people who are invested in the diversity of the workforce because it brings strength to the organization. We have to get away from this concept of diversity as tokenism and that, you know, you know, we're just trying to pull in people who like you're trying to pull in a woman because you don't have a woman or you're trying to pull in someone who's black because you don't have a, a, any black employees. People are bringing uh, different perspectives and different backgrounds to the table when when uh, they're coming from different experiences. That's the strength you're bringing. And so while they may not, while they may have a diverse background or they may not, um, you're bringing in different. Um, a, a different and a stronger uh, workforce. And so leaders need to acknowledge the fact that like you may not have five years of background, but that doesn't mean you don't have the aptitude. We need to switch to more of an aptitude model. Um, you know, for example, the military, right? They take into account where you uh, where you come from, what your background is. And Bryson, I feel like you can talk to this more, but like they, they at least, uh, a little bit and in israel for example they do this a lot more they take your aptitude and fit you into the into the role where they think you'll most thrive and that's not based on any experience it's just based on aptitude so we need to take what works in places like uh like israel and and uh, partially uh our military and use it in the private sector and use it across the federal government i mean i don't bryson talk uh, you uh you've got some background of that you're on mute Thanks. This goes, yeah, I got a new microphone set up. So I'm, I, I'm, I'm doing it on purpose so that you feel like you're not the only one with technical challenges, thank Tatiana. You. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Such a no, giver. But so, yeah, thank you. I, I give and I just, I, I give through mistakes. You give and you That's give. You give and you give. Sorry, uh, sorry about your experience. Yeah, no, the, so part of what's hard about that is being able to, to properly qualify that candidate like what does that mean what are the skills and having the data to back up how those you know the that aptitude and what that looks like because what you find that i see is more often it's kind of the statistical test bias where you are actually restricting diversity through those kinds of assessments and testing hmm. well so you know i also think it's important to just give people a chance um you're doing interviews right so make sure at least at the interview stage where you're bringing people in that you've got a diverse pool of applicants check yourself like a lot of the it's funny there was one study that said people who consider themselves um people who consider that uh they've got this whole like diversity thing down and they're they're you know they understand it and they don't have an issue they're the ones who are most at fault or uh, they um uh, they do it the worst of anyone because they don't check themselves when they're either looking through resumes, when they're moving people forward in the process, when they're reviewing uh, assessments and other things. Be when you when you acknowledge that you have bias, that is when you uh, acknowledge that you need to uh, check for it in all of your steps and all the processes. And so organizations need to do that. People need to do that. You need to just take a take a step back and say, "Am I am I doing am I doing this for the right reason? Am I uh, excluding people based on preconceived notions I have, based on their location, based on their name, based on their background or uh, university or whatever?" Um, and it, and and by doing that, you will, I think, uh, more more often than not, and this has been proven through research pull pull diverse applicants into your pool when otherwise you would generally gravitate towards people who are uh who you feel more comfortable with uh it's a human it's a natural human response right to to talk to and engage with people who are like ourselves right that's a natural human response and no one no one's saying that's bad we just need to acknowledge that and acknowledge our own biases for example you know if you went to georgetown you might be more likely to think of georgetown graduates as smart amazing people 
Uh, but that, you know, but that doesn't that that's a bias in and of itself, right? So we need to account for these things when we are um, when we're in that hiring process. Question from the audience: How can the federal government or DoD get more diverse candidates in front of hiring boards? Oh, here's 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 one: uh, completely redo the USA Jobs portal. <laughs> that thing is a piece of crap. Um, it. So the whole that whole system, I mean, this is like a systemic issue for the federal government and obviously not a short term solution. Um, maybe, we'll, maybe I'll get to that in a second. But like one of the biggest things they can do is is just completely rejigger their hiring and firing process. Um, the the way in which USA jobs works, uh, you know, obviously it was set up to prevent like nepotism and uh, prevent people from uh, abuses of the system uh, because you're providing, uh, you know, you're using taxpayer money to give a federal job. Uh, basically, uh, very difficult to fire you after this uh, process. Um, but you have to know the system, right? Like you have to submit a resume that is exactly tailored to each job that you do. You have to make sure that you're hitting all of the like key points. You have to make sure that you uh, know how the, how the computer first reads resumes to really understand the process. You have to know how to answer KSAs, you, the, those stupid questions that they have you do, which basically top tip, you have to say five on all of them, whether or not you're even qualified um, to get through the process. Uh, and then you have to, you know, go through that process. The federal government needs to acknowledge that this is a broken system. You're not getting the best candidates. You're not getting uh, highly qualified applicants even. You're losing a lot of talent through the system. In the short term, I think um, the federal government, especially in the cybersecurity world, needs to, needs to use more of their direct hire authority, which allows them to, uh, and lean into the uh, uh, the new cyber talent management system that DHS is piloting and systems within DOD where they can go out to a broader uh, a broader pool and uh, and and get more diverse applicants they can also do that by going to taking their career fairs outside of the beltway and going into more rural communities going to uh, you know historically black colleges and universities going to uh, you know just just changing up the traditional way in which which they do hiring. Another question, how best to engage local officials and leaders to raise the issue among local schools and universities? How should we get our communities and local business leaders involved? So I think that it we need to just have continue to have these conversations where we uh, where we talk about what is diversity, who is included, like I mentioned, language diversity and neurodiverse individuals as well as people of color and women, right? We need to show them where the benefit is. We need to show them why it's better. Bring them some of those numbers, some of those statistics I mentioned. Um, show them that it can help their um, you know, sort of help their business. It's not going to weaken your talent pool. It's going to strengthen your talent pool. Plus, I mean, we have so many, so many uh, openings. We're not going to be able to fill them with our existing workforce. That just tells you that you need to broaden the workforce and you need to bring in new people from a new pipeline, right? Um, you know, use the use the existing uh, processes that we have that connect schools to boot camps and universities and uh, the business community. Use that whole system uh, in a more intertwined way so that you are uh, broaden it, right? Broaden it and and connect uh, connect smart, uh, capable uh, students at an earlier age into internships and things like that. All right. Any final thoughts? I just, you know, I think that this is a much bigger problem than anyone is thinks that it is. Uh, there, but what what always happens is this gets kind of relegated to a certain subset of people. It's seen sometimes as like, you know, uh, you know, uh, if you go down into the workforce uh, role, if you are talking about the workforce, if you're talking about that in cybersecurity, well, they're really like, no, you're just a workforce person. But it's it's everybody for for people for businesses uh, for the federal government, honestly. Um, your people are your number one resource. 
I've heard so many, so many businesses say that, but yet they still are unwilling to make the investment and, the, and, and put in the time to really think about their hiring processes and, and revamp things that have been in place for the last 50 years. And so we need to do that and we need to change our culture to really improve uh, diversity and to make, uh, make our network secure. All right, last shout out to your initiative. Oh yes, uh, check out Making Space uh, on the uh, R Street website, rstreet.org, and uh, all of the work that we're doing there. If any organ, if anyone's out there that are that's working at an organization that is, is supportive of diversity and diversity efforts, it's not really that that big a lift. All we're suggesting is that if you're hosting a panel or you're hosting an event, invite invite at least one woman or one person of color to speak on those panels. Uh, that it's a small step, but I think it you know, we're, it's trying to move people in the right direction. So please come and join us in our efforts. And thanks very much, Bryson, for having me on. All right. Thank you, Tatiana. Thank you. It was fantastic. What a way to kick thanks, it off, Chris. huh? Yeah, no, really sets the tone. Again, this conference is about bringing new voices to the table. Um, and one of the things I think that we do that's a little special about that is we're not just throwing them to the wolves, the proverbial wolves, we're pairing them with coaches. So they get somebody to help them get over whatever they need. You know, maybe there's something in the, the research, maybe they're uncomfortable presenting, maybe they just need somebody to make them feel a little bit better about going up on stage for that first time. And so that's, I, I think that's really um, what makes this conference special and helps drive, again, the diversity of voices that we need to, to look at these problems. Yeah, 100%. and can I can I just add one more thing? I have a I have a couple of pictures which are very entertaining um, to those that say that this is still not uh, not a not a problem. Um, so can you see my screen? Yep. All right. Uh, just check check this beauty out. Okay. Some of this is in the 1950s, right? But some of this is today. Look at look at look at the that lovely collection of white men. If you're telling me that this isn't a problem, take a look around. Like this is this happened. One of these happened last month at the EU Cyber Summit. Look at that. I mean, come now, come now. All right, you can take it back over now. <laughs> I rest my case. Making space. Making space. <laughs> All right, we're going to kick you off webcam um, and to, to close out uh, this track before everybody goes into the two tracks, right? We're track one, expert track. Marilyn Wade are over there waiting for you in the new speaker track. Uh, first of all, uh, Trish, um, we've got a, a compliment from Zena. So I love Trish's nails. Not a question, just a fact. Oh, cheers. <laughs> all right, we ready to do this? So we're going to do our first musical I number. I I think we are. Yeah, let me just. Um, lyrics you up are by Trisha, so she gets the credit there. Um, I get the credit for the bad sing along. <laughs> uh, let me just make sure I've got the track up here. <clears throat> so, are you um, you ready to do this? Me 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 me. <laughs> All right, let's go. Three, two, one. I can't yes, hear the music. Yes, I know. You can't. No. Okay. Let's try this again. We're off to a great start. <laughs> cool. Oh, you know why? Because you're in my headphones. Let's kick you to my audio. Can you hear this now? Yes? No? No. Do I need to make you a presenter? Is that the missing part? Um, no. It's because I have a microphone that has a... Uh, noise canceling out. Let me see if I can play um, on my phone. Let's see. We we We're absolutely did not rehearse this on purpose. So you're you're getting the full like thing, the demo intentionally. Pods. Intentionally. But isn't this I mean you said it earlier, like isn't this a really good example of what it's like to um work in technology? <laughs> Just like absolutely. trying things and hoping that even it if works. you rehearse and plan it, it still happens. 100%. Why I printed out the words so I wouldn't have to 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 make this harder. Yeah, that's fair. That is fair. Um, let's see. God. And now I can't even pull this up. Let's see. 
Let me try to um, maybe this will work if I do. I have too many things open. Great. Oh, those are the lyrics. Ooh, 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 ooh. Oh, it's not letting me use my, it's not letting me share my media player for some reason. Oh, wait, yeah, it is. Is it this? Sure is. Okay. Yep, there we go. Let's see if Do you can. Yep. Can you hear? Nope. Is there a setting that I need to do that's like says share sound, like share I, computer sound? I I don't know. <laughs> okay. Do you want to? Uh, I guess I could try to. To do share um, it. Yeah. Let me see if I can share it. Um. um okay. Something jumped up when I did that. Um, could you hear it when I was playing it? Nope. All right, let's see. So what we I... could do is play it in our ear, I guess. And have it acapella to the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see. Um, where is sharing? Sharing's up here. All right, um, change presenter back to me. Okay. Show my screen, see if that does it. Okay. But that that loses us, right? Um yeah, maybe. Let's see. Can you hear it? Nada. Hmm. All right. Let's uh let's just do our best a cappella style yeah. with um uh, uh so it's that first one that I should start. Yeah, the um, let's try to do it roughly yeah. at the same time and then go from there. <laughs> All right. Uh ready? Okay. Three, two, one. Yes, I know I'll make a difference in this role. My knowledge here is gonna grow so much. This I know securities about the never ending threat campaigns. No, we wish can I could make stop the threats and just depart, depart in this shit storm I have found. Isn't, Isn't this, a, this surprise? a surprise? Fighting crime I'm stuck and making in a job I despise. The I am filled with glee. I will have You'll to never be free. Fight these, fighting guys. these guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, man. Cyber! Cyber! <laughs> oh man, I was I was off beat on a few of those too because I kept getting lost. It's yeah. Well, my I um since I set my music to be my computer, I was like, oh my gosh, I can hear so I could hear kind of both. But it was it was fun. Whatever. Again, it's a perfect metaphor for what we do. <laughs> uh, oh, that was fun. Next up, we have Nicole Hoffman. I think. It's really neat when Nicole's done because Nicole started in the new speaker track back, I want to say, in GrimCon 1 and has since gone on to speak at SANS and at other public events and is now back in the expert track here. So that's, oh, that's just, incredible. I think, such a cool story. Oh, that is such a cool story. I, I think it's such a testament to, though, to what you've built here. You know, people feel comfortable to, to, to try their foot out at um, speaking, you know, for the first time. You know, that's so cool. Well, what we've built and all of the volunteers, including yes. the, my fellow MCs, help make this happen. Yes. Sorry, that was a collective you. <laughs> like you, <laughs> Sif and Grim. Love it. <laughs> um, yes. So how did you, how did you make the transition? You were there. You you 
have an excellent singing voice, which hopefully drowned me out for everybody else to make it a livable presentation to, to get through. <laughs> what, 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 what mistakes in life has led you to this moment, Tricia? What mistakes? Um, to uh, to being in in security or talking with you right now? Uh, I was I was yeah I was joking about you being here as that, but yes, like uh, what what, okay. what was your career path? Um, it was like a bunch of uh, scary. Let's try this and hope it works. Honestly, which I guess also is exactly what it's like uh, speaking. You know, um, I've been a performer my whole life. And I think when when we talk about like non-traditional uh, paths into security, and I, t I talk a lot about like artists in particular as one, um, like the easiest correlation is to presenting and, and speaking. Like I've always loved to, to talk in front of people, um, but it was an accident actually. Um, I was supposed to get my MFA in lighting and uh, at the very last minute, they only take three people and I was number four and I panicked and fell moved halfway across the country to take a job in tech when i could barely use my phone and had no friends and learned um what it like learned about the industry and started writing because i got tired of people saying that it's okay sales like just let the smart people well there's always smart guys smart guys in the room and uh and, you know don't worry just set up the meeting and whatever and i was like no i I mean, I don't come from this background, but I understand concepts, right? I'm like, I'm not an idiot. So, um, and then here I am. So what was that first job in tech? How did you get it? It was inside sales, um, inside sales. which is awful. If you've ever done it, it, it will teach you a lot about humans, um, admittedly. Um, so I got it uh, there. I had a friend actually posted on, like some very millennial post on Facebook. It was like, oh, I'm an artist and nobody cares about my artistic experience. And um, they introduced me into the company that they were working at, uh, which was um, headquartered in Connecticut, which I admittedly had forgotten was a state until I moved there. Um, and then there we go. It was inside sales. Oh, there's Ooh. Nicole. Nicole, if you can put on your webcam and join us. We, you missed us bragging about you. Yeah, <laughs> I did. Let me. You okay, can brag about there you we again. go. 100%. I am loving this aesthetic to start. Yeah, I love this everything. too. This is really cool. Thank you. How did you get this yes. art? I, <laughs> I actually, I did everything in PowerPoint. So I, I, I was concerned about, um, like using an actual picture of the mystery machine. So I just looked at one and then just kind of like drew the design and like zoomed really far in and like colored in the lines. And then I used some of the icons available um, and stuff on uh, PowerPoint. That's incredible. It looks phenomenal. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I've always so, wanted to just, um... I've always wanted to do a Scooby Doo talk. So I, I was uh, I was bragging to Cole about how you you started at as one of our first new speakers and then immediately went up, go on to like speak at all of these other awesome conferences and like totally go on the circuit now. Yes. <laughs> uh, what a crazy year it's been. Yeah, I've went from um, just starting out I think like a couple of years ago and GrimCon was my first talk and now I have my own blog. I'm starting my own podcast uh, this fall, uh, created my own framework. So things are happening fast. Amazing. <laughs> That's so cool. Well, we're going to pass, pass the torch yet again to your now experienced and awesome speaking hands. <laughs> Thank you. OK, so. Um, once again, uh, they probably already introduced me, but my name is Nicole Hoffman and I'm giving a presentation titled Jinkies, this email looks suspicious. So there's been a suspicious email sent by to somebody at Mystery Inc. And I need your help to unmask the imposter and solve the mystery. And stick around and I'll provide some tips to help prevent this from happening to you and your organization. 
So a little bit more about me, why should you listen to me during this talk? Um, I'm currently an intelligence analyst at GroupSense, which is a digital risk protection services company. I personally deal uh, with uh, business email compromise uh, probably on a weekly basis. And so I just thought it'd be really relevant to give this talk and to provide some helpful tips. I have a, a bachelor's in information technology and a minor in cybersecurity. I have my Security Plus certification. Uh, like I said uh, previously, I recently created my uh, a cognitive stairways of analysis framework. This is an analytic framework to provide a step-by-step -step process for performing analysis in tech. Uh, if you want to know more about it, you can go to my blog at threathuntergirl.com. Um, and something about me personally, uh, before I can do any type of analysis, I need the coffee. I need coffee before I can do the intelligence analysis. Um, when I'm not working, I just recently moved to the Dallas-Fort Worth area with my family. So we've been spending a lot of weekends exploring and it's been really fun. I'm a huge comic book fan, um, both the physical comic books that I collect as well as the cinematic universes. And I'm a big gamer. I love Destiny 2. I love um, uh, Red Dead Redemption, Assassin's Creed. Not that you needed to know all the games that I like to play, but I just thought I would mention it. And uh, you can reach me on Twitter at threathuntergirl.com or threathuntergirl without the I. OK, so let's talk about this suspicious email. It came from Scooby-Doo and it was sent to Joe in HR. And it says, Dear Joe, I have a new bank account. I need changed urgent. So next paycheck go new account. Please confirm change by email only. Thank, Scooby-Doo. Hmm. This email looks really suspicious. And the first thing that I noticed when looking at this email is the domains don't match. So this clearly didn't come from Scooby-Doo because they inserted a dash into the domain. So that looks odd. The next thing that looks odd is Scooby-Doo doesn't get paid in money. He gets paid in Scooby snacks. Everybody knows that. And I know Scooby-Doo's grammar is not the best, but it's not this bad. So that's another red flag. And look at the unexplained urgency. This just seems out of the norm for Scooby-Doo. The only thing Scooby-Doo does urgently is eat, and really shaggy for that matter, or maybe run away from bad guys. But he certainly doesn't care about getting paid urgently. So that's another red flag. The biggest red flag is that um, we have at uh, Mr. Inc., they have an internal policy for confirming identification for any financial changes or contact information. And it says, please confirm change by email only. If this was really Scooby-Doo, he would know how to properly confirm the change. So this isn't Scooby-Doo. And Scooby-Doo actually doesn't have an email at Mystery Inc. He doesn't actually have a computer. His paws are too big. So all of these things lead us to believe that this is most likely someone impersonating Scooby-Doo in a business email compromise trying to intercept his payment. So let's talk a little bit more about business email compromise. Have you ever seen the movie, The Master of Disguise? It's a movie, I, I'm not sure when it came out, um, but I watched it when I was little and I just thought it was the funniest thing ever. And it was about a, a guy who was learning the family business of being able to change his uh, into dis special disguises almost at the snap of a finger and just ridiculously unrealistically fast. And it's really funny if you watch it, I recommend watching it with your kids. Um, but that's kind of what I feel like threat actors feel like when they commit these email compromise attacks is that they're some master of disguise that um, is, they're trying to blend in and you know manipulate people. Um, and so who better to unmask an imposter than Mystery Inc. So that's kind of why I really wanted to do a Scooby-Doo talk. And the other reason is I also say like jinkies all the time during my investigation. So now I get to <laughs> say it during a talk. So business email compromise, what it is, it's an email-based social engineering attack 
where a threat actor will impersonate a legitimate employee um, in order to uh, interrupt or um, uh, reroute funds. And there's two scenarios that I typically see on a, on a weekly basis. There is the wire fraud where they'll try to intercept a payment to like a vendor or a company, or even like if someone's trying to pay off their house um, in, a, in a reality situation. Um, the other one that I see a lot is payroll fraud, where they'll try to uh, access that person's direct deposit and say, hey, I got a new bank account like we saw with the person impersonating Scooby-Doo. And these threat actors are typically financially motivated um, and they are ranging from all technical abilities. I've seen well-executed business email compromise attacks and I've seen poorly executed uh, attacks. So it, it really is not something that you have to have a lot of technical abilities to carry out. Um, three of the main things that I see uh, for how they carry out the attack is one is I've seen them create uh, spoofed domains or domains that are created to look like the legitimate domain and they do this to try to bypass the detection from the person they're sending the email to or uh, private emails such as Gmail, Yahoo. Um, this is uh, something I see more in the payroll fraud, especially since a lot of the workforce is remote now and they'll say, hey, this is my home email. Um, and then compromised credentials. Uh, this is something I don't see as often, or uh, maybe it's not as uh, reported, but if a threat actor gains access to an email credential, they can then uh, send out emails from uh, that person's email. So who is at risk? Well, really everyone that has a business email is technically at risk, but the two departments that I see targeted the most is HR, who have the ability to ch make changes to people's direct deposit accounts and accounting or accounts payable. Somebody who has access to make changes within an organization's uh, wires if, if they're sending money to uh, vendors and, and things like that. Um, so those are the two people that I see that are at risk the most, but it's really something that can affect anyone in the organization. And according to the FBI's uh, 2020 Internet Crime Report, in 2020 alone, uh, the IC3 received 19,369 business email compromise complaints. And the adjusted losses for those was just over $1.8 billion. And just for comparison, last year, they also received 2,474 complaints uh, identified as ransomware and the adjusted losses of over $29.1 million. So just to compare 19,000 complaints versus 2,000. So this is something we really need to be prepared for. Um, and there's a lot of different types of prevention strategies that you can uh, implement, but I'm gonna start simple and I'm going to be providing you with five uh, prevention tips that I think could significantly reduce the the likelihood of a successful business email compromise and potentially save your organization thousands of dollars. So let's look at the first prevention tip. Continuously monitor for information exposure. If you find information exposure, try to mitigate it, remove the data if possible, um, try to, uh, make sure that it doesn't happen in the future. Um, things that you specifically wanna be looking for is oversharing. Oversharing on LinkedIn, other social media, are people posting pictures of their badge, their job titles, um, their emails, and, and things like that. Um, how easy is it for threat actors to find the information to figure out who they need to target to be the most successful? You know, um, sites like data brokers or business to business uh, databases. These are sites that are meant for legitimate business purposes, but threat actors can exploit them typically for free or for a small cost if you've ever seen these. And a lot of these sites have opt out options, which I recommend. It does take some time to go through and find them all. And it does require continuously monitoring for this information, but knowing is half the battle. So I highly recommend 
knowing how much information is out there, um, and are you oversharing on your corporate website? How much information are you sharing about your staff, specifically human resources and accounting? And the executives, how much can I find just by going to your website? It, you know, try to put yourself in a threat actor's shoes and try to determine what they can find. A lot of times what, what I have seen is people will post like um, company spotlights or employee spotlight, like these are, you know, I wanna share about our company, which is great, but then they'll say like, this is Sasha from accounting and she just started and she's from Ohio and she went to Ohio, she has a degree from Ohio State and all these things are, are great they are they're innocent when you when you're posting them and and it's a good idea to share about your company but just be cognizant of how much you're sharing and how easy you're making it um, and if you experience a business email compromise try to go back and and look for how much information you can find about the individual that was targeted um, and credential exposures is something, another type of exposure that I think everyone should be regularly monitoring, especially if uh, employees, as they often do, reuse passwords. If, you know, say there's a, a Facebook breach or some app breach, are they reusing that password internally um, and will a threat actor be able to gain access? And so, this has to be a, a continuous uh, monitoring. I don't think it's a one and done um, because information can pop up all the time. So continuously monitoring, mitigating, and preventing this could, could uh, significantly reduce the likelihood of these types of attacks. So don't make it easier for threat actors. My second prevention tip is to ensure the company has policies for the identity verification when you make these types of changes like uh, existing invoices, direct deposit bank accounts, contact information, say, hey, this is my new email, stuff like that, like we saw with, with the threat actor targeting Scooby-Doo. If you have specific policies and procedures in place, um, it's more, more likely that, uh, you know, uh, these types of things won't just happen because they'll know I need to make sure this is verified. Personally, I like to have a plan A, a plan B, and a plan C with uh, identity verification. You know, you can uh, verify over the phone with a known phone number for that individual, not a phone number provided within the email, um, like in the signature or, or the website. You don't want to use that information. If you don't have the specific phone number for the individual that um, is trying to contact you, try to get a, a known contact at that company or even just Google the company, try to use their main line. You just don't want to use anything provided in the email if you're suspicious uh, that it might be a business email compromise. Uh, the plan B would be in person if at all possible. Um, if, if it's a remote workforce, obviously that's, that's something that can happen. And then plan C, I recommend having something specific and unique to your organization um, that changes regularly, but not too much, because if you change it too much, then people are just gonna be annoyed by it and they're not gonna pay attention. But if it's, if it's regular enough, at least change it when someone, if, if someone leaves the company, then let's go ahead and update that, whether it be like a code word or just some type of unique thing that you can add, like an additional layer of identity verification. And, you know, so, so hearing code word, it might sound like childish or that doesn't seem like it's going to work, but in reality, something so simple could actually, you know, prevent this type of attack. Um, so, Think about it, you know, think about having multiple plans, not just one form of identity verification, because there's always going to be exceptions and you don't want to have too many plans or too many uh, backup plans because that is just going to be annoying and they're not going to, you know, be able to uh, remember all of them. So just have enough to try to cover ex exceptions and things like that. Um, so there's always a plan in place. So my third prevention tip is education. Now, I highly recommend educating the entire staff, 
on not only uh, regular phishing attacks, but also business email compromise attack. Because it's these types of attacks are different than the normal um, phishing attacks that you see in the wild. Because typically, when there's a phishing attack, the threat actors are phishing for information. They're trying to get information or they're trying to uh, manipulate you into like clicking on something. Um, and so a lot of the phishing awareness training that I see is specific to, um, you know, tr trying to get credentials or you trying to get you to open something malicious. And it doesn't really cover business email compromise and, and when the, the threat actor is actually going after money instead of information or uh, you know trying to get you to download malware. So I highly recommend specifically for the uh, human resources and accounting departments to incorporate specific business email compromise um, examples into your training. And also if you do phishing awareness, or if not phishing awareness, excuse me, um, phishing uh, simulations like for training, I highly recommend not only doing the, you know, the typical phishing, but also including a specific business email compromise into the most targeted people in the organization, um, because it could definitely help prevent the, the attack, because this type of attack exploits the network's weakest link, which is the people, and it relies on manipulating people. And it, we're never going to be able to say we're 100% covered from this threat, but we can do all that we can so that um, we can hope to prevent the likelihood. So my fourth prevention tip is to continuously monitor for newly created spoofed domains that uh, specifically have mail servers set up because a lot of times what I will see is a threat actor will create a domain that looks exactly like a legitimate domain, whether you call that a spoof domain, typo squatted domain, whatever you wanna call it, um, they'll set it up, they'll register it, they'll set up mail servers, they'll create the email of the individual that they're trying to impersonate, and they'll carry out their attack typically within a few days. So making sure that you're monitoring for these, um, and because knowing is half the battle, and something uh, like this, you want to just be continuously monitoring for anyway, um, because there's other things that could potentially impact your organization. Um, so no Scooby-Doo talk would be complete without a trip to the kitchen, because that's typically where you're going to find Shaggy and Scooby during any mystery solving investigation. So I had to go into the kitchen to see Scooby and Shaggy's epic sandwich creation. Uh, so for my fifth prevention tip, I really recommend being wary of unexplained urgency and requests for payments or financial changes, even contact changes. Any unexplained urgency should be immediately a red flag. And for me, if I see any unexplained urgency, I would immediately stop communicating with that individual over email and start my identity verification procedures that I have in place. Um, because it might be, uh, it might take a couple extra steps, it might be inconvenient, but security isn't supposed to be convenient. And if it can save the company hundreds of thousands of dollars, I would do that. So I highly recommend in your training uh, for business email compromise to add the red flag of unexplained urgency because threat actors often, not just in business email compromise, but other types of phishing attacks, they'll often use unexplained urgency. They'll, they'll um, impersonate a person uh, that's in a position of power and they'll, they'll use that urgency and authority to try to manipulate people into doing something quicker so that they don't have time to just, you know, think about it and, and identify any red flags. Um, and that's what they're hoping for. So be wary of that unexplained urgency and requests, and especially if it's coming from a, a person of power. Start looking immediately for any red flags in the email.
why it's old man withers the guy that with the haunted uh amusement park he was behind the attack the whole time and he would have gotten away with it if it wasn't for those meddling kids so this is hopefully what uh, a threat actor will say if you implement these five prevention tips so just just to wrap it up and, and kind of reiterate the five steps is you want to be continuously monitoring for information exposure. I highly recommend you regularly Google your company, Google uh, people that are specifically targeted, um, like, if, you know, people in your accounting department, your executives, people in human resources, how much information is out there and how easy is it for a threat actor to carry out this attack? with little to no resource, excuse me, little to no resources. And number two, you know, ensure you have company policies and procedures in place, not only for uh, verifying identities, but also for responding to business email compromise, or if there's an expected phishing email, how uh, do they continue or how do they uh, report those? So make sure you have those policies in place. And number three, education. You wanna make sure you have a well thought out cybersecurity uh, uh, phishing awareness training, but also specifically for business email compromise, because it's a lot different than other types of phishing attacks, because it typically happens when a threat actor is phishing for money and not so much information or uh, trying to give, give out malware or anything like that. So the training should be different. Um, and included specifically for those people in human resources and accounting. And number four, continuously monitoring for those newly created uh, suspicious spoofed domains that look eerily like your domain that a threat actor uh, might use to detect or to bypass detection from someone if they're not paying attention closely enough. Uh, pay attention to those, specifically the ones that set up mail servers, um, if you experience a business email compromise and um, they are using a spoof domain, you can reach out to that domain registry. You can request that they take it down. Um, you could, sh you know, share the information about it. Um, typically, most of the domain registries do have a way of reporting abuse, so you can go ahead and do that. And number five, you know, be wary of that unexplained urgency and requests for payments and, and financial changes. Really just any unexplained urgency, specifically it's for, if it's from someone in power. So I'm going to make my slides available after my talk on my blog at threathundergirl.com later this evening. I'll post it on social media as well as Discord um, that when it's live, if you don't follow social media, you can just go ahead and navigate to my blog later. I collected some helpful resources that were are useful for me on a, on a daily basis, but also really interesting when I was creating this presentation. Um, specifically, I wanted to point out the um, Bloomberg article by Evan Ratcliffe, and it's called The Fall of the Billionaire Gucci Master. It just recently published, and it's really interesting. It's about a guy who, um, was carrying out business email compromise and he ended up making millions of dollars and became an influencer. And so highly recommend that uh, read if, if you can access it. So that wraps it up for me. Uh, I think I'm really early, but better, better to be early than late. So thank you everyone. Thank you GrimCon for helping me solve the mystery of this uh, business email compromise impacting poor Scooby-Doo. I mean, we knew it was going to be Old Man Withers. We knew. <laughs> we knew. It always is. You pull it off and there he is every time. Yeah, I had to. I was like, it's got to be Old Man Withers. I can't have a Scooby talk <laughs> without the Old Man Withers. So I'm going to create an award on the spot uh, for the five conferences we've had. This is the best aesthetic we've ever had on a slide. Yes. This, is, this was awesome. It was incredible. It was incredible. Yes, I, I you got I gotta love uh, PowerPoints, uh, 3D models and stuff. The only thing, the tip that I will say to for people is if you're using the 3D models and you're using a bunch of them to kind of create a scenario, like a scene. After you're done with the slide, take a screenshot, 
erase the slide and then post the screenshot because it makes PowerPoint like crash if you're using too many 3D models. So good to know. But good for if you're trying to avoid copyright infringement. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Uh, are you are you going to be? Yeah. So uh, tell us about the the podcast. Actually, by the by the way, you mentioned that before. Yes, so I'm starting a podcast. Um, I was hoping to start it sooner, but then I ended up moving to Texas a little sooner. So once my house is built, I'm going to have my own little podcast studio. Uh, the podcast is going to be called IT Wolves, and I'm actually starting it with my husband. His name's Bruce. He's in the cyberspace as well. Um, he's not as active on Twitter, but he is a senior cybersecurity engineer slash architect. So he's really um, on the engineering side, whereas I'm more, you know, on the analytic uh, intelligence side. So I just we thought it'd be really interesting to start a podcast where we kind of discuss topics from both of our points of view, because I feel like a lot of times when I'm giving intelligence advice to my clients and, and uh, other and other people in the field, that there's this um, there's this area that's that's missing from an operational like engineering like. I'm going to give you what I think is the best, but is it the best for your organization? What, you know, what are those things that I don't see because I'm not, you know, messing with firewalls every day and, you know, especially things like patch management and there's a lot of debate around that and there's always the best practices from intelligence side, but, you know, what is the realistic side? So I'm really excited about it. Um, it should be launching sometime towards the end of the year. Super exciting and really interesting. I, I always love those uh, podcasts or shows that have that dichotomy of like the same scenario, but two completely different perspectives. I think it's so interesting. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping it'll be pretty casual. I don't want it to be, I want it to be kind of a fun way to like continuously share um, tips and stuff without it being too like businessy. So hopefully lots of husband and wife bickering over <laughs> uh, over cybersecurity topics but in a fun, in the best way possible and hopefully have some uh, other cybersecurity people um on there to talk about different fun topics jinkies yeah jinkies uh just a, a thought on this your uh the recording of this would be uh an excellent employee training tool yes oh well thank you that that makes me feel good. Yeah, and and that's kind of another reason why I wanted to mention that, or I wanted to create this talk is because when I see phishing training, it's always the same, you know, ransomware based or don't click the link, which is great. We need that, but this is something that can also be just as damaging financially. Um, so we want to make sure. I know when I was when I was uh, making the talk, I reached out to a couple of my friends that are not in tech. They're actually in the financial sector, and they had no idea what business email compromise was. So, and they're the ones getting targeted the most. Yeah, exactly. So like, it's definitely something I I I want to scream from the rooftops about to try to prevent this from happening. A uh, question for the audience: Can you address the recent issues around phishing education? that trick employees and why people should be thinking about these issues. So some of the ethics of phishing training. Well, I, and I say this a lot, and I said this in a, a talk I recently gave, um, is we shouldn't be fear mongering. Education should be empowering because if people are scared, it's it's they're not gonna wanna report things. And you want people to report things. You want people to know that you're on their side, if they see something, report it. Even if they clicked on it, they shouldn't live in fear because when they do, they're not going to report it. Things aren't going to happen. And if they feel empowered, you know, even through the use of like gamification, you know, have awards or something, even if it's just like a little Snickers bar, like make people feel excited to identify threats. Yeah, that's great advice. The positive criticism rather than the, you know, Yes. Oh, bad, bad, bad. Yes. A reinforcement. That's what I'm thinking. Negative reinforcement versus positive reinforcement. Yeah. Exactly. Huge. Don't fear monger. Mm -hmm. it, 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 I understand why people do it because they think it'll get what they want and it might, but is it the best thing? Because really at the end of the day, we want to bring cybersecurity and other departments together, not further apart. We want to get rid of the attitude that it's just a money pit that 
nobody that makes our life harder that shouldn't be the the mantra yep great points bring everybody together bring everybody exactly. together educate and inspire instead of tearing people down yes cyber security up. should be part of the values of the company it should be company-wide it shouldn't just be something on the back burner yes well Sorry. and also uh i think that helps set up more of a service-oriented security uh relationship uh too often security is the the culture and the place of no and at the end of the day uh users are going to get done what they need to get done i i joke that users are the best a user that you say no to is the best hacker on the planet because they will find a way around whatever controls you have and phishing and business email compromise of course are the most common access methods for initial access because you only need one click i can it costs me just as much to send 10 million emails as it does to send one email and we blame the user for essentially using a computer for how it was designed. Exactly. That's and that's why model. you, you want to yeah. have, you know, those procedures in place that are simple, easily accessible, easy to remember, because if you have too many, they're not going to remember it. They're going to try to get around it. If Just like if you use, I've seen companies use like a daily code word, which is great, but it gets old after a while and then people are just going to be annoyed by it. So you want to make it, Easy, simple, not something that they're going to try to get around if, if possible. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's like the easiest way to, to have a, a security culture fail and an organization fail. You know what I mean? Like if you make it too hard, uh, it's a fine line, you know, like if you want to make it where it's secure, but you want to make sure that the users aren't going to, as Bryson said, find, find workarounds. It's, it's got, there has to be a nice, like, there has to be a nice um, uh, balance there. And I think on the flip side, when we're educating the end users, as, as you were here, they can educate us too, right? Like what, how, what kind of language should we be using to communicate with them and make it where it isn't this like negative, you clicked on a link, you did this, blah, 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 blah. And it's more like, okay, so let me put this in your terms, okay? Let me explain this to you. Um, I think that's hugely valuable. You know, we can all learn from each other. Exactly. And there should be like, you know, my first thing would be, and, and I'm not in that engineering spot, like you said, but if I was, and I was receiving that call, I would be so grateful. I would be like, thank you. It probably took a lot of courage for you to call and admit that this happened, but it's extremely valuable. Um, and so that that's something else I think that we don't do enough because, you know, having not only, you know, making sure we're not fear mongering, but also making sure we're showing gratitude when people do do the things that they're supposed to do. Retweet. Have you, uh, have, you <laughs> have you looked at DMARC at all as a system solution? As far, um, I don't, <laughs> again, I'm more on the intelligence side, so I'm not so much on the, um, on the uh, engineering side, making the specific security controls. But um, I do think there is a lot of, of specific controls. Um, in, in my resources, um, specifically, uh, the one that I used the most was the FBI recently came out with in March, there was a private industry notification for BEC and they had a lot of great recommendations, not only for general uh, public, but also specifically for uh, system admins and people that are making those specific um, security controls to prevent this type of attack. Cool. Any final words? Uh, I should have came up with something cool. <laughs> you can end on jinkies. Jinkies. <laughs> Love it. Amazing. I just can't get over oh, how good thank these you. slides are. Good to see you again, Nicole. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. This was fantastic. Wow. What a morning. Or yeah, early afternoon. Change. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> Save the chubby unicorns. Save them. <laughs> yeah, so I've got the I've got the the original Grim Unicorn shirt. So the the story behind this uh was every year for DEFCON we would do an employee 
competition uh, to come up with ideas for T-shirts, and we've done, you know, green on black ASCII art um, and and a bunch of different ones. And uh, several years ago, I just thought it'd be really funny the juxtaposition of our Grim on a unicorn, and it of course it took off like hotcakes. It was very popular, and then shortly after that, we launched and spun out Scythe. And when we were trying to come up with a a, 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 a mascot and a logo, uh, I was like, well, that unicorn thing seems really popular. And so that's where the the iconic site that the unicorn came from. And so we actually split it now where Grim doesn't get to do the unicorn stuff. So there's no brand confusion. And it's just site with the unicorns. That's amazing. I love that though. Pulling back the OG shirt. Love it. Love yeah, it. and on the Save the Chevy Unicorns, that's actually the uh, charity that the site swag store uh, contributes to. Yep, that's that's why I wore this. Actually, I was going through the I was going through the um, uh, through the swag store and was loving it, of course. And uh, I saw it down at the bottom. I was like, oh my goodness, no way! I literally just bought that shirt, like you know, a couple of uh, a couple of weeks ago. So, yep, Save the Chevy Unicorns. They're so cute. Um, yeah, let's see. So uh, Grimm's store, if you're not aware, is at swag.grimm-co.com. And the charity that they support is Black Girls Code, um, whose purpose is to increase the number of women of color in the digital space by empowering girls of color ages 7 to 17 to become innovators in STEM fields, leaders in their communities, and builders of their own futures through exposure to computer science and technology. So that is the, the Grimm charity for the swag there. Um, and I, uh, I know all of the speakers and MCs uh, are getting uh, speaker gifts from Grimm and Scythe chipped in as well and provided gift cards to our swag store. So look forward to seeing what everybody uh, gets with that and, you know, save the chubby unicorns at the same time for us. Correct. Yep. I love that. I love that it supports um, a good cause too, or, you know, multiple good causes. I like, I, I think that's so important, you know, so important. People like to get involved. Yeah, and on that tonight, let's see, let me pull it up. Um, so at seven o'clock, we have uh, um, Dan Weiss doing a happy, a virtual happy hour with the details on Discord, and then at seven p.m. Uh, Eastern time, uh, Kenny Warren and I are going to be doing an Asian wedding soup on Unicorn Chef, and I posted that link in the Discord. And the charity for tonight is going to be your local community's security B sides. So Kenny in particular is supporting B-Side San Diego, but highlighting B-Sides, which I think are a, just kind of the same kind of thing as us, where it's a community-based effort to get folks locally into cybersecurity. Um, so join us at seven o'clock tonight or just contribute to your local B-Sides. Yes, or do both, do both. Uh, yeah, it's a... Uh... I love the B-sides. Some of the best talks I've seen have been, you know, at B-sides and they're these little, you know, granted I, I was in New York, so there was like a lot of stuff going on there, but it was, it was awesome. They have great stuff. Similar, but like you said, you know, the, the community based cons are different. They feel different. The, it's, it's a lot more, it's a lot more safe and a lot less corporate. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yep. Yeah. No, we're definitely not corporate here. <laughs> You don't say, I don't know. No, I don't know don't what, say. I never would have figured that out. <laughs> yep, well, where, where do you see what we unveil for the potential hybrid conference next year? Like I said, I've been thinking about this. I've already talked to a few people and I wanted to come up with, I didn't want to just have another conference. Again, GrimCon came into filling that gap that there was no content being created at the community level when everything shut down. And mm -hmm. so then we've kind of come into this pattern again of we'll be in December and July when it's just kind of slow times naturally on the conference circuit. Um, and so if we're gonna if we're gonna take it to the next level with doing something that has a physical presence, I want to create a conference experience that doesn't exist anywhere else because I don't want to compete with another conference. I don't want to have a conference for the sake of having a conference. So I'd like to I'd like a way to really like make something different. And I think I've cracked that code. So stay tuned. I'm gonna continue to build the suspense. Uh, but dun, I think dun, it's dun. Uh, Dun, dun, dun. Love it. Um, um, so really excited about excited. that. Stay tuned. Um, and I hope to probably by the fall to start to post some details. Um, for any of you who'd be interested in being on a program committee, reach out to me directly. 
Um, and then, of course, uh, always looking for uh, folks to participate, volunteer, MC, and all the different things. Um, we're, we're looking at ways to make this possible to be, like I said, a virtual conference in the Washington, D.C. area so we can still take advantage of the virtual benefit of having people anywhere in the world where it doesn't take as much time or cost as much to participate. And then for those who can be there in person to get that experience as well. Love that. Love that so much. I, I I love the accessibility of hybrid conferences, you know, like it, it's so nice and, and you don't have the, you don't have the pressure of, oh, do I, do I really want to go to Vegas? Like, do I really want to hang out and spend all this time there? And, and you can sit and get the same like amount of, of information and share from, like you said, people all over the world. I think it's amazing. It's so cool. It's like the one good thing to come out of last year. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Nicole is over on Discord for any of you who have questions to interact with her directly in the expert track. In a few minutes here, we'll be having Alyssa Miller, uh, who is going to be giving the Pit Master's Guide to Practical Security Programs. So it's a good time to, to grab lunch because she's going to be making you hungry at the same time as she's dropping some knowledge. Yep. It's going to be a meaty presentation, I feel. Oh, kind of kind of thing that sticks to the ribs. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man. Um, oh, you need a saucy comeback. Come on. I do need a saucy. I feel like I've been smoked out. I don't know. Ah, there we go. Boom. Dad Joe has the service for free. Yeah. The same for comes free. with the price of your free ticket. <laughs> oh man. Dad jokes are my love language. I'll say. Uh, oh, same. Uh, yeah. So I, I mean, I feel like that's why you went into marketing because you were like. You know what? I want to be able to professionally tell dad jokes and get paid for it. One thousand percent. One thousand percent. Well, and the stuff that I do too. I mean, I do videos and stuff. Like, I'm I'm a professional actor, which is living the dream. Living the dream. How um, long have you been in marketing? Actually, not that long. Uh, a little under two years. I, I was in sales for a long time. Um, made the switch like last year and. Uh, my role now is purely content. So I'm only, you know, I only <laughs> writing and, and uh, singing even. We do a lot of like musical videos and stuff internally and externally. So it's fun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All yeah. right, so marketing and sales tends to get a bad rap and you even were like, ah, I didn't like being an inside salesperson. Uh, why don't you give some insights into why marketing is not really just there to annoy you? Love you this. Like that setup? Um, <laughs> love that setup, man. I I'll uh, I'll send you the check later. Um, so they get a bad rap because completely, admittedly, there are a lot of bad ones out there, right? I, I mean, I we need to just be real here. There are a lot of bad ones. I think also there's a huge disconnect between <clears throat> the infosec like marketing, sales, blah, blah blah, and the actual community itself. So any of the same problems that you have with hiring, it's, you're going to have interdepartmentally. I think marketing can actually help a lot, um, in particular to uh, the Nicole's talk we were just doing. It. We can actually help with your phishing simulations, making them more human and making them more uh, believable and kind of work with that, that um, product as well. When you understand what a... Uh, a sales and marketing marketeer is trying to do, I think it gets a lot easier. Um, we're not trying to make your life more difficult. Um, we're actually trying to help you do your job because the security team would not have a job if there is no product and no business to sell. And that's what we do, right? So with that being said, I think it goes both ways. I think there, one, we need to get out of this idea that like marketing and sales are stupid because they're not. We're experts in what we do, right? I don't want to do what you do. That's like, you know, it's, it's super exciting and like interesting to watch people hack stuff, but that's not my my goal. I like to talk to people and I'm good at it. So with that being said, I don't try and tell you how to do your job. Don't tell me how to do, try to do mine. So it's, um, but with that being said, the marketing and, and, and sales community needs to be better about supporting local B-sides conferences and learning and becoming part of the community because not only, it doesn't only make them better at their job, it also makes them more, human and less like car salesy. Also don't send annoying emails. You'll make that into the series. That's annoying. <laughs> <laughs> I take snippets from the uh, cold call emails I get and I post them all the time. I love them. I know. You get some really good ones too. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Yep. Oh, All man. right, let's get Alyssa up. It is time. And I'm gonna ask you to make sure that we get the audio working. So everybody should be able to see that. Mm hmm It's Alyssa Miller, and I am super excited to be here with you guys today. So let's just dive right in. We're talking about how to build practical security programs, and I'm going to use a little bit of a unique uh, metaphor, if you will, as we describe this. So, But let me first start by just introducing myself for those of you that don't know me. Again, my name is Alyssa Miller. First and foremost, I'm a hacker. I'm a cybersecurity researcher and I'm an advocate. Just means that I really like getting out and talking to people about my ideas for how we can be better in cybersecurity. Professionally, I am the Business Information Security Officer for SP Global Ratings, leading the divisional security strategy for their ratings division. I'm also an author and a blogger. I'll be releasing my first book fairly soon. I blog pretty regularly on my website. And I also. I've spent the last 20 years as a barbecue aficionado, if you will, a uh, pit master, whatever you want to call me, but I love barbecue. And in fact, those of you that follow me on Twitter, you might be familiar with a lot of the pictures of barbecue and smokers and things. This is the smoker, I, one of my smokers. Um, again, if you follow me, you know that I've actually got kind of a collection out there. Um, but you know, barbecue is something I share a lot on social media. And I got to talking with some folks about barbecue and started to realize as we were talking about, you know, some of the rules around how to make really good barbecue and some of these, just there, there's certain things that just, if you're going to make barbecue, you have to follow these rules. They're just, they're, they're not disputable. And I started realizing, and as I was talking with this other person about, this is actually a really good metaphor for you know, how we should be building programs in cybersecurity. As you all know, we are struggling with breaches in cybersecurity in a way that we never have before. We see things like S3 buckets. This isn't news to us. This is still happening. We're seeing configurations around S3 buckets that lead to, lead to breaches of data. Docker containers being compromised over and over again. Why? Because we include software that's vulnerable. Or maybe we don't configure those environments quite the way they should be. And of course, now supply chain attacks like we saw with SolarWinds or Kaseya, they're, they're all the rave right now. We're seeing attackers leverage these very tasty targets, if you will, because they have a wide attack uh, pattern when they are able to compromise just one target. But why are these happening? Let's look at some of the things that are occurring in our industry right now. So a couple of years ago, I looked at vulnerability themes while I was managing a penetration testing consulting program. And I, I, I did some trend analysis. I looked at what are we seeing in terms of the top five themes around vulnerabilities that we were discovering in our penetration test. And what we saw was that 40% of what we discovered we're just simple configurations where doing a configuration differently would alleviate the particular vulnerability we found. And as I plotted this over time and I drew a trend line, you can see it was a horizontal trend over the course of three years 
where over and over again, a pretty steady about 40% of our vulnerabilities were configuration issues. So the following year, I found myself working for an organization called Sneak. And as part of our state of open source security report, I looked at vulnerabilities in Docker images. And what I could see over the, for the last two years that we had done this, so in 2019 and, or excuse me, 2018 and 2019, the number of vulnerabilities that existed in official images on Docker Hub was kind of astonishing. You see where Node.js in particular, that, that base image, that official image in Docker Hub had just hundreds of vulnerabilities. But even across the board, don't, don't lose sight because of that outlier of how many vulnerabilities exist in things like the Postgres or Nginx or MongoDB, all these different official images that were available on Docker Hub that people are using to deploy their applications. So as another part of that open source security report, I looked at the vulnerabilities we were finding in open source packages. Again, what's old is new. These aren't new vulnerabilities. We see cross-site scripting was the most common found vulnerability. Cross-site scripting has been on the OWASP top 10 since I think it started in 2003. Everything that we're finding, we, we just struggle in cybersecurity to eliminate the same vulnerabilities that bite us over and over and over again. So I started looking at this. How do we get better? You know, and I started to think about it in terms of how do you make great barbecue? So when we talk barbecue, one of the hardest pieces or uh, dishes to make in barbecue is the brisket. Brisket is this tough cut of beef, and if you don't do it just right, it doesn't turn out well. And a lot of people struggle to get just the right brisket. And so I thought, I'll take a look at some of the rules we follow when we're making brisket, and I'm going to tie that into how we do good security practices and how we build a practical security program. So with no further ado, I'm going to dump it, jump right in. I've got five tips for you on not only how to make a better brisket, but also how to build a better cybersecurity program. Now, rule number one, if I'm going to make a brisket is that planning and preparation wins the day. What you see here is me trimming that brisket. You have to plan if you're going to make a brisket. You don't just go buy one at the store and slap it on the smoker and let it go. You've got to trim it. You've got to plan it because it's going to take hours and hours and hours. So you got to have your day laid out ahead of time and know what you're going to do. It's the same thing with cybersecurity. You can't just walk into the boardroom without a plan and start asking for money and saying, this is, you know, I need money because we're going to do this thing and it's going to make us better at cybersecurity. No, you've got to have a plan. And that starts with knowing how you're going to sell it to the board. All too often when we go into board meetings or meetings with our executive team or even just our managers, we throw around FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. We think we're going to scare them into spending money where we know it needs to be spent in order for us to get better at cybersecurity. But the reality is that doesn't work. And neuroscience tells us why. So there was a study at North Shore University Hospital in upstate New York a while back where they looked at how they could encourage people to be more diligent about washing their hands. And at first what they did was they told them, we're going to put cameras in the wash areas. And if we see you not washing your hands, you'll, you'll be punished. And what they found was that didn't help. And the reason is because when you use threats and fear, it just discourages people from taking action because it creates a fight or flight and they tend to avoid those threats. So instead, what they did at this hospital was they then put up signs that just gave people encouragement when they noticed they washed their hands, it, it gave them a congratulations or a good job. And what they found was that little bit of reward actually encouraged actions. And where they were getting only about 10 to 15% compliance in hand washing before, now they were suddenly getting 85 to 90%. And it's the same when we talk to our business leaders about our cybersecurity initiatives. Instead of trying to scare them, we need to encourage them with rewards. So if we want to put a reward out there, that, that carrot versus stick argument that we hear a lot about, the good option is to talk about how it can this cybersecurity initiative can save us money or maybe gain us some efficiency. So if I see that I've got a high level of 
requests to rebuild workstations because of malware infections. Maybe I talk about how this new endpoint security tool or this new email security tool will help reduce those numbers, and that's going to you know build up that efficiency. But better is to say, how can I take the cybersecurity initiative and parlay that into tackling a wish list item? One of those things that our IT team has been wanting to do for years that we can't get to because they're so swamped in having to do all of those rebuilds and things like that. That makes it even better because now I'm enabling the business a little bit. And what's ideal or the best option is when I can tie that security initiative into an innovation that's going to enable new business and new revenue streams or establish us as a market leader. So going into those conversations, being able to present this cybersecurity strategy, maybe I'm going to launch a CASB program in our cloud environment that's going to allow us to do new tools or create a new portal or whatever it is that's going to generate more revenue for us. That's what wins the day when we're talking to our executives. Now, if you're going and you're talking to your executives, you also need to understand how to talk to them. When I go to a board meeting, there's a couple things that I need to keep in mind. First and foremost is I'm probably only going to get about three minutes to make my case. So when I build that deck, I'm putting the most important things, that, that strongest message that I want them to get, I'm putting that right at the beginning. Then I can follow it up with all the supporting details and, and you know stats and numbers and things, but I've got to put that out there first. And the reason I got to do that is because I've got to expect to be interrupted. Those meetings, those executive leaders, especially when they're not security folks, they have a lot on their mind and they just want to cut to the chase. They want to get their questions answered. And so they are going to interrupt you from time to time. And you've got to expect that you can't get frustrated with it and you have to structure your presentation accordingly because they are going to be answering questions, asking questions, and you need to be ready to answer those questions. Anticipate what it is that they're going to ask for and go in ready with those answers. You might get away with it once or twice in answer to a question saying you have to dig a little deeper or you, you need to come back with that information. But by and large, you've got to have those answers ready. So anticipate what it is that they're going to ask you about that initiative that you're bringing forth. And that will win the day. Second rule, Pitmaster rule number two is low and slow. You can't rush it. You see here the thermometer. This is the thermometer monitoring the temperature of my smoke chamber where I've got that brisket sitting. I want to keep it at 225 and I want to cook that brisket for hours and hours and hours. It might take six, eight, ten hours to cook that brisket to the temperature that I want it to be. I can't force it because if I force it, instead of that coming out as a nice, juicy, tender brisket, it's going to come out as a tough lump of meat that nobody's going to want to eat. And it's the same thing when we talk cybersecurity. We can't rush cybersecurity. There's this push. We think we're going to boil the ocean. We're going to go from zero to 60 and make our entire organization secure. And a lot of times that's what our leaders expect of us. And we need to change that messaging. We need to change those expectations. We can't secure it all at once. So how do we prioritize this differently? Well, I like to use the metaphor of a castle. And I know the castle metaphor is so overplayed in cybersecurity, but trust me here, I'm going to flip that on its head because I'm not talking about defending perimeters. What I'm talking about is this structure in the middle of a medieval castle. It's called the keep. And the keep was the most fortified structure within the entire castle, and it's where they put all their critical assets. The lord or the king or whoever lived there, that's where they were, that's where they lived all the riches, whatever was most important went into that keep. And then they built their defenses around that keep. That's how we need to think about cybersecurity. So when we think about cybersecurity in our organizations, we have to look at what are those critical assets first. And then we need to build our different detection and preventative defenses and mitigation strategies around that and slowly build layers out until we reach the perimeter. That way we end up with our strongest defenses around those critical assets and we can slowly over time get better and better. So what does this look like? Well, first we need to identify those critical assets and we need to understand the threats that those critical assets face. Now we can translate those 
critical assets into IT assets. So where my critical asset might be some trade secret or it might be PII information or you know other private data that I have to defend or maybe it's just the availability of a particular critical function. Now I can translate that into IT assets. So I don't start at IT. But now that I understand what those IT assets are, now I can start to establish those micro perimeters. Just what is that one perimeter that exists around a particular field in the database? Or maybe then it expands to the database. And then I defend those micro perimeters with encryption or role-based access controls. And then I assess those defenses and then it's wash, rinse, repeat. I do it over and over again, go back and expand that perimeter to the next level. And I continue to do this and I do this over time, continuously getting better until I've been able to defend my environment. That's how we have to tackle cybersecurity. Pitmaster rule number three, good smoke is essential, dirty smoke will ruin you. Now take a look at this smoke for a minute. Notice you can barely see it. A lot of pitmasters early on as they're learning how to, their craft, they make the mistake of looking for that big billowy white smoke. That's not what you want because that type of smoke indicates that you have inefficient burning and you're getting creosote in that smoke. And that creosote imparts a bitter taste on your meat. Well, the same thing comes when we're talking about our cybersecurity programs. We need to be able to accurately and effectively measure our cybersecurity programs, and that means good metrics. And that doesn't just mean picking some metrics, metric out of the air that we're gonna measure and just you know throwing those numbers out there. It means providing context around those metrics, seeing how they relate to each other. Do we have more vulnerabilities this month because our code was less secure or because we did more deployments this, this particular month? Understanding those relationships and being able to accurately and effectively measure them, that's crucial to our program. And then we need to set goals. But when we set goals, we need to understand that improvement is greater than attainment. So instead of setting our goals based on, well, we want to have, you know, 80% of vulnerabilities remediated at a particular point in time, or we want to see you know x number of critical vulnerabilities or less in our production environment we need to set our goals based on improvement how do we get better over time how do we establish a goal that this month we're going to be this much better than last month quantifying that and that's where we start to see again that idea of continuous improvement but that's not all. When we're talking about metrics and we're reporting on the effectiveness of our program, we need to take into account our audience. If I'm reporting to my executives, I don't want to go in there with raw numbers. I want to talk to them about the maturity of our cybersecurity program. Where are we headed? What does that roadmap look like? What's the next step? How do we compare to others in our industry? Now, instead, if I'm talking to people who are more at the engineering level, who are on the front lines, yes, then I want to talk tactical numbers. I want to talk about how are we remediating? How do we get better at remediation steps? How do we improve the adoption of security initiatives? So we need to think about our audience and present those metrics in a way that is most meaningful to the audience that we're presenting them to. Don't walk into a board meeting with a bunch of technical jargon and numbers. It's not going to be effective. It's not going to win you the support that you're looking for. So go in there with clean smoke. Give them that clean picture of what they need to understand. Pitmaster rule number four, there's no set it and forget it. When I go out to my smoker and I build a fire, I know I'm constantly having to maintain that fire because I'm trying to keep that temperature we talked about before. Remember that 225? It's tough to keep a fire burning at exactly the temperature you want. So there's this constant motion of going back to the smoker, making sure that things stay the way that I want them. And when it comes to my software development, it's the same story. There is no set it and forget it. I don't just go in and implement a security control and then it's done. I've got these conflicting motions in modern day DevOps where I've got security as usual, trying to push left and become earlier and earlier in the pipeline. 
But as we have things like infrastructure as code, containers, uh, you know, just this overall environment, developers are pushing further right where their influence is closer and closer to deployment. And then I've got ops who's pushing up the stack because, well, they can no longer think about just bare metal servers and operating systems. They have to understand the code that actually is used to build out the infrastructure on which these applications are going to run. And so how do we how do we continue to make this better and better? How do we continue to improve upon it? Well, we've got to get to this idea of frictionless enablement and move away from the traditional approach where we just build gates. How many times do you think about quality gates between the phases of the software development lifecycle? That doesn't work as we move into a CI CD environment. That doesn't get us on that road where we're constantly getting better and better. We need to bring our security practices into each of the phases. We need to be inherent in the development of software, not just the gates that measure whether or not they did the right thing. So how do we make that happen? We've got to meet our engineers where they live. First and foremost, walk a mile in their shoes. Build that empathy, job shadowing, in building a true DevSecOps culture where security isn't just responsible for security, but we're responsible for making sure that software gets deployed quickly. We're responsible for making sure that software is available 24 seven, that our applications are up for our clients. We need to support the business. That's what DevSecOps is about. We also need mutual engagement. Being involved in daily activities, being a part of your scrum team meetings, being at those sprint planning meetings, your retrospectives, making sure that security operations and developers are all there sharing their input. And then finally, it's about paving the road, leveraging automation and tools that plug into the existing tools that our developers already use and give them the ability and the enablement to do it themselves, make them accountable and then trust them to do the security thing. Finally, pitmaster rule number five, you've got to know your tools, you've got to know your abilities, and you've got to accept your limitations. Now, here is a beautiful smoker. I'm in awe of this. Joe Sanfratello has this smoker. He had a custom made for himself. It has over a thousand gallons of volume of smoke chamber in which he can cook all sorts of meats. He can cook hundreds of pounds of meat literally on this all at the same time. Plus he's got these rotisseries. I would love to have a smoker like this, but you know what? I don't need a smoker like this. I could never make use of a smoker like this. I cook for myself and maybe a few guests. Joe, he uses this professionally. So it makes sense for him to have something like that. But for me, all I needed was this 50 gallon smoker that I bought. It's great. It does everything I need. I can fit big briskets on there, multiple briskets if I want, or I can put briskets in a pork butt and ribs on there all at the same time. So when it comes to security tooling, we need to do the same. We know the marketplace out there in security, right? It's huge. There are all these vendors. There are all these different options, all these different tools that we know we got to have all different categories of security controls and tooling and processes we need to put in place. There's a $177 billion business out there just in security tools and security vendors. But we don't do a good job in security of knowing what tools we need and, and being strategic. The fact is, based on a study by Gartner, most enterprise organizations have over 60 enterprise security tools in their environment. And of those tools, 35% of them have overlapping capabilities where two different tools can do the same job. And the reality is that means that 80% of the tools are underutilized where they've installed a great tool for one niche purpose. And that's the only thing they use it for and ignore the other capabilities because for each niche capability, they go out and they buy another tool. We need to be smarter about this. We can do better. We need to understand our tools and leverage them to the best ability possible. It's because it's when we use those greater capabilities that that's when they work as designed. 
So bringing it all together. Rule number one was planning and preparation wins the day. You've got to win executive sponsorship by driving business value. Rule number two, you low and slow, you can't rush it. So you can't expect to secure everything tomorrow. Rule number three, good smoke is essential. Dirty smoke will ruin you. So you got to have those effective metrics. If you don't have those good, accurate metrics that you can count on and present them appropriately, that will ruin your program. Rule number four, there is no set it and forget it. We have to constantly be getting better by building that culture of enablement and accountability, making security a part of everyone's job. But to do that credibly, we have to take on responsibility for their job as well. And then five, five, knowing our tools, abilities, and limitations, we've got to maximize those existing tools. How can we tie together different capabilities more effectively? Use those integration points where they exist. Instead of going buying that next shiny new thing, how can we use what we already have in place today that's already deployed and adopted and make our environment better? You follow these five rules, you're going to end up with a beautiful brisket. It's going to taste wonderful. It's going to be juicy. It's going to have that lovely smoke ring that you see there, which tells us that we got good smoke flavor into that brisket. If you follow those five strategies for your cybersecurity program, you're going to get the same result. It's going to be successful. It's going to be enjoyable. It's going to make you better at what you're trying to do. So as I start to wrap up here, some things just to help you out. If you're looking for recipes, go check out my GitHub. I've actually got many, many recipes out there, not just barbecue, but other other recipes that I've uh, really expanded on over the course of the pandemic. Also, we are planning Barbicon. It will be a security conference that will be all about barbecue and security. So this is more this will be the metaphor come to life watch for those details there's the website you can follow hacker barbecue on twitter that's one hashtag hackers kitchen is another one i use these whenever i post the awesome foods that i make that i love to share with all of you and then finally a wonderful quote i always love to end with a quote and this one from albert einstein this goes right to the heart of what we need to do with our cybersecurity programs genius is when we make complex ideas simple not making simple ideas complex. All too often, we get wrapped up in making things so complex, we never really get the result that we're looking for. Barbecue can be easy. Making a perfect brisket is simple when we boil it down to those five rules. The same is true when it comes to cybersecurity. Follow these steps and you will get better within your organization over time. Finally, I invite you to connect with me, continue the conversation. If you've got questions, I will be in discord, but also you can reach out to me here. You see my Twitter handle. That's the easiest way to get in touch with me. You see my LinkedIn information and my website. I invite you. Let me know what you think. Let me know if you've got questions. Let's talk further. I'm always open to hear your ideas. And finally, a great big thank you to GrimCon for allowing me to be here today. S&P Global Ratings for making it possible, of course. And thank you, most of all, to all of you. Thank you for being here. I hope you really enjoyed the conference. I hope you enjoyed this talk. And I look forward to seeing you in real life really, really soon. Take care. Enjoy the rest of your day. We'll see you again. How about that fucking intro? I, what? Like how, what, what could you even say after that? I was on, not like, ready for okay. that. I just sat there and like my face just like started about and I was just like, <gasps> how cool like, was that? I mean, I'm not surprised. Like Alyssa's always next level. Like every, like, I don't know. I, no words. That, no words. That, 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 that,
I was, I seriously did it. She, she's spoken at GrimCon once before. And, uh, I mean, she, she's dealt, she always has like the, the visuals and the aesthetic, but that, I don't know, just rock it out to start. I was like, we should do that more often, you know, like in, um, sports where people have like their walk on, um, you know, music choice. I mean, yep. that being said, we weren't able to get music earlier, so maybe that would not have worked as well, but. I maybe think it's not. a really cool idea to try to do this. I'm taking that note. No, I think it's a great idea. I mean, especially for people who are wanting to speak more and also to the point earlier about, you know, getting started in, in security and putting things on your resume, like having a, a real, take it from the theater people, take it from the film people, having a real, it is, is good. So yeah, I wrote that down too. <laughs> Yeah, we're just we're just stealing ideas all day. Oh, that's that's a really good one. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's open source, right? Oh, this is open source. <laughs> it's it's all open source except for John's talk. Correct. Yes, I don't want to get John in trouble because we appreciate the honesty, but that's not the kind of recorded honesty we need out there. <laughs> Correct. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, it was special for those of us who were there. Very special. Um. Yeah, you know, Alyssa always puts on a great show. She really has a way of articulating stuff that I think is is hugely important. And her her points, um, I mean, the whole talk was just absolutely amazing. But I loved the points where she was talking about multiple tools doing the same thing. Like shelfware is a real problem, and it contributes to the workforce issue of not having enough people to manage these tools. And and you know feeling behind constantly. Because uh, if you have a bunch of tools to manage that aren't actually helping you, it's a wasted effort. Yeah, um, tools are there to automate and scale people. Um, and uh, about 50% of tools are not installed or are installed correctly. So Shelf the tools wire. that we buy to help us aren't even used. And then um, after that, I want to say it's about 25 to 30 percent of the tools that are installed correctly um, are not tuned for the enterprise. So this is something that uh, we give talks about, and we're also we do a four-hour Purple Team workshop that goes through that because the purpose of being able to drive a threat is to use that to carve the marble down to get to um, better security for how people work with those tools, and that's detection yep. engineering. Um, and we're going to be deploying even more free training out on that. So, so stay tuned on that. That's on the site side that we're, we're going to be doing that. Um, I liked how she flipped the metaphor of the castle on its head. Yes. Right? Like everybody does the castle and it's the immediate trope of uh, the perimeter. And of course, yep. the perimeter is dead. The perimeter is dead. Initial access, going back to Nicole's talk, right, with business email compromise and phishing, is going to happen. It's an inevitability. So understanding your assets, the context of those assets, so that's what I call contextual business risk, is so mm -hmm. important. And I like the way she does it a lot more elegantly than I describe it. I typically describe it as circling the wagons. So using the, the frontier perspective of we're under threat, we close around our own. And so one of yep. the consulting recommendations I always make is identify what I call your crown jewel assets are. Yep. Take those most important things and those are the things that you focus on and you establish controls around those that you're sure of. My, meanwhile, the rest of the enterprises and whatever state it is, it's not as important, but it's better to have a place that you know is where you want it to be and is the preventative and detective levels that you want than it is to try to do it poorly everywhere. Absolutely. Well, you know, the whole, uh, the analogy about having this amazing, huge, you know, enterprise grade smoker, you know, oh my gosh, that looks, looks amazing. And then really what you actually need is here. Like that's another problem too. I, I think um, it's, it's easy to say, okay, we need to secure everything. But if you're trying to secure everything, what are you actually focusing on, right? Like, okay, so maybe you've got this locked down, but what about this very critical vulnerability here that is tied to something you actually uh, actually need, right? Like the Death Star is a great example of that. You know? So. Who, who designed that port that way? What's that? The exhaust port on the Death Star. Oh, it was the... Um... Oh my gosh, I can't remember the name. It was the one from Rogue One. Yeah, it was uh, Mads Mikkelsen. Mm -hmm. 
that hot Danish actor. <laughs> have you seen uh, Have you seen the TV show Hannibal? No, I've heard from so many people I need to watch it, and I haven't. It's really good. So he plays Hannibal in it, and okay. um, the, uh, for, for those of us who are older and remember uh, the original Silence of the Lambs with Anthony Hopkins, like Anthony oh, yeah. Hopkins won an Oscar for that, and it's just, he's he's so incredible, and I think Mads does it even better. Like, the control... Really? The, the, yes, it's, it is another level of what he the way he does it and the way they really like tie in food and like this gourmet level um uh, it's it's something else i i okay i'll have to watch it because i don't know how i feel about somebody saying that anything was better than anthony hopkins in the original because like so good so good yeah i i think he's better than anthony hopkins i think he i think he plays hannibal lecter exactly the way hannibal lecter should have been played it was huh it's interesting it. okay i will and have to if you could take the fact that he's eating people out of the side out of it like the dishes that they make are really interesting <laughs> just ignore the yeah. cannibalism <laughs> just you know whatever the other yeah. other yeah. meat right yeah it's just a good looking brisket yeah yeah we'll just ask Alyssa. i'm sure she's got some amazing tips on like how to you know Ooh, yuck that dark i got dark <laughs> yeah. there by the way, how hungry are you after watching her show, uh, her her talk? I was like, I was, I've been fine, right? And then I'm sitting here and I'm like, my stomach is starting to growl, for sure. Yeah, I'm ready for lunch. I'm ready for food, for sure, 100%. <laughs> um, are you, are you and I am in cook Texas, so I might get some brisket. Are you, are you big into cooking at all? <laughs> no. 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 That is, that is not a gift I was given. <laughs> I like it a food. I don't like it to make it a food. Correct. Correct. Um, yeah, no, it's not a, not a skill set. I ever, I never really wanted to either. I think that's like interesting. I got kind of into baking for a while. My, um, one of my friends was like super into making desserts and like, that was kind of fun, but it was short lived. So, and we all know that, you know, you're not into food at all. So. Not at all. Um, not at all. so <laughs> one of the things that I can offer, um, and I'm not going to put you on the spot, but okay. uh, we published the recipes for Unicorn Chef a week in advance. So it's there and we, we chat, interact with the guests in the, the YouTube chat. So it's a great way to make, because I mean, one of the goals, there's, there's two goals for the show. One, make the kitchen more accessible. So sure. it's a way to, you know, it's, it's a different level of comedy or drama, you know, depending on who's cooking and what's happening. Like food will be produced at the end of, some measurable quality and since you're following along with us it'll probably be pretty good um and then we highlight charities to to give back so um my point is it, most people i think it's just the fear of getting started just like in cybersecurity. Sure. Um, where do i even begin and so we're there every week 7 p.m eastern west on wednesdays to to do that so tonight with kenny we're making an asian wedding soup um so which good. is pretty much um uh meatballs and um uh like a fish like an asian fish sauce chicken broth oh yum easy to make that sounds amazing that sounds amazing i might have to join sometime when i, I would love it if you did that and then i would i would here's where i'd like to take it to another level and so we're, we're okay. booked through april so you've got plenty of time to, to consider this but this one i'm going to trap you on the spot i'd oh. love for somebody who is a beginner cook like you to come and do a show with me and like showing that like hey I can do this right like yeah I I got really into it when I was doing keto like I was cooking all the time and it was really fun and enjoyable for that like so I'd be willing to do that all my recipes were like super simple and I didn't make any of them up okay I I um, hope I prefer yeah. not to do keto yeah no 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 again like that was yeah <laughs> that was the only reason I was like getting into cooking was because like you have to when you do stuff like that for sure. Um, Tripti, good to see you again. Hi, Grayson. Hi, Tushia. Hi. Hi. Oh, very nice to meet you guys. So, Tripti, you have to you have to tell everybody the story of how you got here. Uh, yeah, that was part of my planning. Uh, my intro. Yeah, I have already planned that, but it, it's like really brief. 
uh, story. Do you guys see my screen? We do. Yes. Your your share okay. is up. We've got um, we've got four minutes until we we get into the presentation. So we're just going to okay. chat with you for a little bit until we get started. Okay. Um, awesome. So shall I unshare my screen? Uh, you're you're welcome to keep it up while, while we're talking. Okay. I'm I'm really excited about this because. Um, purple teaming, of course, is, I, I don't think it's a new concept, really. I think it's something it's that it's not, and, but it's it's new to, I think that it's really the way it's been formalized as a, as a process. Um, we published a purple team exercise framework, and that's looking more at the traditional red and blue together. And what I thought was really cool about when I, when I reached out to Tripti, and again, she's going to talk about how she showed up here but I'd seen that she'd given this talk before and I had never seen anybody put purple teaming in application security. Yep, 2016 last con. That's where I first gave the talk because I was awesome. tired of being one person AppSec show and just red teaming or just blue teaming was not working out. I had to combine both and create a feedback loop between blue teaming and red teaming. So yeah, today you will get to hear the story of how this all started. So are we live right now, Brayson? We are live, yeah. No, we are yep. we are just oh, okay. here chatting. Every, the, we're keeping the audience entertained until we start the formal presentation. Okay. So Brayson, how did you got into purple teaming? How did I get into purple teaming? Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so... Um, I used to do really uh, spooky things a long time ago, and mm -hmm. I um, started Grimm uh, by myself as a consultancy back in 2013. And nice. at the time, I had this idea for um, a more integrated operations loop for being able to, um, uh, you know, essentially conduct offensive operations and then a feedback loop for understanding that because that's even today, that's still relatively simplistic. And mm -hmm. um, uh, as as the years went on, we started getting into commercial penetration testing and commercial mm -hmm. red teaming. And it was really interesting for me coming from, you know, where, I mean, again, red teaming is meant to be the emulation of an adversary's tactics. Mm -hmm. And there's a number of <clears throat> compromises that are inherent in that approach because uh, you can't spend the same amount of money as, uh, you know, a client's not going to spend that amount of money in that amount of time. And red teams generally can't spend that amount of money or time to, to do something that is like, you know, the equivalent of like, we're actually like the Chinese APT. Um, and so I knew those compromises, but I didn't realize how far down those compromises went. And so it was several years of, of learning that. And one of the things I quickly picked up was um, and I think anybody who's done offensive security, whether that's penetration testing or red teaming, um, where you do the test for the client, you come back a year later and it's the same thing. Yep. It's yep. the same vulnerabilities. And you think about it and it's like, well, I mean, I gave you this 50 page detailed report. Why didn't you fix <laughs> these things? And the reality, of course, is, well, you know, they've got their normal lives of doing these things and that's not always a priority. And so I just kept thinking there had to be a better way. Um, and one, I felt like the process could be improved. Why, why can't we help them fix this as we go? Um, mm -hmm. Two, I didn't like what I saw, the ego-driven mindset of penetration testing and red teaming. And that's a talk I've given, um, I don't know, I think I first gave that talk in 17 or 18, um, mm -hmm. because I got the impression that the teams were just trying to win. They weren't mm -hmm. trying to help the client. It was, how can I how can I win? How do I get to AD? How do I drop mic? And boom, I won it. You know, like, and the, the, it's not business oriented and it's not beneficial um, and it's it's adversarial. So that's where I naturally found myself into the concept of purple teaming before I even knew what purple teaming was. I'd never heard I the see. phrase. I just had arrived at it intuitively from my experiences. Okay, you know what I thought? That's super simple. I knew you have some sort of military army or Navy background. I thought you were actually a Navy SEAL in your past life. And that's where you learn not only defense, but a bunch of attack techniques, and you brought those to cybersecurity. So were you a Navy SEAL? I was uh, an Army officer. Okay. I'll, I'll try not to take that as an insult, that you thought I was in the Navy. No. 
everything is very uh, respectful to me. Thank you for your service. I'm, 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 yeah, no, I'm just teasing. Uh, yes, yeah, so I was I was an army officer. Uh, I worked in the intelligence community and national security for a long mm -hmm. time. Um, and then, uh, for those of you who aren't aware of my current biography, I still uh, participate in government. I was a strategic advisor to the director of CISA last year. Uh, that was Chris Krebs. Um, I left in November. And I'm also um, an advisor to the board of the Army Cyber Institute. Okay, cool. But this isn't about me, Tripti. <laughs> this is about you and your awesome presentation, which we look forward to hearing all about. And I cannot tell you again, when I when I saw that this was in your background, I just really liked when you and I, I'm not going to give away again how we met and why you're here, but I just, I really liked it when I met you. And when I saw that you had done this, this I wanted to see how this works. So I'm wait all right so let me put you let me do you guys see the presenter more yes yeah. no? yep. that's good yep awesome so a grimcon thank you so much for inviting me here what a pleasure to be here and the short story is um how i found out about grimcon is i happened to uh, meet the founder of grim Brayson Bolt uh, in a panel talk uh, for security innovation. And uh, the topic of the panel talk was purple teaming. And I'm like, wow, I don't even know there is a whole company out there that exists that believes in purple teaming and helps their customer with purple team approaches. So I was very impressed. And uh, Brayson actually asked me, hey, do you want to talk at GrimCon? I'm like, why not? I will be more than happy to share uh, 15 years of my product security learning and how I adopted purple teaming here. With that, let's begin. So uh, before we get into purple teaming, a little bit about me. It's been 15 years I'm doing product security and uh, I was a mobile game developer who did not know the difference between a random number, secure random number, and a cryptographically secure random number. So as a naive developer, I have done a lot of mistakes that I would not do now. And this really helped me to understand the pain points of development teams, engineering teams in general. And I realized uh, how fascinating product security is and I decided to uh, switch my career from mobile development into product security. After 15 years of product security journey, I have recently started my entrepreneurship journey. I will be working on uh, building a genomic privacy startup pretty soon. Uh, but before that, uh, I have led application security programs at Amazon, Q2A Banking, Elimio, who is a uh, leader in micro segmentation, and HP. And when I'm not doing security, I like to travel, paint, and meditate. If you have any questions about purple teaming or content that I will be presenting here, or if you want to have just a, you know informational chat with me, feel free to reach out uh, at these social uh, media handles. So today uh, I will be obviously talking about uh, my experience as part of blue teams, my experience as part of red team why these two teams are not sufficient, then what uh, purple teaming philosophy is. And then I will talk uh, how we can implement uh, purple teaming as part of the software development life cycle to scale and make it more impactful. Uh, I have a couple of examples, and then uh, I will be providing a reference to a case study done by Security Innovation and Illimio together. With that, uh, let's begin. Um, as you all know, purple, uh, sorry, blue team uh, members are those security engineers. They work with the uh, engineering team, development uh, teams, QA engineer, and they basically uh, educate uh, software developers about security controls, defense, way early in software development life cycles. Whereas a red team members can be an independent internal security team, which focuses on hacking shit out of a product, or it can be an external penetration or testing team, 
that uh, uh, security teams usually engage right before the product moves to production or right after uh, basically when uh, the development is complete the motto of security team uh, the blue blue team is basically they are optimist they believe in the power of security controls they believe in empowering developers about the knowledge about security controls and they try to work with these engineering team to make sure the product that they are building all the security controls are considered and i uh, look at blue team members as bunch of optimists whereas secure uh, red teaming members these are more paranoid people they never think that security controls are enough and these people are so creative no matter how much effort blue team folks have put into securing the product the red team members always end up finding vulnerabilities and that's because they focus more on exploitation technique and creative ways of exploiting the product do you all agree with me now with that what's purple teaming right uh, as you know i love painting one day while walking in an electronic store fries i was thinking why is it no matter how much effort i put helping my developers about security controls defense the red team members in my case mostly external penetration testing teams they always find some new attacks every time there is a new tech stack uh, or a new framework used by engineering then the red teaming findings are even more and while walking in that shop i was thinking why is it why can't i help my development teams so that the findings in a penetration test report literally becomes zero what is it that missing and then it struck me you know what as a blue team member i'm teaching my developers everything the security controls the requirement techniques i'm doing threat modeling but i never discuss exploitation techniques with them the exact exploitation techniques used by red team members and that's when i thought i need to create a feedback loop between per, uh, between blue team and red team and when we mix blue and red together it becomes purple teaming and purple teaming folks are realist let me give you guys another analogy so blue team folks when they help uh, their engineers with throughout the product development with bunch of security controls and what not they roll out the most appropriate security tools to help them speed up the secure deployment and delivery of the product these are optimists let's say they are stuck in a storm while sailing in ocean the blue team guys believe that you know all the controls defenses their product has they are going to easily survive and pass through that storm whereas my red teaming member the paranoids one they are like you know what this ocean in that scary storm is so bad we are not going to survive whereas what purple teaming members do is they do not get scared they are not super optimistic they are the realist one what they do is they prepare for the worst they hope the storm will pass soon and in order to survive in that storm they make necessary adjustment by uh, adjusting the direction of the sail that's how they survive now let's talk how this purple teaming philosophy can be implemented in the form of process i'm sure you all have seen security within software development life cycle the top half of this um, diagram shows waterfall sdlc usually nowadays uh, 10 15 years back waterfall sdlc was very common but now the industry has moved into more agile software development life cycle as we are going more and more into a more microservice oriented architecture uh, but in some of the legacy applications and system we still see waterfall stlc exist 
So if you look at uh, how security is weaved in in today's uh, software development life cycle, we will see that uh, at requirement phase, we uh, security members do threat modeling. Then in design phase, we do something called design architecture review from security perspective. In coding uh, deployment phase, uh, security engineer roll out those fabulous static code analysis tool that help developers find code related issue. Then in testing, we basically implement and roll out bunch of security testing tool. It could be a dynamic application security scanner or open source security scanner, or it could be interactive application security scanner. There are like bunch of tools out there. Today's talk is really not about uh, tooling, so I, I don't want to shift my focus. And then when the product, the application is ready to move into production or has just moved into production, basically the code base is mature, we hire penetration testers to come hack our application and find as many security issues as possible. Now, as you all know, penetration testing is expensive. Plus, it happens way late in software development life cycle. When we do threat modeling, uh, we basically use checklist approach or same for design architecture review. So the result of penetration test, we cannot replicate way early in software uh, life cycle development. If you look at the second, uh, the bottom half of the image, uh, which shows agile SDLC, more or less, we do the same techniques, but the frequency of these security assessment methods are actually different. Uh, the speed of delivery and deployment is so high in Agile SDLC that we put more emphasis on uh, basically tools. Uh, and again, the story is same. When the product is mature and uh, it is available in production, that's when uh, we conduct external penetration tests. Uh, let's take a, another look at uh, the same software uh, lifecycle development, but through CI CD. So, with the rise in microservices, uh, we, the industry has adopted more continuous integration and continuous delivery model. And here we give paramount emphasis on rolling out the right tools. And for some reason, uh, the industry thinks that if you have the tools, that means you have the security, you have done all the necessary due diligence. But in spite of all these tools, penetration testers still find really good security issues, right? Yes. So why is that? And I believe that most of these security tools are still in their first generation. They don't necessarily have the context of the business logic of the application or they are not exclusively made based on the technical stack uh, the particular application uses. That's why there is like a lot of false positive and uh, it's a nightmare to deal with uh, not nicely tuned security tools. So I'm, I'm not gonna uh, get there. But basically, in spite of having army of security tooling, still there is something big is missing. Now, when I talk about purple teaming, which is basically mixing the knowledge of exploitation techniques and security controls and making your developers educated about it, this is how it looks like to me. So in requirement phase, uh, the way, or even before requirement phase, uh, imagine when you approach uh, developers or QA engineers or you know any engineering team with bunch of security findings from penetration test report, they don't like it. It's their baby. You're calling their baby ugly with all these security findings. Generally speaking, they do not like it. But when we approach development uh, teams with security trainings, then they feel empowered. I have worked with so many smart developers and nobody has ever not liked security training. They really appreciate when security teams approach them with very comprehensive security trainings exclusively designed for their stack, their style of uh, architecture pattern uh, used by the engineering team. So when I try to do purple teaming, I always, always start with developer security training. 
if they are using Ruby, React, JavaScript, I don't try to teach them vulnerabilities in C, C++. I focus on their tech stack. So purple teaming always starts with developer security. In requirement phase, irrespective of what uh, SDLC you're using, uh, I try to teach them security requirements and I have a detailed um, uh, example just uh, after a couple of slides. In design phase, I not only tell them security controls, but I also explain them exploitation techniques. And what I request them is now you fine tune your design based on the exploitation technique. And then rest of the SDLC goes uh, in the similar fashion. So let's take a quick example. This is an unrestricted file upload feature. Uh, this type of feature is very common in a um, lot of applications. Uh, it could be you know, uploading image or simple text file. So uh, let's see how I apply purple teaming uh, to this particular feature. Before I apply a purple teaming, let me explain you as a blue team member, what would I do? As a red team member, what would I do? So as a blue team member, whenever I see uh, my developers are building this type of feature or they have recently built this type of feature, I make sure uh, to educate them about, hey, you know, bad guys can access this feature and they can upload nasty stuff like virus. So make sure you only allow authorized user. Then I also try to tell them about uh, file size. Make sure you put a restriction on file size. Uh, otherwise, somebody can upload a zip bomb. Right. Uh, then I talk to them about, hey, make sure you do all sort of input validation by checking the right file extension. And please do not use a blacklist approach or sorry, denialist approach. Always list allow list approach. The extensions that you are expecting, please ensure that those are in the allow list instead of blocking all the bad extension. And once the file gets uploaded to the server, don't forget to run antivirus. Now this list looks pretty comprehensive, right? Yes, it is pretty comprehensive and it can probably take care of 90% of the attack. Now as a red team member, I think like an attacker because at any cost, I want to take down this application. I want to upload shell script to take over not just the application, but eventually the system and network. That's my intention, right? So I try to think about all sort of creative ways. First thing I try to look, hey, can I bypass uh, any function level access control? Yet? Then every file has a magic number associated uh, with it. The magic number is actually the signature of the file. So by manipulating the signature of the file, you can basically upload uh, bad malicious files into the application. Then not only this, I try to see that, can I change the content of the file by adding injections? I actually tried this uh, in a banking application which accepts uh, Excel spreadsheet. I try to add cross-site scripting and SQL injection as a content in that file. The application was doing a decent job at uh, verifying the extension size, uh, authorization uh, of the user, but it was not doing a good job verifying the content. And I was successful uh, creating a cross-site scripting injection there. Now, let me wear the hat of a purple team member. I have the knowledge of red teaming techniques I have the knowledge of security control specified by blue teaming. I'm going to mix these two together. So I'm going to turn my exploitation techniques into security requirements. So let's go back here. I have already, let's say hypothetically, I have already trained my developers about what could go wrong with file upload. Now I am explicitly mentioning the exploitation techniques and turning them into security requirement even before they write a single line of code. And in this way, I am shifting that security towards left. I am making my developers 
purple team members because they are no longer just developers they are no longer just security focused people but they actually have knowledge of exploitation techniques that's what purple teaming is and when when we have those type of discussion at requirement phase the uh, probability and uh, the probability of avoiding these type of security findings is so um, high. Also, by preventing these issues from occurring, we are eventually reducing the cost associated with fixing these issues as well. There was a beautiful study done by NIST in 2002 and it talks about cost of fixing quality bugs in each phase. And compared to production, uh, issues identified in production, if somebody fixes these issues in requirement design phase, it is 10,000 times lesser. Same thing applies for security defects because security defects are nothing but quality defects. Security is actually part of quality. So why deprive our developers from this knowledge? As a security team member, why should I keep all this knowledge of exploitation technique just to myself? When I share it with developer, it becomes easy for them to implement and it becomes easy for me to scale it at higher level. So let's take a look at uh, another uh, example. Now, uh, the first column here indicates security principles. These are the 11 security principles and if you if you can think about any 12th please get in touch with me i'll be more than happy to uh, do another talk with you the next column uh, shows security requirements the third column shows security control and fourth column shows exploitation technique now imagine a developer has not written a single line of code they have come to you to uh, give to get security requirements on session IDs. Basically, they are building authentication module. Now, uh, one of the simplest security requirement when somebody deals with uh, authentication is the session ID should be sufficiently long. They should be random and unique across all correct active session base, right? So this is the requirement uh, we have given to the development team. And then uh, in order to further secure the session IDs, we also tell them a security control that, hey, you can even do a digest of that uh, session ID and make sure you use a cryptographically secure random number and you use a FIPS approved uh, crypto library to compute the digest. Now, as part of purple teaming, do not stop here. You have done a good job as a blue team member, but as part of purple teaming, remember we are supposed to teach them about attacks that could happen. Now as a red teaming member, when I see a bunch of session IDs or random numbers, what do I do? I do entropy analysis and I try to find out if the entropy is less. I try to do a brute force attack, right? So let's educate our developers about these exploitation techniques in requirement phase itself and help them partner with them to find the right library that can defeat entropy analysis as well as brute force attack so that's really purple teaming is now uh, let me cover some other aspects of purple teaming as i explained before uh, it is extremely important to approach engineering team through training. And you can create purple teaming through your uh, security trainings. Second, not, do not just focus on developers, QA engineers, the people who actually write code, test code, but also focus on architects, focus uh, on your product managers, focus on uh, your program management office who are responsible for all the releases and schedule and also execute uh, also on the executive team because it's the top-down approach that always works bottom-up approach doesn't work so in purple teaming focus on all sort of roles and responsibilities that are important uh, to ship a product and then weave security accordingly as I explained in those two uh, examples, always map 
your business requirement to security requirements and then eventually explain the security requirements in the form of controls and exploitation techniques you will be most successful implementing purple teaming approach when you speak the same language of your software development life cycle do not keep the security knowledge to yourself go attend their scrum meetings go participate in their bug triage meetings go participate in each and every story time and explain the controls and exploitation techniques so when we completely immerse ourselves into engineering processes and life cycle that's when uh, they understand us and that's the real success of purple teaming and eventually uh, create a win win situation for all sort of parties uh, you can do this by acknowledging their efforts you can do this by calculating metrics that hey once we applied a purple teaming approach see how many less bugs have been found by uh, red teaming members or ever since we implement purple teaming approach see qa engineers are fully capable of finding security defects or you know the over how the overall posture of uh, security posture of the product has improved so call out those wins uh, reward uh, their efforts and what i like to do is every 6 months i like to uh, um, host a hacking event where i invite all my developers qa engineer vps director and come participate hack with us all right uh, so that was about purple teaming uh, let me conclude here my time is almost up so we just now saw having red teams uh, doesn't help uh, red teams and blue teams they both are extremely important for security of the product as well as organization but they working in silos doesn't help when there is a feedback loop uh, between red teams and blue teams and when we share that knowledge with engineering teams that's what purple teaming is and purple teaming kind of approach a mo offers a more holistic approach purple teaming can be easily weaved into uh, organizations software uh, life cycle development uh, process and as i explain when we educate our developers about exploitation techniques the number of issues that get produced are less the number of uh, defects security defects that get identified the remediation rate uh, is very high because developers already know how to fix it find it and fix it the overall roi becomes super high and i genuinely believe in my 15 years of experience it's the purple teaming that truly facilitates a uh, shift left and it also helps to scale uh, application security uh, recently i had done a, a case study on purple teaming with security innovation and if you guys are curious or keen about uh, how i had implemented uh, purple teaming in the past i would highly encourage to check out this case study uh with that uh, are there any question answers uh so yeah we already have a question uh will the slides be available to download is there some place that folks can get these uh yes the slides are already available in my linkedin profile i have shared them on uh site share also i'll be sharing the slide deck with a uh, grimcon committee um the case study that you mentioned there is it possible that we could paste that link somewhere uh sure do you guys still see my screen no oh uh, do you want me to share the link uh, right now yeah if we could just po uh, po uh, paste it in chat absolutely just that, that link for the the case study and then we'll also throw it on discord absolutely So when did you first come up with this idea? Uh 2015 uh when I was one person application security team at Q2E Bank in in Austin, Texas. Nice. So similar, nice. right? There's got to be a better way. Yeah. All right. Um let me share this in chat.
Uh, Grace and I think you guys still see my screen, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So this is the case study and I'm kind of struggling to open the chat. Um, okay. Uh, I think I'm not allowed. Okay, if you if you email it to me, I'll I'll I'll, I'll okay. post it. Okay, I can do that. You probably want to stop sharing your screen so we don't see your email. Oh, there you okay. go. <laughs> Finally. I, Finally. I just, I, I'm always so oh. sensitive about that OPSEC fail. Whenever I share my screen, oh my I'm like, okay. oh no, people are going to see something sensitive. <laughs> I know, I know. And here is a link to um, the case study. Uh, unfortunately, this talk is an hour long and because I had only 30 minutes, I had compressed it. So there are many more aspects of purple teaming that I, I would love to uh, explain if anybody is interested, like how to implement purple teaming in a typical software lifecycle development. What are um, some common mistakes you've seen in that implementation? Uh, some of the common mistakes, I'll start with people. Um, you know, just because security engineers are excited about security and they're passionate about security, they assume everybody's interested in security. And unfortunately, that's not the case. So what you will see is out of 100, uh, 100 engineering team members, maybe 50, 60 are interested and not everybody. So we have to keep that in mind that besides security, people have other things uh, on mind, such as, you know, uh, releasing the product on time. Uh, making sure um, the shiny new features that generate revenue gets preference over security bugs. Um, so that's one thing I have seen. Not everybody's excited about security, but those who are excited about security, giving them ad hoc ad hoc knowledge and training and making them your ally, kind of creating security champions, that really helps. The second mistake I've seen is not getting executive buy-in. Um, from the top tier management upfront. It's extremely hard to weave security in the software lifecycle development and you need right budget, right resources. So when you don't talk about these things upfront, uh, it becomes di difficult and security becomes afterthought. The third mistake I've seen is rolling out incompatible security tools. As I said, security tools are still in their first generation. They still produce a lot of false positives. There are still uh, true, neg true, uh, true uh, negatives. So these tools, when, when you are doing proof of concept uh, to select right tool for your organization, always make sure you include your developers, QA engineers, get their perspective as well how they are going to feel about operating on these tools. It's extremely important. So, and another thing I want to call out is there is just way too much um, emphasis on buying commercial tools. Sometimes it is uh, super easy and cost effective to build your homegrown security tools. Uh, would you like to hear an example, Brayson? Absolutely. 100%. So, <laughs> I have seen um, a lot, and this is a beautiful example of purple teaming uh, approach as well. Uh, in one of the organization I had worked, I had seen a lot of sensitive information was getting leaked into logs. Now, application security folks do not take a look at the logs. Logs are something analyzed by uh, the infrastructure security team members in production, right? They have access to SIM and they sometimes may catch it or may not catch it. But getting sensitive information leaked into logs is such a crucial problem because these logs, let's say in case of a SaaS application, these logs get shipped to customers and from customers environment, God knows which business analytics uh, will uh, capture and you know may encounter sensitive information. So this is a really big problem. And in spite of teaching my developer, I you know, do not um, do not lock sensitive information. I was not having great success because to be very honest, 
development teams they do generate uh, logs for debugging purpose that's how they debug and when they are testing security features it is quite possible that they may log session ids or credentials or whatnot so just having a proactive approach of telling them hey do not um, capture log was not sufficient so what i did using my purple te uh, teaming hat i requested i participated in their story time and i exclusively called out a security requirement once this feature is complete qa engineers will write uh, automation to look for session ids credentials uh, tokens and all sort of sensitive information that this feature is using and they will make sure that it is not getting locked i did not stop there i requested a uh, development team to actually write a homegrown scanner so they wrote a simple grab base filter that can scrub logs and it, it it basically checks for these files so in this way throughout the software lifecycle development not only the requirement story time but also in design qa and post production base we solve this problem and having our very own homegrown security scanner to identify sensitive information inside logs was so much more effective then learning sim sim tool and trying to uh, find the, this type of information uh, it probably took uh, half a day for development team to write such tool and because it, this tool was written as a collaborative effort between security development and qa guys qa guys immediately plugged that tool into automation qa automation framework now that tool runs on all the releases all the test beds and we get to uh, we, we basically identify sensitive information asap so that was my purple teaming approach to solve this issue so um follow-up question on that since you you started talking about something that came out in our panel which is um like in the security community we take for granted that people even know what red and blue is right mm -hmm. and in the building community right it's like that's not, that's just like we throw it over the fence, right? It's the classic like development to operations challenge. Um, but then there's all of these security components to that, which are uh, essentially a part of quality and features, right? We're turning them into mm -hmm. features and stories and agile development so that they're, they're incorporated in that way. Uh, mm -hmm. But something I still have, I, I think it would be interesting to, as like a further step in that maturity, would be building um, system of systems security testing into the the pipeline so not just you know particular features to the application but recognizing that an application runs on a system and there are other systems around that and the security is not just directly the potential vulnerabilities on the application on that system but also you know potentially what could be um, an unintended consequence somewhere else or on the plus side where i'm mitigating and controlling those um, even though I didn't realize it, or I or I can implement those controls and know that. So, because a vulnerability is does not necessarily have to be addressed directly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I like to talk about uh, you know defense in depth uh, approach. You know, many times uh, development teams may not have time to fix the vulnerability by making code changes, and that's where, as you explain, Abrason. Uh, we need to rely on security controls provided by the system or security and security controls provided by the network at organization wide level. For example, you know, there is a cross site scripting in some application. The application is already in production and it would take, let's say, two person days to fix that vulnerability and then test it and release the code. We don't have that much time. Hey, let's go for WAF. WAF is an organization-wide uh, you know, control, and it will prevent the injections from getting into the application, even before those cross-site scripting payloads reach uh, the vulnerable application, we stop it. So WAF is a great control. Another good example I can think about to prevent is CSP, Content Security Policy which is also implemented for entire uh, application, the enterprise application. And it can prevent cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. And because of these defense and depth 
techniques such as CSP or WAP, we are actually giving our development teams enough time to thoroughly fix the vulnerabilities and test the fix. Well, that scratched my itch. This is what I was looking to hear, and I, I really appreciate it. Trisha, do you have anything? No, I. this has been so fun, like l listening to both of y'all go back and forth because it, it's such an interesting concept. And I I had never even thought about it as specific to the AppSec side, which is is huge. It was such a great talk, such a great talk. It makes so much sense, you know? It's like, it seems so obvious, but I've never even thought of it. Yeah, and uh, uh, Trisha, when I tell my developers and QA engineer, I am the blue team or red team, but you guys are my purple teaming now because you are now fully knowledgeable about the exploitation technique relevant to this application. You are my purple teaming. They get so excited and thrilled. I can't even tell you. Love it. Again, it's another theme that we've had with almost everything is, you know, this positive reinforcement and bringing people together. And, you know, it's, yes. it's a very important aspect of our community, 100%. Yes. So it's like extending our security community to development teams and utilizing on their skills. Like it's been 15 years I've written uh, code. So, you know, it was kind of tricky for me to write that log scanner. And when I asked my development team to do it, they're like, yeah, boom, half a day. And here my log scanner is ready. Oh, I so, love yeah. it. I'm going to be picking your brains one on one in the future because I've got some some implementation ideas in that space. Um, and I have a funny feeling that this stealth startup you're a part of might be connected to the space as well. Sure. I am happy to help in any aspect. I, I do believe in purple teaming. The artist inside me believes in purple teaming, Brayson. So, yeah, utilize me wherever you want to. And I'll help well, with whole heart. And with the uh, site gift card to the swag store that if you, you haven't seen it was, was sent uh, a day or two ago, um, you can get a purple unicorn. Uh, so what are our purple team t-shirt? You know, uh, I have already ordered it, but now I want what you have. You have some golden unicorn, right? That's oh, a golden. Oh, so I should have I should have changed colors. I have <laughs> I have my purple team. So this is this is my summer unicorn outfit because, as Trisha noted, um, I was giving her a professional unicorn advice that the onesie gets hot. So I don't wear onesies anyway. Um, I have custom um, hoodies, and so I have. I don't what was it did I wear a hoodie for our panel I did didn't I yeah 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 um, you did I I remember that yeah. wonderful hoodie yeah so uh, so I have the blue team the red team nice and the purple team this is such Very a flex cool. right now Bryson such a flex yeah and then the golden unicorn on top of everything love it <laughs> It's but amazing. yeah, so I, I also have I should have I should have switched out my my uh, summer unicorn uh, for the purple. Well, what, we have one minute left. Why don't you do it? <laughs> well, I mean, it's going to be you sit there watching me mess around with Velcro, and um, I think it's going to just <laughs> okay. look embarrassing okay. that I'm as uncoordinated with Velcro as possible. I show up, you know, in in proper uniform. Me doing the props, kind of okay. messy. Totally understandable. Yeah. All right. Um, so I guess this is it. Uh, once again, uh, Brayson, thank you so much for introducing uh, this wonderful platform to me. Uh, what a pleasure to talk here. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It was wonderful. Thank you. Bye. Coming up shortly, we have Sid Chopra with cybersecurity education without behavior, behavior change. What is the point? I'm super pumped for this one because, you know, getting to the root of the problem instead of treating the symptom. It's, it's people. It's always it's people. people. <laughs> it's always people. It's like, it's, it's always, always DNS. No, it's always people. Until, it's people. yeah, it's always DNS. It's always people yep. until artificial intelligence is actually a legitimate thing and not just a marketing term. Um, subtle dig. Uh, no, it's it is still going to be people Don't that worry. do tell the computers to do what the computers are going to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
Don't worry, I'll just go ask the blockchain um, when the AI is going to be ready. So. so, so wait a second. Are you saying that artificial intelligence isn't real? I didn't say it wasn't real. I said it is not operational at the level where it is driving these things. Well, can you do me a favor? Can you tell me when actual intelligence is operational? <laughs> and that's back to where we were just making the joke and why Trisha was looking forward to your talk because it's about people. Ah, but well, so Trisha, I, I think I'm going to have to have your help because I'm in IT and I'm not good at talking to people. You haven't heard that before? Really? Okay. Well, I'm going to ask that question right off the bat. What's wrong with communication in cybersecurity? In your chat, in the window, just tell us what's wrong. What have you seen from your perspective that people do wrong when they're communicating about cybersecurity? I love interactive sessions. This is great. Yeah, me too. Uh, so folks, put that in. I think you have to put it in as a question. Um, and I'm going to hop over to Discord. Oh, we can't use the chat? Uh, I don't know if the, they can use the chat. I know that they can put stuff as a question so we can see it there. Um, and on Discord, um, we've got Jovi says not interacting. Kenny says it's not about lifting others up. It's about lifting oneself up. Interesting. Um, I think somebody's She's taking a Discord like... joke. <laughs> well, so th that's the question I've been asking for quite some time. Uh, for a little bit of background, I, I got hooked on computers when I was in sixth grade, went to a summer camp they had uh, at a university. And it turns out that whenever you go to a university, smart people don't know how to use locks. And so we were able to get into the computing, uh, one of the computer rooms and be able to play around with some computers. And we found the password was written down on some old printouts that had been thrown away in a trash can. And we were able to get into the system and start playing games and things like that. Now we were in sixth grade. So the idea of holding them ransom or anything like that was just completely oblivious to us. We just loved playing games. And, and we found out all sorts of games that we could play. I don't know what else we could have gotten access to. And fast forward, I got a degree in computer science. I went, I was a system administrator. I was a system administrator for the army. Uh, I worked for SAS Institute as a senior software developer. And I did IT security audits for Fortune 100 companies and taught organizations like Brink Security and the Tennessee Valley Authorities, um, power producing companies uh, about uh, cybersecurity IT controls. And one of the things I had learned over the years is that when we present this information, too often times we're doing the pump and dump approach. We're giving a bunch of information and expecting them to be able to absorb it and more importantly, to change the way they act. And that last bit is really difficult and the approach that we've been using has some very fundamental flaws that go all the way down to the, neuro, the, the brain level, to neuroscience. And so we've talked to a number of neuroscientists and cognitive psychologists and behavioral scientists and neuropsychiatrists, uh, about 190 people total. And we've been working with organizations like the National Institute of Standards and Technology and uh, the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education. Ways that we are currently presenting information and looking for ways that we might be able to better align it with the way the brain actually works. So uh, I, apparently I need to share my screen. Yep. Yep. So I just so promoted I just you promoted to a panelist and a presenter, presenter while we were doing that. We were doing that. I'd like to thank oh, the Academy yeah, for that. That was very nice of you. It's, it's really about the little people. So the question is, does this really matter? Does this whole presentation, is it just pointless? Um, Elisa did a, a fantastic job of queuing me up, but I want to take it one step further. She did really truly a, a lot of great information that she had talked about and uh, I, I wish that you know I could have the graphics that Nicole had and the singing ability that Bryson and Trisha had I have none of those things the only thing I have is hard questions and 
some disturbing answers. So first off, does this stuff really matter? And I want to give you an example of something that was created by the National Initiative, for, um, the National um, Institute of Standards and Technology, the National Center for Cybersecurity Education. They created this this document called Telework Security, an overview and tip guide. Now, I don't really, I mean, it was great that they consolidated this information, but, uh, and it's a lot of really good information. The problem is for me, I don't know that this is going to be easily absorbed by somebody else, and I don't think it's going to be retained by them. And lastly, I don't think it's going to change anybody's behavior. What do you see that's prominent in this, uh, this, this guide, this, this one sheet? You see a globe, you see a couple of icons, and you see some numbers. Now, does that improve your understanding of telework security? by looking at those things? If you had two seconds to look at this, what would you walk away with? My guess is probably not a whole lot. Would you be enticed to read more? I suspect probably not. You might, but I think that there's a lot of other people in industry that probably wouldn't want to look any further. So the next question I have for you is, are you, a law abiding citizen. Now this is a real important question because we, 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 we have some people that maybe they wouldn't answer yes to, uh, especially if you're on the hacking side, but most of the people that we're gonna be working with day in and day out would like to think that they are law abiding citizens. And because they are law abiding citizens, they almost always like to do the right thing, almost. Some of you have seen signs like this, I'm not gonna say everybody, but I'm pretty sure pretty much 99.99% .99 of the population of this webcast is gonna see signs like this populated all over the place. The question is, how often do you actually follow the speed limit? What do you do instead? Well, chances are you speed. What do you do when you find somebody that follows the speed limit? chances are you get pretty aggravated. Why? Because this is a limit that's standing in your way. It is some a, a, a break on your ability to get from point A to point B as fast as you want to. It is an arbitrary limit in you know, many people's minds mm -hmm. that is opposed upon you. And a lot of people resent it and even more people ignore it. So why do we think that when we create these rules about cybersecurity and tell people this is what you're supposed to do and this is what you're not supposed to do, why do we think that they're going to follow along? Well, you know, for, for them, cybersecurity isn't a life and death situation. But, you know, for people that are driving around and, and uh, on the highways, it can be a, a very life-threatening situation if they go too fast around a corner. But why don't they do it? Well, because it impedes progress for them. And I, I suspect some of you have been in, in situations where you are stuck in traffic. And, and how do you feel when you can't get to where you want to go in a timely fashion? Even if you don't have to be there on time, it's still incredibly aggravating. It makes our blood pressure go up. We get our stress levels go up. Even if we don't have a, a, a deadline, it's still an impediment that we don't like. Too often times, cybersecurity is viewed a very, the, the very same way. So what's wrong with our approach to cybersecurity education? Well, I, I think that, you know, as I said, Alyssa did a great job of explaining some of the things that you're supposed to do. I want to drill down even deeper. Why? Why do we need to do those things? And a lot of, for a lot of us, it's just because the world of communication has changed. We're no longer, you know, having to pick up the phone or write letters and put it in the post office. We're using 
social media and we're using messaging and things like that. And, and I don't know if you've had any kids, uh, you can't use those same methods that we did when we were growing up to communicate to our own kids. And they just ignore us. So that's a, a problem for a lot of us. And, and a lot of us have the problem of uh, the way we value communication. What we do has also been impacted. And we are not, we don't value the same things as we used to value. And we also have a lot more complexity, more complexity than we've ever had before as a species when we were dealing with especially things like the internet. This is a network diagram of the internet, the entire internet back in 1975. I had talked to um, a number of conversations and actually interviews with Vince Cerf, who's one of the inventors of, uh, of the internet, um, known for TCP IP. And we, they didn't perceive at the time that the internet would be as big as it was. It wasn't designed for the world that we have right now. It wasn't, security wasn't the big issue for them. And so we're trying to, we've unleashed this, this wonderful tool, this spectacular tool, and we gave it to the world, but we didn't give them any training on how to use it. We just let them loose. And one of the things that uh, Dr. Cerf had talked about was this notion, and he said that this wasn't exactly what he meant, but, but we need kind of, an internet driver's license to tell people what they need to do and what they don't need to do and things like that. Just a little bit of training around how do we have basic cybersecurity hygiene or basic cyber hygiene in general. And that's not always easy to get people to do it. But the problem is the consequences of not doing it are dire because we depend on computers for almost everything. In fact, we could argue that there is not a single industry in the world that doesn't use the internet for something. And as, as such, it's a vulnerability. A lot of people didn't realize the consequence for all this connectedness was the security of our information, our assets, and ourselves. No one ever told them that. Right now, a lot of our approaches, unfortunately, of telling people the security is again, as we mentioned, the pump and dump. We're going to throw a bunch of information at you, and hopefully, some of it sticks. It's the same thing as essentially as as pleasant as verbal vomit. Right? We want people to listen to us when we talk. We want to be as efficient as possible, but we're optimizing it for us as the presenter and not often the audience and what they're going to do with the information and how they're going to retain that information. Most of us don't spend a lot of time thinking about that and with good reason because in when we're coming through school oftentimes the education system we're exposed to the lecture format and the problem is again the lecture format is optimized for the presenter not the audience. George Bernard Shaw said the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. And for many of us in the cybersecurity world and many of us in communication in general, this is so true. We think that we've trained people. We think we've done our due diligence. But if we don't get them to actually change their behavior, all we've done is wasted a whole lot of time and money. Now, that may be kind of provocative, and I'm going to make my case, and you get to decide whether or not I'm right or wrong. But I will tell you this. I've given this same talk, or a very similar version of this talk, at the National Institute of Standards and Technology to the Federal Information Security um, Systems Educators Association. So basically, all the cybersecurity experts and CISOs and uh, whatnot throughout the federal government. And the gentleman that's sitting there uh, is the chief information security officer for the US Department of Education. So this has been somewhat vetted, I would, I would hazard to guess. And uh, also Vince Cerf, who also viewed this presentation, and you can see it yourself on YouTube, uh, said this was 
uh, entertaining, but also profoundly, disturbingly correct. Disturbingly correct. Well, that's disturbing. Why are we in this situation? Well, it's because we have brains. Now, for some people, this might actually be uh, questionable, the people that you end up dealing with, but I assure you, 99.99% of the people you deal with on an everyday basis have brains. The problem is a whole lot of us don't know how they actually work. And we make a lot of assumptions, a whole lot of assumptions about how our brain works. And it turns out that our brains are actually not wired, not wired for accuracy. They're wired for efficiency. The brain takes up 20 to 25% of our calories. So essentially most of the time we eat, we're really feeding one org organ and that's the brain. And so it doesn't want to use all that, those resources. So it come up, comes up with all kinds of shortcuts. We talk about our gut instinct. Well, that saves us processing time, right? We can evaluate a situation and make a decision very, very quickly without having to go through every single step of the analysis to come up with a logical decision, right? And that comes up with some problems because oftentimes we make it an incorrect decision. But we're part of this is because our brain was designed for a world that we evolved into, right? A hundred you know, a hundred thousand years ago, the world that we lived in was very different than the world that we live in today. And our brain was actually evolving a hundred thousand years ago. And over hundreds of thousands of years, this is the structure that we get today. And the ones that were curious, the ones that had to have all the data to make an accurate decision were eaten by the lion that was rustling in the bushes and said, you know what, that, that rustling in the bushes could be a lion, but it could also be a mouse. Let me go investigate and find out more. Well, they removed themselves from the gene pool and we got the one that said, you know what, I don't like that. I don't know what it is, but I'm sure as hell not going to find out. I'm hightailing it out of here. That's the ancestor we got. The one that was said, you know what? I don't need to have all the information. I'm going to make a decision and get the hell out of here just because it scares me. Nothing else. No other data. It scares me and I'm out of here. Well, I'm going to give you an example. Let's see if we can get you to experience this discrepancy, this problem ourselves. For most of us, our primary perception of the world is visual. Seeing is believing, right? But it turns out our vision isn't actually all that accurate. If you look on this graph, this shows you right here that most of the rods that see color, this is the structure of our, our eye that actually sees color. Most of it is just a little bit off the very center of our vision. And it drops off very quickly as we go away from the center of our vision. And then in the, the, the cones, which see black and white, light intensity, drop off even faster. They drop off almost immediately the way we get away from the center of our vision. And you'll also know this point right here is called the blind spot. This is where we see absolutely nothing at all. Nothing at all. Well, what's the ramifications of this? Well, it turns out that what we see isn't actually what's actually there. Now, for, for all of you guys, see if you can see, how many of you can actually see all the numbers on the left-hand side, right? Can you read, this is a 25. Can you read this number? 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 You read this number? If you have perfect vision, perfect color acuity, you can see all the numbers. On the other hand, if you have, uh, what they call a uh, red-green color um, insensitivity, this is what you see. I'm more on the right-hand side. So I perceive the world differently than most of the people that are normal, have, have regular color 
uh, acuity that don't have any kind of color blindness. So the percep my perception of the world is fundamentally different than yours. And it's biological. It's not arbitrary. It's not me being willful. It's not me being um, ornery. It is a biological function. And we all have limitations, all of us. This is just personal, but we have bigger limitations that we don't really consider often. The image on the right is a, an example of what is presented to the brain, right? Or is, is presented to our frontal cortex, our decision-making uh, center of our brain. But that's not what the eye sees. Because of all those, the, 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 the concentration of the sensors in our eye that are concentrated in the very center of our eye, what we really see is more like the image on the right. It's very clear, it's clear in the center, it's got color in the center, but as we get further away from the center, it fades to black and white and it gets fuzzier. Now that's what we, our eye actually sees. That's the information. Actually, it's not. That information is flipped upside down. That image actually should be flipped upside down and there should be a big black dot in the middle of it or off to the center just off the center where our, our blind spot is. So our vision is wickedly processed by our brain. And depending on how our brain, the things that we've seen in our life, our brain is going to interpret those images differently than if we saw other things. And this, this is, a, again, this is a biological function, right? And our perception of the world is heavily processed and it's processed by the things, the experiences that we've had. So when somebody paints a picture for you of what reality is, it's only their perception of reality. And it may not be anybody else's. You may be alone in that. So we have to both be cognizant of the fact that other people are gonna see the world differently than us, but also that when we try to communicate, that we work hard so that we can see their perception of the world. Because otherwise, we're gonna be talking to them and we're gonna be potentially arguing with them needlessly. Because what they see is different than what we see. So what do we do instead? Well, instead of trying to expect people to adapt to us in our communication styles, maybe what we need to do is start adapting to them. What do they need? And first off, actually looking at how our brain actually works. Now, this is a, mental, a model that we've been working with from neuroscientists, cognitive psychologists from all over the world, uh, trying to understand how our brain actually processes information and get to, uh, how can we improve our ability to get to action? And it turns out that understanding here is optional, that we can actually get to behavior change without them truly understanding what we're talking about. Now, you know, a child, we tell a child not to do all kinds of things. They don't necessarily know all the implications and all the rules and all the things that are there to protect them. All we tell them is don't run out in traffic, right? And we punish them and we, we get them to, to change their behavior without them truly understanding all the ramifications. And there are a lot of other examples of that. Most of the time, our childhood, we're being taught a whole lot of rules and, and, and uh, moral values and things like that without truly understanding all the consequences. And we've been operating that way for, hundred thousand years. So this actually works. Understanding it turns out, while it's really valuable, is not required. In cybersecurity, behavior change is what we're after. We really need people to, to actually do the right thing. They may not understand it, but they have to be able to do the right thing. And so now what we do is we have to go back and reevaluate, well, how do we optimize our communication style for 
behavior change. Well, that's a long discussion. I don't unfortunately think we have time to get into that or to, to, to really cover that topic really well. Now, I will give you an idea that one of the things that you could do is reach out to a gentleman by the name of BJ Fogg, uh, who used to run the persuasive laboratory, a uh, persuasive, persuasive technology laboratory at Stanford. Uh, and he talks about how we can change people's behavior by using a different approach and a different timing. And so he, his model is that when we're trying to try to motivate somebody to change, we have to bring the right prompt at, at, at the right time. And we need to make it, if it's, if it's something that's really um, important, we need to make it so that it's easier to do. So uh, this is a, a, an example where he says that if, if under certain, certain, certain circumstances, giving people prompts will fail if it is either hard to do um, and the motivation is low, that's where we're, we, we really need to work on either making it easier to do or increasing the motivation to do it. Because prompts alone, telling people to do it, won't work. And you can look at a lot of his work and I've interviewed him and some of the interviews are actually on YouTube. Uh, you can go to uh, Google Sid Chopra on YouTube and you should see some of these. So the question is, what do we do? Well, we have to make it stupid simple, stupid simple. This is a gentleman by the name of Steve Cooper. Steve Cooper was the CIO of the US Department of Homeland Security. He was special assistant to the president right after 9-11, then became the first CIO, helped stand up the Department of Homeland Security. Then he became the CIO of the um, US Department of Commerce. And somewhere in there, he was the CIO of the, uh, of the FAA. Numerous number of, numbers of conversations with him. And, Whenever we talk about communication, he always says that we have to make sure that people, whenever they go out from our organization to business units or other organizations, that they take time to understand the, the audience that they're speaking to, their issues, their problems, their challenges, and show how we're supporting them in their mission. We cannot dictate, we cannot lecture them, we cannot browbeat them because we will not be able to get the behavior change we want. And again, you can see that inter interview with uh, Steve Cooper on YouTube as well. So what does brain friendly really look like? Well, this is an example of uh, a rework that we did uh, using some people that were PhD candidates in, in behavioral science and human factors to try to make that information more palatable to the way the brain processes information. So in the first few seconds, you can come away with something that would give you a grasp of what that document is explaining to you, making it compelling and at the same time informative. So that's that magic. How do we make something compelling? How do we make it informative and how do we make it motivational? So this was just an example, but we need to reevaluate all the information that we're presenting people to see, does it actually align with the way the brain actually works? Does it actually make somebody want to read it? Is, does it pique their interest? Does it grab their attention? Does it uh, give them a sense of trust that it's that it's something that they're going to find worthwhile to read does it motivate them to act and lastly is it memorable if we change their behavior today what's going to happen a week from now when we're not there anymore will they fall back in that same old behavior that got them in trouble to begin with or here what happens then we can't constantly be training them we need to be able to do something profoundly different than just lecturing them well, how? Now, how is that going to look? Well, it's going to be tough. And I, I'm not going to 
lie to you. This is going to take some investment, and we're going to have to spend a lot more time trying to rethink the way that we've been working for quite some time. And that change is, as, as much as change is difficult for them, it's going to be difficult for us. Because we've been indoctrinated in one approach, and that approach we've been able to show, to show scientifically, doesn't work. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you, that your community, our community, what can we do differently? What can we do differently to actually optimize our training and our education programs so that we can actually achieve a long-term change in behavior? How can we improve the cyber hygiene of the workforce? And if we're not, I mean, if we try to continue dumping this information to them, it's just going to confuse them. And then they're gonna start turning off. And that's gonna be a problem, perhaps maybe an issue for somebody else, but ultimately it will be an issue for you. I wanna ask you one favor, everybody pull out open your wallet and pull out a $20 bill, a $20 bill. And if you look at the back of a $20 bill, it says the words, in God we trust. As my late father would say, in God we trust, but everybody else has to pay cash. In our world, the only people we're going to trust is God. We shouldn't be trusting anybody else. But when we're trying to get people to change their behavior, we need their trust. We need their trust. We have to, to work hard to win their trust. Because if we don't, if we don't work hard to gain their trust, well, it's like ripping their money, tearing it up, all their time, their money, and their investment. And that may be okay for you to waste their time. But somebody's paying the bill and they're not gonna be happy. And the question is, if, if we can actually connect with them in a way that's meaningful, if we can work with them instead of lecturing them, if we can get them to open up and to be a partner in the training, if we can inspire them instead of lecturing them. Why? Well, we can do magic. So I wanted to thank you for all that. Uh, I, I'm not as talented as some of the other speakers, but I hope that we've been able to spark your imagination, to get you to think differently, to invest your time and efforts in trying to do something magical and realize that the people that you're talking to, the way we're, the people that we're presenting to, the people that we're trying to change their behavior can actually be partners in creating this magic. And in fact, I would say they're the only ones that can create the magic. All we have to do is inspire them and, and get them to engage. You can follow me on, here's my um, social media uh, options, and you can, as I mentioned, some of these interviews and the presentation I gave at the National Institute of Standards and Technology is available on YouTube. Thank you so much for your time, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. Any questions? Many companies today use phishing exercises to encourage reporting and provide education to their user bases. How do you address a repeat offender or someone who doesn't care about phishing exercises? How do you reach the people who don't care about how their behavior affects the company? Well, I think you're gonna to have to explain to them the consequences. I think that most people, once they understand that if the company is hacked, they lose their job, it, it oftentimes can, can change some things. But there are also ways that you can use social pressure, that their peer group can actually encourage them to do the right thing, 
people are very motivated by not wanting to stand out negatively in their peer group. It'd be one thing if they got, if they caused something that impacted them, but could you imagine what would happen if their whole company recognized that that's the person that let the, the company get hacked and they're the reason why everybody lost their job? That's pretty mo pretty powerful motivator. Just a thought. Now, there may be a lot of other approaches and I'm more than willing to uh, entertain them. And I think what we need to do is start a dialogue about these different approaches and trying to understand what would work best in what circumstance with what group, what, what audience. These are some things that take some time and we, we really do need to, to research. Well, if I think of what you're you're talking about, I mean, there's the emotional human appeal to that approach. Yes. Right. Yes. Yes. And and again, uh, we're we're not motivated uh, by logic. It turns out most of us remember we go back to that that person in caveman days when we, they were uh, hearing some rustling in the bushes the ones that sat there and said, I'm going to get more data to make a logical decision. Well, they were removed from the gene pool. We inherited the brain of the person that said, you know what, I'm going to jump to a conclusion with uh, incomplete data and get the hell out of here. Right? So using that logical approach, while it may seem perfectly rational, presumes that we have a rational brain and we really don't. Our brain is not based on logic. Our decision making is not based on logic. Let me rephrase that. Super interesting. <clears throat> Science is cool. Uh, <laughs> communication styles are multi generational. How does a company approach these challenges while addressing behavior change? So I think that's interesting, right? We we were just talking about like human to human, but there's of course the fact that humans are different ages with different predilections. Um, and also, I mean, this ties into the theme of diversity with folks understand things differently based on their backgrounds and that can be influenced by gender, race, socioeconomic status. Mm -hmm. This kind of goes back to the idea of lecturing to people. It turns out that the lecture, there's a definition of a lecture is, is the transference of information from the, uh, the, 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 lecturer's notes to the listener's notes without going through the minds of either. And that's not going to obviously work. What I've been experimenting with, and there's a gentleman by the name of Dr. Don Norman, who is a, a, a thought leader in something called human-centered design or human uh, community-centered uh, human design. And, and what here's, he's suggesting is that we actually create communities. So we would create communities that would create the content. We would create a guide, uh, much like you know, the National, Initiative, the National um, Institute of Standards and Technology has created the framework, the NICE framework. Well, we would create communities around the NICE framework that would create a specific version of that for their community. And I think that might work better that what we have, instead of expecting IT to come up with all these different versions, we partner up with the different user communities and say, hey, listen, this is the basic guidance that we have created. Can you help us tailor this guidance to your user group with your user community? To get them to create means that they have created buy-in and they have that credibility, that trust that we talked about earlier to their community. So that's my approach. That's how I would do it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, going to them using their words, trying to, you know, trying to show at least that you're making, like wanting to bridge that gap, I think helps too. You know, just seeing like, um, <clears throat> it goes back to uh, the old adage, like, when you travel to a country that speaks a different language, like making some sort of effort to at least say, hello, do you speak English in their native language? Like it, you know, it has a completely different, um, a completely different outcome most of the time than just walking up and assuming that everyone speaks English, right? Um, so it, it, it's, it's an interesting concept and it makes sense. And, and the parallels are all around us. If we just open our eyes to those, uh, you know, the, that example that you said, when we go to another culture, 
is so true. It's so true. And it and we just don't think about that when we're in an organization that when we go to accounting or if we go to uh, marketing or some other business unit that we they are actually experts in their world, but their world is significantly different than ours. Their way they look at things, the way they approach things is significantly different. And that if we try to lecture them or if we try to talk to them the way that we would talk to people in our own community, too often it's going to fall on deaf ears and if we try to be forceful they're going to be there you're going to burn a bridge know your audience exactly well not only knowing your audience but tailor your message to that audience yes it's not right. enough to know them you're going to actually take that message you can't tell a a, a, um, a child that his goldfish died by lecturing your 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 particular brand of whatever Latin name of your goldfish has deceased and is no longer with us. We've summarily flushed it down the toilet. It will now join the sewage system for the, and be cleansed by the municipality. I mean, you can't do that to a child. <laughs> Yikes. Yeah, yeah, I don't have goldfish. All right, Sid, thank you so much for joining us and expanding everybody's minds and perspectives. Thanks for the opportunity. And I see Marina is on and testing out her setup. Hello. Hi. Oh, I was muted. Sorry. <laughs> Not muted anymore, I believe, right? Nope, Y'all can hear me hear fine? You. Nope. We, sure yep, can. we got you. How are you today? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Kind of a stressing work day, but hey, we've been there. We've done that, right? <laughs> Why is your day stressful? Oh, it's meeting after meetings, right? And with with the pandemic and all that, you you spend a whole day jumping from one um, platform to another. It's meets, it's Zoom, it's uh. So yeah, <laughs> it's constant. It's just constant. Sure. At and some point, we Brazil? gotta stop. <laughs> I'm sorry. Are you joining us from Brazil? I am not joining y'all from Brazil. I am from Brazil. Uh, Sao Paulo is my hometown, but I am in this current moment in Austin, Texas. Uh, I live here with my husband. You all may know him as Dual Core, maybe. Oh, yes. <laughs> I know Dual Core really well. Yes, he is my husband. <laughs> oh, you and I, I think you and I have actually met before. Probably. Very, very I mean, it's not hard. Probable. It's the guy dressed like a unicorn. <laughs> I know a few, to be very fair. <laughs> yeah, no, the last time I saw him was at a Wild West Hacking Fest. Um, and oh, I, I led miss... a whole group of us up on stage. Um, that was in 2019. So we were oh. all up there rapping with him. Yes, I was there. I was there with y'all. Yeah, that's where I met you. I missed the conference. I just don't miss the cult. <laughs> <laughs> Being from a tropical country, I am not OK with all that snow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had a lot of snow. That's why they moved it up. So uh, John Strand over at Black Hills hosts uh, Wild West Hacking Fest. Um, I would I would say it's very much like a partner conference, very similar to the way we do things. And it's based. They moved it up to September now, so that it wouldn't be so cold um, and snowy. Kind spirits, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and here I am talking from Texas, where we had a huge freeze, right? Yes, we did. Yeah. People lied to me. People told this this here this here is a desert and all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean to be fair, that was it was out of I don't know. I I I grew up in Texas and um we had like one or two that came kind of close to that. Nothing like this last one it was ridiculous. <clears throat> yes, it was. All right. Well, Marina. We look forward to your talk, The Tropical Spy, Tricks and Stories from a Brazilian <laughs> Social Engineer. Super pumped. This is going to be great. <laughs> um, Dual Core actually insisted for me to change this uh, this title, so just so y'all know. Uh, he wanted it to be um, uh, a Brazilian tricks. <laughs> and of course, I didn't went with that because, come on, got to be serious here. 
So yes, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, social engineering and physical pen tests. This is the once upon a time in a physical pen test kind of talk. I, uh, from this point on, I will apologize for uh, stuttering. <laughs> I am, uh, although I have been living here in the U.S. for the past year, I still am not. I'm, I'm still am not 100% on the language. Uh, my original language is my mother language is a port, uh, Portuguese from Brazil, Brazilian Portuguese to be specific. Uh, no, it is not Spanish. We do not speak Spanish in Brazil. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, I am Marina Chavada, uh, and I am a journalist by <laughs> degree. I have my degree, uh, my first degree in journalism. Uh, and from journalism, I jumped to events organizing. Uh, back in Brazil, I used to organize a lot of hacking and, and infosec uh, conferences. I think I've organized more than 200 or nearly 300 ones around the entire country. It was a lot of events. Uh, and because of that, I got to know a lot of people uh, from the hacking scene and the infosec scene as well from Brazil. Uh, so I became a community manager as well, and I was also the leader of a huge volunteer team with more than 1,500 people. Uh, so it was fun. <laughs> uh, and because all of that, I had, uh, you know, I had close, close contact with a lot of people uh, giving the talks and, you know, creating the content that would go and uh, be presented on these conferences uh, and all the communities and, you know, so I got to learn about social engineering. So I already had all this, you know, human abilities in me because of journalism, because of community management, uh, because of events organizing. And then um, I was already in love with hacking. I will tell a little bit about that in just a few seconds. But uh, to me, that love really expanded uh, when my when one of the people that I've met in an event, I think y'all may know Mark Rogers, he told me that um, hacking was supposed to be uh, whatever you wanted it to be in your own life. Uh, so if you you know if you have it as a lifestyle, is if you have it as a if if you have it as a mentality, uh, you should be calling yourself a hacker. And that's when I was like, okay, then I, I guess I'm a hacker now because I really enjoy social engineering. I really like the subject, and I was I was start I started to studying uh, quite a bit. And from there, I went to awareness uh, campaigns. I I you know built a lot of camp uh, awareness campaigns for a bunch of companies. Uh, and I'm also now a content producer in social media. So if you go at Marina Chavada, just as my name is written here on the screen, you can find me talking about social engineering and hacking and information security. Uh, so uh, yeah, hacking esports right there on the in the chat in the. <laughs> oh, there you go. That's the picture. Thank you, Bryson, for the unicorn picture. <laughs> uh, so yeah, um, hacking esports is also something I host. Uh, if you don't know it, it's a live CTF that happens on Twitch every month, uh, and it's pretty cool. You can see us talking about CTF and narrating a live match, uh, just like an eSport. But anyway, uh, I'm also head of my own company. You, you, I think you got the picture. Whatever. <laughs> so this part here, this is what spoke really loud to me. Um, what was the Twitch that I just mentioned, is hacking esports, just as someone wrote it uh, up there. Uh, so y'all maybe know the Hacker Manifesto. I took a very long while to get to know it, but once I, I took a gander at it, uh, this part right here just spoke very loudly to me. And you gotta, uh, you gotta I'm not technical at all, so you gotta think like, when uh, I, I was a journalist, I was a content producer, community manager, I was, you know, um, already struggling with the hacker word, and this just came very strongly to me. I just, uh, you know, read the manifesto and I was like, "That is it. This is social engineering. This is what I like. This is what I want. This is what I want to do for a profession." Uh, which is, you know, my crime is that of curiosity, uh, little piece, and that starts our quest on physical pen testing in social engineering for little Marina back in Brazil. So. Just as Jason Street also does in his talks, whenever he's gonna start start talking about social engineering, 
Uh, it is a subject that still a lot of people hear what we do and they're like, oh my God, that's just mean to do with people. So please, <laughs> whenever you feel like, uh, oh my God, Marina is such a bad person. Please remember the cute little Brazilian animals, uh, the cute little Brazilian, <laughs> you know, puppers. Uh, and remember that I'm doing all the stuff that I'm going to describe today, uh, you know, for a report, for a final report. So people can actually learn to be safer and to be more secure in what they do and how they, li they live their lives. I talked about being a uh, content producer. I also teach the final users around the world, uh, like your family or your friends. I teach those people about security as well, about their own security. Yes, I have that kind of patience. <laughs> so just remember that whenever, you know, uh, I'm, I'm going to say something that is, that's going to be kind of uh, problematic. <laughs> um, Marina, you're gonna left. You're gonna tell the story about exploiting the poor guard with your heavy books. Uh, yeah, maybe, probably, yes. <laughs> so yes, uh, social engineer. Uh, if you don't know what a social engineer is, uh, it's you know it's a we also call a social engineer a human hacker. Uh, we go for the human error. So we are there to take advantage of people making mistakes or inducing them to make mistakes so we can uh, take uh, take advantage of that. Uh, so, you know, as a lot of people talk about you know, the human error as we, you know, we lay around and expect someone to make a mistake. But a lot of us actually are the source of that mistake as well. So you can call it like a manipulation techniques. I don't kind of like that uh, description, but I guess it is what it is. This is easy for people to understand. So uh, we go to, you know, uh, psychology and so uh, sociology and behavior analysis to explore the human responses, you know, to explore the commands that people will uh, respond to. Uh, therefore, we study the human behavior to better approach people so we can have access to stuff we shouldn't. Uh, and that's what I do. I started doing uh, physical pen tests a few a few years ago, like four or five years ago. I don't remember. I don't remember anymore. Uh, but it was out of nowhere. A friend of mine that uh, was, uh, you know, building this social, uh, social engineering awareness platform uh, got this really big client and the client went on a physical pen test and this poor friend of mine, he was also very overworked and not at all a people's person. <laughs> there was a reason why he was working with a computer. Uh, so he asked for help and knowing that I was really good with people because of all the events and community management, uh, I went there with my first, uh, with the client and I helped him in a physical, uh, you know, assessment uh, in a physical pen test. And it was just a blast. <laughs> the client was very happy at the end. I was very happy at the end. The company was very happy at the end. At, at the end. It was, everyone was like super, uh, super um, excited uh, because I did a bunch of crazy stuff. It was my first assignment I had never done or uh, read about or studied or even know it existed, you know, physical pen testing. So I did a bunch of stuff that you're not supposed to do when you're, you know, doing it day to day not because it was against uh you know ethics it was nothing unethical but because it was dangerous for myself <laughs> and nowadays i don't do a bunch of that stuff that i should have not i should not have done uh so i got a few techniques here that i usually use use a lot in the um, physical pen test that i uh, used to do in back in brazil uh, i'm not doing it since the pandemic of course uh, but uh, I used to do a lot of tailgating, a lot of tailgating. You cannot believe the places you can get with just tailgating. I mean, it is, I know it's very obvious. I know we've been talking about this for ages now, but just just to illustrate here, I got uh, one of my, uh, my most like uh, paranoid clients. They gave me a lot of warnings like, um, it was one of my, one of my, I think it was my second or third client. I can't even remember, but it was 
way in the beginning. Uh, and they were very, very, you know, high alert. Like, uh, we're going to have uh, the president of the company. It's going to be in the build. He's going to be in the building. And he's, he has a lot of uh, personal guards with him. And we cannot control of the, what that guards are going to do. So you got to be very careful. And we got a, a bunch of stuff in place, like cameras all around the building and, uh, you know, access and whatever, uh, and access points, uh, controls and whatever. And the client just gave me like all of this, uh, you know, scary talk. And I was like, damn, I don't, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know where I'm getting into. I'm kind of, I'm kind of, you know, scared for myself, but I went anyway. And this was a client that took me 10 minutes to sit on the president's chair. <laughs> and it was a hundred percent tailgating y'all <laughs> from the street uh to you all the way to the building it was a hundred percent tailgating i i came from the street as a complete stranger i did not have a clone badge the client didn't pay me to do any rec uh, recon so i had you know i barely even looked at the the maps and all i just did google maps it was very very like unprepared the client didn't give me any any like time uh, it was kind of a blind test, almost. Uh, it wasn't a blind test because, 100% uh, a blind test, because I already knew someone from the building. Uh, but it was almost there. Uh, and I went from the street uh, inside the parking lot, and there was, you know, this big gate that people would badge in. And I just waited for someone to badge in, and I, you know, tailgated the, tailgated the gate. Uh, and once I was inside the parking lot, I did have a, a, a fake badge. I just went on, you know, Google and typed the name of the company plus badge, and I found um, a provider. Actually, th this company did not have a lot of people, uh, you know, posting badges on social media. But the provider, the person who, the the company that did the badges for them they posted it <laughs> and that's how i got the fake badge so i you know printed a fake badge and uh i you know uh from the street to the parking lot and on the parking lot it had the, the it was a big, big building i had already seen on google maps that they had this uh this you know service entry on uh, entrance on the side of the damn on the side of the building there you go I don't know if I can curse. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I learned English with sitcoms and shows, so cursing happens. And uh, on the side of the building and the 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 service entr entrance, the service entrance was also you know badge in kind of situation. So I just waited again for someone to badge in, and I went uh, you know to the service entrance. The service entrance had no extra uh, control uh, access control. So I was able to just um, climb the stairs, you know, walk, walk up through the stairs, uh, the fire escape stairs. It was not a fire escape because it, it was inside the building. Back in Brazil, the, the fire escapes, the fire stairs, they're usually inside the building and not outside. I know, not very smart. Uh, but yes, I went up through the stairs, the service stairs. And once I was in the top uh, floor, which, you know, I judged it was the president floor. Um, I just waited for someone to badge out from the floor. It took like two minutes of me just pretending I was looking at something at my phone. And once, some, and once someone did, um, I just walked inside and got it right. It was the president's floor because, when, you know, rooftop uh, floor. And it took me a couple of minutes to find out where the the room was because you know big room like aquarium kind of room uh and i just it was empty pretty much almost no one in the floor i just walked in the room and i was like okay i guess i'm gonna sit in the director's chair and i did all his stuff on the table you know i took a few pictures and all and send the videos to the security uh, team that had hired me and this security team was like what how did, is it's been like 15 minutes since you started and I'm like well yeah I'm already sitting in a president's chair they were like oh my what what did, why have you done to go there I'm like I tailgated like three doors 
Emma and I'm here. <laughs> and that was it. So yeah, tailgating. Very bad. Very, very bad. Uh, still, still works wonders. Uh, services, entries, or stairs, as I said, you know, just gave you the, this example. Most of them have absolutely no cameras, no one watching. Uh, in Brazil, uh, also, very few of them have any uh, access control, like badges or biometry or anything. Very few of them have that. So if you get to the surface entries or stairs, you're in. And you may be sitting on the president's chair in just a couple of minutes. Um, so fake reception email. This one is also one that it, it sounds pretty obvious, but it works wonders as well. Uh, what I do is I walk up to the reception and usually the reception uh, give you, just, they just give you the email of the reception. If they don't, uh, you may find it in the, um, in the website of the company. And if you don't, uh, some of the receptions have the email printed in like on a, on a, you know, on the wall or something. Uh, and if none of those, those cases uh, are true, you can just insist for one or two minutes with the set, with a sob story to the receptionist and you may have the, the reception email. Uh, you know, oh my God, I'm here for a meeting and I'm late. And the did you did you see any email? You know, letting me go, uh, letting me go inside. Did 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 the, did the person X sent you the email letting me go inside? And the receptionist will look at the, at their computer and say like, no. And you go, oh my God, I can't believe this. It's already like the third time it happens, and you step away. And in five minutes, you can put up a fake Gmail account, you know, just a new a new, a new email account, a Gmail account, for example. Uh, Gmail is, you know, a trustworthy provider. So people look at Gmail and they're like, oh, okay, I know this one. Um, so you can just set an email up, an email up real quick. Uh, you can go to Google and, you know, type companylogo.png so you can have the transparent version to put on your email signature. You can spend one, two minutes on the social media, you know, like Instagram, for example, and check for the check-ins on the company's address uh, and have a random person's picture. Just make sure it's not, you know, the CEO or a very well-known person. Uh, usually it's very easy to find people do a lot of check-ins in their own companies uh, just so you can have a face on your face on your on your fake email and there you go you're good to go uh, you you send a face a, fa a false email uh, for the reception like oh yeah this person will get there at this point in time and please let them come in I'm waiting for them this is very important or whatever you send this false email to the reception and in you go. Uh, <laughs> and there, there, there it is. Uh, people from the reception are, are not usually usually trained to check uh, the uh, what is after the at on the email, so they almost never check if it's actually a legit uh, a legit email from from the inside of the company. And there you go. You're you're in. This is ha this has happened for more than more than I can count actually I can't count how many times I've used this technique to get inside and it worked so yeah a fake badge we all know this trick right uh, you go for either social media or you go mainly social media <laughs> or Google just you know Google in general and you type the name of the company plus badge or you just hashtag name of the company or hashtag badge uh, and you can find a lot of badges I have this you know very filled uh, this this uh, folder on my computer filled with pictures not actually a folder on my computer but let's say a folder on my computer filled filled with pictures and prints that I take from people on LinkedIn for example that every time they get a new job they post a badge there so I have a lot just in case I need <laughs> uh, so I put here OSIN because sometimes the company do have a uh, you know a policy against posting their badges online but 
there's always someone that don't obey that. And if you if, if they do, I already told you a case where the the provider, the company that actually did that produced the 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 badges was the weakest link and they posted it and I got I got it from them. And it was not hard to find. It was like on page two on Google. So you know, uh, not they they have the no badge policy, but probably there's no one checking if there's actually people posting it or not. Uh, and you know, from social engineering, you can um, usually what we what you can do for the fake email uh, example that I gave you, you know, creating a conflict uh, or creating a problem, and you know, almost immediately solving that problem for the person. So, oh, I know, you know, I, I'm gonna have to do this thing, but uh, you're, you're gonna have to do this huge thing for me, but don't worry, I have this other thing for you that you will, it, it will make it easier. Uh, so, yes, <laughs> usually the fake me email is a good one. Like you, you get very agitated with the reception. They, you know, people feel what you feel most of the times. There is always a very good level of empathy going on uh, with human to human. No matter how empathetic you are, there's always some basic level, unless you're, you know, a psychopath or a sociopath. Sociopath, but usually it works pretty fine. Uh, if you rattle them, if you get them hyped, uh, they will feel like, oh my god, I didn't have this task before, or oh my, oh my god, I didn't have this problem before. But if you take a deep breath and talk to the person, look at the person, you know what? Don't worry, I'm not gonna burden burden you with this. I am I'm gonna work a miracle. I I got this. I got you. Don't worry. Just you know, give me give me the access to the Wi-Fi, and in like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, maybe 20 tops, I can solve that, and you won't have to 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 worry with that. There you go. You have the you have the password that you needed, or you had the access that you needed. Um, this it that that was a real example. <laughs> Um, you can also, you should also uh, impro improv. I know a lot of people say don't improv, do your homework. Yes, do your homework. Do, do, don't you ever go to an assignment, don't you ever go to a mission without your homework well done. Your research, uh, you know, all of the, your recon if you can, uh, but ultimately stuff that you don't predict will happen especially in brazil that is a poor country and nothing works the way you should someone is always out sick and you didn't predict it or there is like construction or it's there's always something insane going on uh back in brazil and in the middle of the day and you never expected it so you gotta be very very good with the with the with, with your improv uh, a very good example here is um i was in this client it was a very huge media client uh like a TV, like a television thing uh and i was supposed to get uh access to their um, internal like um intranet inter intranet is that the name like the internal system that people use to communicate and put up tasks and all of that uh and i was supposed to get access to that like oh my god how am i gonna get access to that and so i went uh for the help desk department on lunchtime lunchtime is usually when everyone leaves uh you know the the intern behind or someone that you know, is in depth with the world. <laughs> so the person stayed behind on lunchtime. Or is someone like overworking, they gotta rush through a deadline. So it's usually not someone that's prepared to deal with anything extra during lunchtime. And that's when you wanna attack. Uh, and I found that person, I found this this dude that was left behind on the desk, on, on the help desk department. And I told him, you know, oh, I have, uh, I'm here from another state, and uh, the, you know, the big company sent me sent me here to check on something that's uh, wrong on the system. It's been uh, on, like, it's 
it's an alert that has been beeping us for a few weeks already and we finally got to you know bring someone here which is me and i'm here to check it so yeah sorry for the delay but we're we're here and we're here to fix it and the, the dude was not entirely having it i felt like he was 60 percent there i was like Oh my God, and I have to be quick because I had already two missions that I had to do on lunchtime as well. So I didn't have much time with that dude. I needed him to just buy whatever I said. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I'm gonna have to improv on this one. Uh, and I started walking, uh, you know, um, walking on, in circles, very worried and I'm like, uh, do you know where the, the nearest airport is? Because I've not, I've just now noticed that my airplane's gonna fly uh, two, three hours from now, three hours from now. And I have to, you know, uh, get this thing ready and go to the other department and get another thing ready. And I'm just not sure if I can make it. And I gave a very small window of time on purpose because I knew the airport was really far. I would never make there in three hours. <laughs> So the the help desk dude who was like, oh, oh my God, no, you're like, you're, you're in trouble. And I mean, and, and I was like, oh my God, don't, don't say that. I, I really need to fix this. Like it's, it took so long for, for the company to send someone here. And now I'm here and I'm, I'm also going to lose my flight as well and not fix the problem. I can't, I can't let that happen. And um, a person from the technical systems, I think department, it was a weird name. Uh, of the department, but it was right in front of the department that I was. Uh, he were, he heard what I said, uh, all the sob story, and he came to the he came to uh, participate in the conversation as well with the with the help desk dude. And he was like, "Oh, don't worry, I can log in for you." And he logged in on my machine, and he was the sys admin of the internal system. <laughs> So what I did is, while they were discussing the best routes for me to grab my, to to catch my flight, uh, I unplugged my computer from from you know from the uh, the batteries. I unplugged the battery the batteries, uh, and uh, I had my computer purpose purposely on a very slow, um, it was not slow, a very little battery. Um, uh, Damn it. I had my battery was very low on purpose charge. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, very low charge uh, on purpose uh, because I had already tried this before and it almost worked. So I was going to try to do this again and it worked. And the sysadmin logged in and I was like, okay, unplug, wait for a few minutes and down it went. And I was like, oh my God, oh no, I'm going to run to the other department, but I'll be right back. Uh, to try to solve this. I'm so sorry, but thank you so much for coming here in my aid. And I just grabbed my computer and ran. Uh, and the <laughs> the session was saved on my computer so I could do whatever I wanted in the internal systems. So yeah, Interprov. You gotta be able to, <laughs> to find your own jewels and just roll with it. Uh, a bunch of things is just simply asking. A lot of people think of this like huge uh plans and all of that and most of the times you just you just ask a lot of the times back in brazil this is this is very scary but a lot of the times back in brazil if i just stand in front of a door that has like a password or badge reading or something like that if i stand there long enough someone will come and open that door for me without me asking i swear <laughs> this is this is not a lie <laughs> it happened like five times already. If I stay there long enough and doing like this and and like this and looking at my phone and worrying myself, there you go. Someone comes in and opens the door for you. And the last one, I love this one. I'm gonna try to run through the stories here. I'm usually gonna take this long with this doc, but it's, since it's in English, I didn't calculate my time right, I guess. But I'm just gonna rush through. But this one, I really want to say the the that someone called IT because it's the one that I have most fun with, uh, <laughs> which is you just knock on you just knock on someone's door and ask if someone called IT, and everyone in the entire planet 
at any given time has called IT <laughs> for some you know weird reason for some very dumb reason uh, so if you knock on their door and you can even ask like is the internet kind of slow here today <laughs> it's like it's gonna rain computers on you <laughs> especially in Brazil I had this mission uh, once that it was I had to break into the monitoring room where all you know the video camera or the the feed from the security cameras were and uh, it was a very hard room to find it took me quite a while to find where the room was uh but i did and it was this giant like iron door of uh, you know very solid door with the pad with cameras on both sides with you know a vacuum chamber in the middle it was it was a hard place to get in so I, what i did was like i don't see any very very smart way to get into here and except like knocking on the door and hey did someone call it and i did it it worked <laughs> i got in the, the the monitoring the security monitoring room and the people that were it was a security guard and two ladies uh, i don't think the two ladies were supposed to be there but they were there um and i would just started like plugging my usb drive like everywhere and just looking this, I'm not I'm not technical, just so you know, I'm like zero technical. So I have actually no idea what I'm doing when I'm plugging stuff into places. I have I have people to help me with that. Um, you know, but I do I do have my my bash bunny and all of that, but f far from that, far from that, you know, um, I'm not I'm not a systems hacker. But I was plugging my bash bunny everywhere and you know people were not paying any attention they were talking to each other and you know from time to time I would look at a computer unplug the mouse plug the mouse back again <laughs> plug the keyboard plug the keyboard back again doing this face like mm, this is so weird yeah I don't I'm gonna I, I I probably have to step out to make a call to my manager. Just give me like five minutes. I'll, I'll be right back. And <laughs> there I go. And then I go away with all the stuff that I that I had in my USB drive. And that is it. I love the this. I, I love this one. Did someone call IT? Or you ask if the AC is too <laughs> the AC is too cold or something like, or if the printer is jammed or whatever you want actually. Uh, just have your fun with it. So yes, stealing. Um, I steal a lot of stuff from meeting rooms. Meeting rooms that are unlocked are easy to find or they have the whole schedule on the door. I love that because that means I know when the meeting room is free, uh, is unused, so I can walk inside a meeting room and I have an entire meeting room for myself and that gives me a lot of credibility. I use that to steal information from departments because I pretend I'm someone from you know, another uh, another company or uh, another unit of the company, another campus or whatever, and I'm there, you know, to collect feedback on a new tool or something. And people love to give you feedback. They will, they will go, they will, they will give you a lot of information uh, if you just sit there with them for five minutes and tell them uh, you need feedback. I use a lot of, I you know, walk around a lot of common areas. Uh, there's the craziest things happening in common areas. Once I caught this entire launching uh, meeting, it was a new product, a very high profile product, and all of the codes were on screen on the common area. I swear. And I, I did not hide to record anything. I literally seated on a beanbag, put my feet up, and had my phone here on my face while they were doing the meeting. Yes, uh, document cabinets. Back in Brazil, it's very common for you to see the document cabinets with the key on the hole. You just leave there with the key on the hole. You know, doesn't secure anything. <laughs> Or the keys are like right on the wall, just hanging on the wall, and you can see the keys. Yeah, uh, unlocked rooms. Just 
you know, jamming the door. Uh, Duocore has very good laugh, laughs with me because I do that to pretty much all doors I can see, especially my family's doors. Every time I go to someone that I, I know, I just try, you know, I just try the knobs to make sure which rooms I can get into. Unlock devices, you know, this is as old as time. Uh, you can do a lot of fun stuff with unlock devices, especially turning the screen up upside down. <laughs> uh, I do steal a lot of uniforms and accessories to, you know, keep on building my, my pretexting once I'm inside. Uh, I have once stolen like six uniforms from just, just one assignment. I finished the day with like the, <laughs> the maintenance, the cleaning crew, the <laughs> the medical, all of the uniforms I just kept like, uh, you know, pulling them out of my of my backpack. Um, fishing, fishing, and smishing. Yes, you can, and you should try to always combine those to your assignment, even if you are on field. This is really helpful if you need someone to open a door for you, uh, or if you need to someone give you access to somewhere and you, you need a password to a lab or something, you combine those, you you get to know the, that person's number. It's not that hard if you know where they sit, they usually have uh, you know cards or the, if their information is lying around, so you can combine attacks while you are on the field or even before. Uh, about USB, so as you see on the example that I gave, uh, you know, earlier, bat USBs are really fun to have with you. I don't know if I'm like, I'm over my time or not. Please, here in the chat, if y'all can just let me know. <laughs> I'm just going to keep talking. Um, and there you go. Uh, for manipulation techniques, I don't like that word, but I'm going to call it like that. Or uh, for... Uh, human behavior, uh, you know, um, assertiveness. I don't know how to say this in English, but for human behavior molding, I, whatever, you can call it manipulation. Finding or causing human error. Uh, so yes, you have to have a very good report building technique. Uh, you can either, you know, make the person feel very close to you super quick or make the person feel uh, safe if you're around, make the person feel happy, you know, tell them a joke or be nice or just be very kind and gentle. It's something that most people are not used to. Their day is going bad. They're stressed. They have stuff to do. So if you're nice, uh, people will help you way faster. There's a lot of people that ask me, in my talks and like in social media media in general. If I'm like pointing a gun to people or if I'm threatening them, oh, you should like, you, you're good at OSINT. So you're gonna get to know like all their dirt and you're, you know, they're gonna do everything you want. Like, don't, don't, please don't do that. That's, that's a very bad uh, way to build rapport. <laughs> that's no rapport at all. Um, you don't wanna do that because the negative effect last way longer and brings you way more risk than the gentler and kinder and nicer uh, and nicer and happiest approach uh, because people like to be happy and just in life you can see this you remember uh, all the bad stuff right you remember them way easier you criticize yourself harshly you forget to you know um, celebrate the little things in your life, the little the little conquests, uh, the little victories, and they fall forgotten if something goes wrong on your day because it's frustrating, because it's infuriating, and something can pretty much ruin your entire good day if they're bad enough, which is not much for you know the regular person. So because of that. You want the good feeling. You, even if even if you hype them, if you hype your target, you want them to feel good at the end. So, you know what? I got you. I'm gonna solve this, and you know, you, you're gonna help me. You're gonna make this thing work. We're gonna make this thing work. And there you go. You you built a very good report. Um, and divide and conquer lunchtime and after our hours. I kind of talked this about be uh, uh, kind of talked about this before. Uh, you want people that are, uh, you know, 
by themselves or almost by themselves. You don't want to buy a bunch of people. A lot of people can raise a lot of flags. Uh, you want as less people as possible. You want to go and therefore you want to find them at lunchtime or after hours. I do a lot of crazy stuff during after hours. I steal all all the kinds of, of things you can imagine. I have stolen medical exams and you know uh, blueprints from the director's department from uh, you know from after hours uh, and it's pretty, pretty much anything you can touch inside of the company without raising any alarms. Um, so you gotta build credibility. Credibility is super important. Um, it is what will give you most of the accesses. So either you was if you if you're a support if you are if you are trainee, uh, I do that a lot because I'm a, a white girl, a white little girl. So people tend to not give me enough credit. I I usually can't uh, you know barge in giving orders because that would make me a B. People don't like bossy women, and um, they usually just don't take me seriously. And because of that, I take advantage of you know support or trainee or junior or someone that needs help or someone that indeed in a support uh, supporting role. I'm I'm there to help them and not to boss them around. Uh, but it all depends on your profile, of course, on you know how tall you are, your skin color, your voice tone, everything. I have this, you know, uh, this voice tone in English, but my voice is my voice changes completely. You have to be able to do that with your tone, with your rhythm. You got to be able to, you know, build your your character. You you, you do your pretexting pretty good. Uh, so usually when I'm talking to people, I'm like super cute and. You know, that kind of makes them feel more um, connected to me uh, because they like they like someone that is cute and, you know, it's smiling and all. Um, I also speak the same language. I try to learn as many uh, lingo as I can from the company. So how they call the reports, uh, how they call the teamworks. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm past my time. You, you are past your time. We were letting you go, but there's only a few minutes before us to the next speaker. So Awesome. So I'm finished. <laughs> there was a lot of stuff. Uh, I was going to talk about awareness, uh, but we all know about that, right? We got to train our people. We all know about that, right, people, right, y'all? Yes, we yep. do. We, we've had uh, we, the talk before you was talking about changing human behaviors um, for cyber to improve cybersecurity. Um, Nicole Hoffman earlier gave a talk on, which I think should be like, mandatory fishing training because uh, it was actually like interesting yes. and well put together amazing absolutely so <laughs> that is that is pretty much it yes so i just bought a bunch of a bunch of stories and tales and that was that was just for us to have fun <laughs> no it's super interesting i think everybody gets a kick out of like physical pen test stories you know it's it's super interesting all right, thank you everyone. And if y'all have any questions, you can find me on the Discord server. And that is it. Sorry for taking so much time. Not at all. Interesting content. Good to see you again, Marina. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. I don't know where my mouse is. Oh, I found it. Sorry. Yeah, excellent. Oh, Darth should be here for this. All right, Micah. Hey, how's it going, friend? Uh, doing all right. I uh, I'm very excited to read your presentation today. Yeah, this is a different dynamic from the last time that uh, we were on a presentation together. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, do you go on? So, yeah. Uh, uh, oh, go ahead. No, 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 you tell the story. Um, my very first uh, conference talk ever was with um, Micah at Circle City Con. <clears throat> it was a co-talk. Yep. So I've so been doing that way back for a little bit now, and I just find somebody that expresses interest in being a presenter, and I offer to help them build out their talk and even to stand beside them as they go through and uh, execute it. Actually, goes through and it's worked very well. It was a good time. 
was a good time. I thought, I thought you were going to roast him, Trisha. You, you you were talking a big game. I did roast him. He just like blase past it. So Micah puts a lot of, uh, you know, every talk that he does, uh, he really like makes the slides intended for like GitHub repositories so people can go in and learn. And, and I think it's really cool. But as a marketer, watching these incredibly text heavy slides, it hurts. I mean, it physically hurts me. So Micah, I'm looking forward to reading your presentation today um, and uh, hearing it, hearing it um, secondarily. <laughs> well, <laughs> this is a little bit of a shortening of one that I uh, originally gave at Circle City Con. I've given it at several other conferences and this was involved all around how the real reason that I believe that the Galactic Empire failed was because of a bad data governance issue. So who am I? I'm Micah K. Brown. I'm an IT security engineer at a large financial services organization. You can find all of my talks on my GitHub. Please, Trish is absolutely correct. My slides are incredibly dense because I want you to be able to download, share, and use them if you find them compelling. By the way, Bryson, I gotta say, you got Mad Game on your smoker. I've got the same one. I hope you're put it to as good use as I do. Uh, but that being said- I love my Kamado Joe. Yes, I do. I'm uh, the co-host of the Threat, Hill, Threat Real podcast with my good friend, Matt, as well as I've been volunteering with the Greater Cincinnati ISSA chapter for about 10 years, 11 years now. That being said, if you're ever in Cincinnati, we have a lot of groups that are designed to make your professional and personal life just a little bit easier. We'd love to have you at any and or all of our events. So while I agree in Star Wars Episode Four, Luke Skywalker is absolutely heroic. I do not think that he is the hero that allowed the Rebel Alliance to go through and to escape the Battle of Yavin. Also, Chewbacca deserves a medal. Where's my proof? It's right here in the opening crawl, or let me go through and zoom in on it a little bit. It clearly says that the Empire lost authority over the Death Star planes. Now, regardless whether you are subscribed to the Legends canon of Dark Forces, or whether you go through and you follow the newer rendition with Jane Erso, that's up to you. But that being said, who is the hero that allowed the Rebel Alliance to survive. I think it's this guy, a common everyday IT security practitioner or data analyst that struggles to find a work-life balance. He struggles to get the correct tools, resources, visibility to do their job and protect the global empire. He has daily challenge separating the signal from the jam. He's re responsible for articulating the bleeps, the sweeps, and the creeps. And he has some challenges going through and communicating to Imperial officers at times. Also, Michael Winslow, he deserves a medal as well. So this got me asking myself, what is data governance? Now I'm not going to read this slide to you, but what I wanted to show you was that four very reputable sources define data governance just a little bit differently. There's a lot that's the same, but there's a lot that's also different. So what can we say about data governance? Well, obviously it means different things to different people, and that's cool, that's all right. It allows businesses to, to decide what data governance means for itself. It often involves people, processes, and technology, maybe not just in that order. It allows the business to make dis or strategic decisions on how data is stored, processed, transmitted, and accessed within its environment. It should also help build up the confidentiality, integrity, and availability, ensure Data governance is how we decide how to decide. Now, I love NIST. One of the greatest things that they do is their little icons because it goes through and it conveys a really deep message in a very simple methodology. So here we can see that data governance really is that 10,000 foot view. So I was actually creating uh, this talk in Austin, Texas as I was going and camping for an IndyCar race down there. And I started to ask myself, well, what does data governance mean to me as an IT security practitioner, as a blue teamer? So I proposited that there are several rules, laws, regulation, contractual agreements that affect the organization that I work for, and that cause certain state actors, in my case, it could be business management, IT security, legal, maybe you have a risk management team, 
to go through and say, hey, we need to have a data governance program, which focuses on the ownership, the accessibility, the security, the integrity, the and the knowledge of how we use data and where it is stored in our organization. These are then expressed in various policies, procedures, processes, and ultimately, I would hope that we can go through and use some sort of active controls, or as I called it, an actual data governance tools or technologies to enforce policies in our environment. So if we aren't required by any rule, law, regulation, contractual agreement to have a data governance program, why do we need to go through and invest the time to invest the money, to invest the resources? Well, in my personal view, I find that with a mature data governance program, we can enable better decision-making. We can reduce operational traffic friction. We can go through and we can adopt common sense approaches to our data issues. We can build standard and repeatable processes. And let me tell you, that is absolutely huge to have certain building blocks of your environment that just have security, that have data governance, that have privacy built in from the seed is awesome. It can go through and reduce the cost and increase effectiveness of all of our other controls. And for me, I'm a big, big believer in transparency. We are allies of the business. We are defenders of the business. We need to be sure that we are open, transparent, and that we have earned our peers' trust. So I came up with the tool, Actionable Data Governance Tool. There's probably a better tool out there, but this was what I came up with at the time. So this is a control that allows us to go through and to apply some sort of policy that is in alignment to our data governance program. So this can be like a permit, a permit with a special encryption, like requiring a dig excuse me, digital signature or requiring the file to be encrypted in transit. It could be permit with the justification where we ask the user, hey, we're seeing this odd behavior. Can you help us understand what is going on here? We can permit with an alert. We can deny with an alert, or we could deny it without an alert. You might have other options in your environment. So, of course, when we're talking about data governance, there's, of course, the Triforce of store, process, and transmit. But I think there's a fourth, a hidden Triforce, and that's identity and access. And I say that because primarily most of the data governance tools that I use on a day-to-day -day basis go through and make the fundamental assumption, not that it's right, not that it's wrong, it's just what they do, that the user, that the entity, that the process that is making a request of a system is actually that system. And as we can talk with any of our peers that are more on the red or purple team, they've gotten pretty good at asserting and taking over other entities, be they users, be they computer assets. So in my mind, this identity and access is absolutely a huge fundamental part of any data governance program. Now, in spending four years of my life standing up a global data loss prevention environment, I came up with this saying that I used often, is that there is no false positive. There's only poorly written rules. And it got to be a meme within my organization, but it became very effective. And why I say that is at the beginning of our process, we were just throwing out, oh, that was a false positive. Oh, that alert was a false positive. And what were we saying when we said that's a false positive? We're saying that we got an alert from our system, that we went in, we did our research, we evaluated things. And at the end of the day, we believe that, that alert was in air, that we wasted our time. And so as we saw the system turning out 30, 40, 50% false positives, what were we telling ourselves? What were we communicating to our managers? We were saying, hey, this tool stinks. So instead of that, I challenged my team, let's take a look at our alerts on validity versus accuracy. So validity, did we get the desired result? So what I would do is I'd strip out human emotion, I'd look at the input, I'd look at the rule, and I have to say almost every time I did that, I agreed that we were getting valid alerts out of the system based on 
both what was coming into the system and the rules. And that was really interesting to me. But the accuracy, did we detect on what we think we should have? That was a bit down. So by changing to viewing things through accuracy versus validity, we are actually able to go through and to start to communicate, hey, we need to work on tuning our system. We need to work on our definitions. And I think that was an incredible breakthrough for me actually going through and modernizing our concept of what DLP, data loss prevention, data governance tools could be. So I wanted to come up with a framework. So within my volunteering with the Greater Cincinnati ISSA, we do have certain members that are definitely the executive management level, but we have a lot of people that are, you know, at the small to medium business, we have people that are entrepreneurs that are doing the whole IT stack themselves. And we had IT practitioners that now had security formally thrown on their shoulders. So I wanted to have something of simple framework that I could point them to, and I could say, here's how I would bulk things into first, second, and third order events. Easy, medium, and oh my gosh, this is going to be a challenge. So I absolutely love the CIS top 20 controls, and so I built off of that simple framework. The reason why I love the CIS top 20 controls is because off of a single printout, one page, I can hand it to someone, anyone within my organization, and I can have a real detailed talk about what we are doing, why we're doing it, and where we are going in the future. So you can see these uh, nine different controls that I created for the framework that I've leveraged extensively within my greater Cincinnati area. And this is, I know there's a lot going on here. So what I'm trying to do is compare and contrast and depending on the specific spot product you pick, it might have more or less functionality, but at the top in the green, what I'm trying to express is you as the IT security practitioner, how much authority do you have over those systems? Then the gray boxes, those are the actual types of formal assets, whereas the blue bars are those nine data governance controls that I referenced. And then the stop sign indicates that it can block, the uh, triangle arrow is an alert, and the green circle is that it can generally enforce policy. And once again, I know I'm giving you a ton of information here. There's even more in the full version that's on my GitHub, but let's go through and do a mini deep dive on three of these. So let's start talking about the basic controls. And for the first basic control, I wanted to circle in on file and disk encryption and key management. Of course, whenever we're dealing with encryption, it's only as strong as we're protecting those keys. So we need to make sure that we are protecting them correctly. Working for an international organization, I have to be very careful when I am deploying cryptography that I do not violate any rules, laws, regulations, please talk to your friendly lawyers. That being said, when you go through and you implement advanced encryption such as FIPS 140, depending on your tool, you might lose some functionality. So make sure to talk to your friendly vendors and to fully understand what any implications of turning on that higher level of cryptography is so that you can go through and go into it with eyes wide open. Now, it's become very popular to go through and to encrypt portable media. And generally there's two ways that you can do it. You can either encrypt the whole piece of portable media, or you can just encrypt the files written from your managed system onto that piece of portable media. I prefer the latter, the file level of encryption, but there's good points, or good points why you might choose the full disk encryption. Either way, we need to be very careful. I have a friend who, uh, works in a similar industry within Cincinnati, and they were working on rolling out portable media encryption, and they have a lot of, uh, how should I say, drivers that go out and help people with insurance policies. And those drivers were actually leveraging legacy uh, GPS systems. And what was not caught in time is that when people went through and plug their GPS systems into their corporate laptops in order to go through and update the maps, the actual 
file disk or the full disk encryption that they were doing was encrypting the entire GPS bricking them. Luckily, uh, the mistake was caught pretty early, so the damage was less, but we need to make sure that we are open and transparent about what we are doing with our users because you do not want to be the person that accidentally encrypted you know, a family's thumb drive that was full of personal pictures. That being said, we also need to go through and to be extremely careful not to brick devices that we do not own. And finally, in the terms of file and disk encryption, you know, we need to be careful of when we encrypt files on network shares. We need to understand how key management works. You know, this is where I think Apple, Google, and Microsoft, they've done a lot of good in our community over the past 10 years in making encryption that's something approachable for every person on their new devices. But we need to make sure that we are going through and implementing it with honor and that we're doing it in an open and transparent way. So now let's move on to the foundational controls. So for this, I picked data classification. And the reason why I picked this is because an effective data classification strategy is absolutely needed for you to move further along your trail. So when it comes to data classification, there are generally two strategies. And it's not that one works better than the other. I think they work better together. And I think they break in different ways. So traditional data classification is based on a series of data objects, be it text, text dictionaries, regular expression dictionaries, pattern matching, and Boolean logic. Now, this can serve a couple different challenges. So many DLP type engines have different versions of regex, have different functionalities. So that might make it hard, difficult, or you might not be able to carry over a classification one for one between multiple systems. Another problem with it is that these, it's very easy to get around these type of data classifications uh, with a, just the most minor bit of obfuscation. And we'll touch on that in a bit. I'll show you some really cool things. Secondly, we can do meta tag data. So within many popular office type suites, there is a way that you can empower your users to go through and apply an internal data classification into the header or the meta tag area of every file. Now, this is awesome because it does a couple quick things. First off, these types of scans on files are super lightweight. The second thing is every time we ask a user to go through and to classify an item for us, a couple magical things happen. First, we're telling our users, hey, we as an organization, we value our data. We want to be good data stewards. And then generally, when you implement these, you can either hover over or, you, or there's a little like three sentence description that can help guide the user to go through and to select the correct data classification. Now, this is great. We're training, we're bringing our users in act inviting them to be part of our data stewardship. However, if I'm a bad guy, if I'm a malicious actor, you know, I'm just gonna lie and I'm going to get through it. So this is where I think that using both together is very powerful. So let's talk about a couple different challenges with data classifications. The first, we, have, we currently have, at the time of this recording, 50 states, and each state is allowed to create their driver's license in any way, shape, or form that they want. So in my driver's license regex, I have 26 positive matches, and I'm gonna show those to you. Secondly, many websites use a 15, 16 digit code to or numeric code to reference contact. What does that look like? It looks like a credit card number. Obviously, regular expressions and word dictionaries are not optimal and we need to do better. And a couple of ways where I've really upped my game in writing data classification, especially using traditional data classification, is to follow the primary rule of improv and always combine sentences with yes and. That has led me to go through and to significantly reduce the suboptimal detections. Likewise, we can use proximity rules. That's where we're looking for condition A, and condition B within so many characters of each other. So on the left, you're going to see my driver's license match. Now, this is great and all, but we were matching on things that we really shouldn't have been matching on. We are matching on our user IDs, 
our admin IDs, simple year, 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 day, or, or month, month, day, day, or day, day, month, month, year, 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 date stamps. We are matching on change tickets, problem tickets, incident tickets, uh, service desk tickets. So we had to go through and reject all of the actual regular expressions that are in that uh, grayed out box on the right. So let's move on to the organizational controls. So data loss prevention. To me, data loss prevention is actually a combination of multiple different tools that work together to go through and to apply actual data governance rules within your environment. So we've got things like the DLP client. So this sits on your laptop and applies policy to how your users are interacting with your laptop. DLP network is kind of like IDS IPS. It scans a specific network traffic, a network port, and it makes permit deny decisions there. A DLP repository scanner is a system that'll scan your unstructured data. So it could be shares, it could be databases, it could be your NAS, it could be your SAN, and it'll go through and it will report back to where it thinks there's potentially sensitive information within your environment. You've got DLP email, DLP web. So respectively, I like to scan both incoming and outgoing. I like to scan incoming because I wanna be very open and transparent with my users. And if I, even though I can't be a good data steward until I receive a piece of information, if I see information coming in a suboptimal way, I'd like to be the one to bring that to the attention of whoever's collecting that data and say, hey, I think I've got a better way for us to do that. And finally, and this is this is probably the most challenging part, in my opinion, the DLP management console. So this is the central piece of software that orchestrates your DLP environment. And if you think about it, DLP is set to catch our most sensitive information. And so what we want to do is when we do get an alert, we generally attach the primary file and we probably attach a, a bit or all of what flagged it. And we also capture the basic who, what, where, when, why. But if I've got my offensive hat on and I take a look at the services that are running, I see, oh, there's a DLP agent. You better believe that I want to go through and get access to that DLP console by hook or by crook, because I wanna see those incidents. Because if I find a file that has potentially sensitive information in a specific repository, chances are I'm going to find other sensitive information in that environment. So I know we're coming up on time here and I want to be respectful to everyone's time. So if you would like to reach out, I'd love to continue this conversation here, there, anywhere. If you do uh, run any type of IT security group and you see a talk that I would like or that you'd like me to present, please feel free to reach out. I'd love to do that. I want to thank everyone at Scythe and Grimm that have helped put this on. You have immensely helped me over the past 18 months. So thank you for this edutainment. Thank you and any questions. Zero trust, right? Zero trust architecture is, is now all the rage. And since it was, uh, it has been mandated to the federal government through the Biden executive order. Um, and to me, what makes zero trust so hard is the data. Right. It's easy to just be like, well, we're going to just have this, but actually having the data to do that. So what advice would you would you give the federal government who is in the position it has? Right. Like system sprawl, software sprawl, data sprawl, largest system in the world. What do they do, Micah? So right now, that is something that is very pertinent to my professional job and where I where we're really going through and we're focusing a lot of our efforts and it's harder than you can possibly believe. It's what I call intimacy or into me I see. You need to understand how your organization works. You need to understand your data flows. Uh, in terms of network segmentation, you know, that's only a part of it. You also have to understand how are you going to go through and quantify all of your identities and what identities do you, are you actually running? Uh, so, you know, we've got users, we probably have uh, admins, we probably have help desk, we probably have service accounts in that uh, non-human accounts that interact with computer to computer communication, getting an inventory of all that and then creating your use cases. And this is where I struggle the most is defining the actual 
identity plus the type of connection plus the uh, frequency or the normalness of the connection into an actual like low, medium, high and defining what we do at each one of those, uh, how should I say, checkpoints. To sum it up, I'm glad I don't have that job. <laughs> Nice love guru reference, by the way, Micah. Hey, good. I'm glad you got that. Of course. Uh, what about what about multi-cloud? So that's something um, that we're also going through. And for multi-cloud, you, I really focus on where am I putting my policy engines? Am I forcing everything through a centralized IT security cloud, or am and have it all be unified there, or do I have embed multiple instances of those protection engines within each cloud environment. And once again, this is going to come back to your own risk tolerance, your own policies and procedures, but I'm a big, I'm becoming more and more of a big fan of a unified security hub. A unified security hub? Correct. You mean like a Death Star? Um, <laughs> Not quite a Death Star, a protection star. It's it's one of those things where if you think about one of the talks I gave was on web application firewalls. And so if you could embed within whatever your security cloud is that all traffic passing from your trusted environment or environment going out to the internet or anything coming from any external coming into your environment has to go through, you know, a unified security fabric that has, you know, a combination of all of your web application firewalls, your dynamic firewalls, uh, your IPSs, your IDSs, your DLP, uh, your CASB, your SASE, whatever controls that you have implemented. And having that at the cloud edge, especially for cloud resources, that's kind of where my mind is right now. All right. Since we're discussing Star Wars, who shot first? Of course, Han shot first. Han shot first. Come on. Does anybody actually believe otherwise? Like, this is a serious question. Kyle Katarn believes. Well, I mean, just honestly, like, whoever shot first would win that fight at that range. It like, depends on the, the way setting. That could have shot first and missed. It depends on the setting. But we know the setting. We they were there in most Eisley. They're like right across from the table. He has the gun pulled on him. If he had shot first, he would have shot hot. I mean, I I don't think even with stormtrooper accuracy, he could have missed. I think there's wisdom in that. <laughs> I loved the uh point about Chewie needing a medal. It's true. Well you see, you see, I fixed it there. Love it. Oh, Love it. That. That's so funny. That's a nice little uh, bonus. Hold on. I got to get a picture of that. Yep. That's good. So All thank right. you very much for this opportunity. I've uh, really enjoyed it. And please feel well, free you. to uh, to anyone listening or watching, please feel free. I'd love to continue this conversation. Are you on the Discord and the expert um, channel? Yes, I am. Okay. Um, Make sure that you are tagged as a speaker. If you are not already, you are not. Let's get that. No, yeah, you are. Good. All right. So for those of you who want to ask more questions, because uh, Mike clearly has a lot more he could have presented. Uh, and Trisha, you were right. That was a very text dense slideshow. It it led with the powerful graphics and then it went right into the hardcore text. You you should yeah. see my web application firewall one. It would make uh, Trisha's uh, brain break. I did see it. I did see it, and um, yeah, it's it was so funny because when we were doing our talk together, um, it was something that we discussed multiple times, and the yeah. you know the final consensus, which I do really agree and, and respect actually a lot about Micah, is that all of his talks really are intended to to teach and learn, and having that GitHub repository in the event that you couldn't see the talk itself, like this, the PowerPoint does stand on its own, which is cool um for sure as a marketer you know it just kills me inside a little 
Not a big deal. Only a little though. <laughs> Any final thoughts, Micah, for the audience? Uh, you know what? I, anyone that is interested in presenting, I strongly suggest that you go through and pursue it. I have gotten so much back from the community ever since I started putting myself out there. I found a lot of confidence, I've created a lot of opportunities. It's opened up some great friendships, so I highly recommend it. And we have a new speaker track here to help you do it. Uh, this year we paired with uh, Share the Mic and Cyber as well. So I, I hope that we continue that partnership. Excellent, you guys have been doing absolutely wonderful work. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, sir. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. Always welcome. All Star Wars talks are always welcome. Yeah, no, that that went that went like Star Wars to like hardcore real fast. Super fast. Yeah, super fast. Um, I love it though. I love I again like analogies are super cool. I feel like people who are really good at analogies um, are awesome educators. Uh, I mean, it, doesn't that that content kind of ties into what your company does, Gardacore, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. We do a you're, lot of. You're welcome um, to. Yeah, but here's your chance. Give us give us the one minute pitch. Um. Yeah. Uh. So we we have been working a lot on on zero trust. Our company <clears throat> is a leader in in micro or software based segmentation. So we take network segmentation and deploy it software wise and um to stop lateral movement is the idea, make it more difficult to propagate. So uh, with the Biden directive, that was you know, kind of a big deal for us because when, when we talk about zero trust as an ideology, it's cool. But when you talk about it in practice, um, you know, is it going to hinder the user, right? We can't have that. We've been talking about that all day, right? And so making sure that zero trust is done in an, uh, first off, making it a reality, versus uh, an idea, ideology is super cool. So mm -hmm. it's a lot of fun. We we have a lot of fun here. So is that like a, a version of software defined networking or is it implemented mm -hmm. differently? Yep, uh, the former. Okay. I mean, you, you had to get a chance to plug it and that was the perfect opportunity. It was, no, it really was. Oh, I was sitting there and I was like, all right, don't go full marketing, Trisha, don't go full marketing here. Like this isn't, you know, whenever you brought zero trust up, I was like, I'm gonna have to say something. So I'll just, uh, instead, uh, I was gonna just like subtly, like take a really long drink and like sit it like this, you know? I, I love the irony of uh, you in the full unicorn regalia, bright yes. pink hair going, don't go full marketing. Don't go full marketing. Well, to be fair, though, my um my logo's purple. So if the lo if my hair was like purple, that would be a little bit more full marketing. Okay. You know, maybe I don't know. <laughs> you don't look like one of the quiet types. I think that's part of the point. Oh no, I'm super quiet for sure. Um if you couldn't tell. So are you. I'm just as quiet as you are. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, like I said, I'm glad that you were you were louder than me on our, our earlier singing. I did get some reviews and they were like, yeah, it was it was bad, but it was funny. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's so funny. Well, to be fair, it was it was all the technical difficulties. We would have been 100 percent in sync if I had, you know, not tested in production. So that's how it goes. Well, maybe maybe we'll uh, record it for for the group in the future. We'll have to. Well, yeah, we'll have to reprise that for sure. Um, it's uh, oh, that's all right, Kenny. That's all right. I see you in the chat. Pink <laughs> hair team for the saying? win. Oh, pink hair Tim. Yeah, and yep. Kenny and his pink hair are going to be on at 7 p.m. on Unicorn Chef making Asian wedding soup. I was just putting together my meatballs for the soup got them in the fridge so they're chilling because there's no binding in it so looking Oof. forward to that later yum that's gonna be super super yummy yeah would so you that's ever dye your things... hair vivid would i ever dye my hair what vivid like the non-traditional hair colors 
Um, I've thought about that. So I certainly don't have an issue with being ridiculous. And I am endlessly amused at how many serious military or government uh, events that I speak at and I dress up as the unicorn and it, there's kind of the look from people who don't know the joke or don't get it. They're like, who the fuck is this guy? And uh -huh. then, yeah. of course, I know what I'm talking about. So they, they, they accept it. But uh, there's always that hesitation. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I could get away with it right now going professionally vivid. Mm, okay. All right. So. It is a big jump. It is a big jump. It's a big statement, like, all the time. Whereas the unicorn hoodie can come off, like the vivid hair is a big statement, 100% of the yeah. time. Yeah. Yes, I, I have to have the flexibility to to look professional and then also don the don don the silliness. I guess is yeah. the way to put it. It's 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 definitely uh, it's definitely you know more accepted in my profession. I would say <laughs> for sure. <laughs> you know. If, if I do make the jump, you and Kenny will be the first that I consult because I don't even know what I'm doing. Yeah, it's a lot of maintenance, honestly. That's the one thing that like anybody that's like, oh, I'm just thinking about dyeing my hair, you know, purple or green or whatever. I'm like, okay, like be prepared to have a lot of work because it is a lot of upkeep. Well, that's if because of the right roots, way. right? Like the second the roots show up, it ruins the whole effect. Mm -hmm. Well, so there... Well, there's the roots, then there's like deciding if you're actually going to bleach it or not, then making sure that you're washing your hair properly and making sure that like you don't dye your sheets and towels and everything, you know, I mean, and, and bathtub, I mean, it will bleed everywhere. So it's, it's a lot of, there's a lot of like soft costs as it were <laughs> that come along with it too. And it fades quick. Yeah. Yep. There, yeah. There's, there's a, a there's a lot of conversation I've catched up on here. Um, he got so you, you you actually consulted with Kenny for there. Yep. Um. On Twitter. Yes. Uh, oh, that's there's, funny. Yeah. Mhm. Mm um, you know, every like, uh, there's a bunch of different like shades and stuff, and you have to kind of decide what you want. I prefer the super super bright vivids because then as they fade, it goes into more of the pastels. The pastels don't stay very long. So you kind of get like multiple looks out of it, which is cool. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, manic panic for the win. How long have you been doing it? Uh, 2019, October of 2019. It's almost two years. Almost two years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, my hair is naturally very light though. There's a good comment in there about like, having it really dark. Like my hair, my hair takes like 15, 20 minutes to bleach. So it's not that bad. Speaking of somebody else with fabulous hair. Yes. Oh my goodness. It's flawless. Uh, we can't hear you, Keenan. Can't hear you. Yeah, I'm totally talking on mute. Oh, I said your hair is far more um, colorful and I love it. <laughs> How are you doing today, Keenan? I'm lovely. How are you today? Your day is a holiday. It it really is. It is. I uh, it looks very light where you are. Are you not experiencing the doom and gloom? That that's. Uh, it's getting darker outside. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess that there's a storm coming our way. Is that the what's happening? Yeah, it's uh, it's just quite past us now. But yeah, it's going to be dark and stormy all that fun Ooh, well so fun. Spe speaking of day your the title of your talk is groundhog's day it is and you're gonna really love this there's so much data that i actually made this part one of groundhog day there's gonna be more i can't wait Ooh. it's gonna be pretty happy just be the same data over and over i was again. gonna say is it gonna be the same talk I mean, that would be a good idea, and I might do that just for fun anyway, but no. <laughs> Building blocks. So your talk also ties into the ITSP Magazine podcast you recently launched. 
It does indeed. The National Blast, we're going to talk about that in some kind of detail, um, specifically as we start thinking about, you know, um, critical infrastructure and critical infrastructure protection. I myself um, really love all of the things that DHS has done in the last 15 to 20 years since they've been stood up and all of the you know ways that they've been trying to protect critical infrastructure perhaps without the best of budgets and without the best of maybe um, execution authority and legislation and I hope to continue to take on that topic in my podcast. We'll see. Super exciting. Yay. And we've got Nicole launching her podcast in the fall. Podcast yeah. Palooza coming. All so the many good content. So much good content coming out. Wait, Trisha, just... when are you launching a podcast? Please. Um, I have so many projects I've started and won't continue that I can't add that one to another one. Um, <laughs> I am like in, like enamored with the art behind you. By the way, Keenan, like I'm not. <laughs> yes. yes. Love it. Love Favorite. it so much. Well, it's not my favorite, but it's definitely one of my favorites. In fact, um, the person who made it for me, uh, the the, I think it was a the a photograph of um, something with the Suchi and Joel podcast that we did not too long ago, and we took a photo, and um, the artist reached out and he was like, it made me so proud to see my artwork on the wall. And oh, well, <laughs> I liked it. That's incredible. Yeah, love it. Love it. It's always fun seeing everybody's like backgrounds, like what they're, you know, you can tell like the people who do it this all the time, like they've got like this like awesome setup and I don't know, super cool. It's really fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't know about the awesome setup. This is just like how I, you know, keep myself sane most of the time, but I have I seen that. people really remarkable setups right you know like the the green screen behind them so that they can have all of the digital media and just it's a lot of work it is a lot of work it is a lot of work uh, you know Alyssa Miller Miller earlier oh yeah <laughs> she's amazing oh yeah for sure so Keenan what's the story behind that uh, picture behind that picture Mm -hmm. So when I was um, in the Army, I was going through EOD school, which is Explosive Ordnance Disposal School, and um, I was married, and my first husband, Steve, who's um, really just a great guy and also kind of wanted to be an artist for a little bit before he changed his mind and wanted to be a police officer, and then I think he might have changed his mind again and wanted to be a lawyer, but, you know, we are all trying to figure that out. As I was going through EOD school, um, you know, he was he was working a, a couple of different things. And as we got closer and closer towards graduation, I always had a little bit of a fascination with the, the original painting, which is the man and businessman in a bowler hat. And so he replaced the apple, he made his own and uh, replaced it with a bomb with a very nice long fuse. And it, uh, it just reminds me of a time where I definitely was going through some adversity and trying to get through EOD school and do all the things that I wanted to do in the world. And yet there were wonderful people around me who were there to support me and there to help me and there to make sure that I was the best badass that I could be. So that's the story. That's beautiful. Love that. It <laughs> was so great. Also on podcasts, we have to give the shout out to Micah Brown for the Threat Real podcast. Yep. So a podcast that has already already been in existence. You get a podcast. I how many of our you speakers podcast. have podcasts? I think all I of them. We should just have a podcast con. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I think well, that's in a way, what... that's kind of what this is. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> Just, you know, with a, a PowerPoint, which is optional. Is it optional? I wish I would have known that earlier. Man, it made my life easier. That's okay. That, that's part one. Nobody made you do anything, Keenan. No one ever does. <laughs> I do feel really left out of the loop here. Like, I don't, I'm trying to find something pointy I can put on my head. It's me. Feel like doing the unicorn thing here. It's not Perfect. Work. Perfect. Wait, it's not. It's not going to work. Hold on. Uh, do you want me to get a picture of that? No, no. it's the last slide. <laughs> oh, okay. 
Uh, you want to bring up your uh, slides if you do have them, which it sounds I, like you worked so tirelessly on. I do. They're, they're super fancy slides. Um, and uh, yeah, they're going to be great. Part one, though, again, part one, digging into some serious stuff here. Okay, so can you see yourselves or can you see my slides? We can, can you see, see your slides. Awesome. Well, I am ready when you guys are. And we are ready because you are. Awesome. Well, hey, everybody. <laughs> uh, no intros or anything. I just get to start talking. This is really, this is kind of fun. So, so no shit, there I was in the third grade, pushed my sister Edie down the stairs. Oh, wait, that, that's the wrong thing. Hi, Keaton Skelly. I am uh, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about living with some very interesting legislation and challenges that the Department of Homeland Security and CISA and others have, you know, really faced over the last 15 years as we've been trying to crack the nut of, you know, critical infrastructure security. So the talk is called Groundhog Day, living with bad legislation for critical infrastructure over and over and over and over again. Um, uh, who am I? I'm an interesting individual that had, um, you know, the, the great fortune a long time ago to work for the Department of Homeland Security uh, in the early days and really get to see some of that critical infrastructure being played out and that how we were trying to protect it at the time. But today, um, I'm the CEO of a company called Shadow Bytes, uh, an advisor for a couple of different things, um, master of games at Women's Cyber Society, Cyber Jutsu, because I really love um, anything that's gamified. Uh, a host for a podcast that we're going to talk about actually a little bit more uh, as we continue on through this afternoon because it's going to be very pertinent if you want to know all the other things that come after part one of this talk and a bunch of other you know stuff which is great and you can reach me at any time at twitter um at keenan skelly or for the podcast at blast national so let's get into some fun stuff in overview you know um I talk a little bit about the fact that critical infrastructure from the very beginning has been something that's very complicated in terms of trying to legislate, in terms of trying to wrap our minds around how we could possibly even begin to protect all of these things. When you start tearing apart all of the pieces that include critical infrastructure, it's everything. It's everything around us. It's our water, it's our energy, it's our nuclear power plants, it's how transportation gets a train full of something to, you know, the port of New Orleans and ships that around the world. And, and, and these are the very things that make our global economy work. They're very, very complicated and very important. Within DHS alone, when we're talking about critical infrastructure, you know, we're talking about 16 different sectors, and each of these sectors is owned by private owners and operators. These aren't government folks. These aren't necessarily, um, you know, DOD folks, although in some cases DOD does have some of the assets. So as DHS has grown over the last, you know, number of years and started to really address critical infrastructure, these are the kinds of things that they have to really consider when it comes to how do we protect the nation's critical infrastructure and key resources, and how do we start applying cybersecurity to each of them, knowing that that, that kind of is a, the basis or at least a foundational element of each. So, as I said before, I'm gonna break this down into a couple of different parts. So today you're gonna to be very lucky enough to see part number one. And I wanted to go back in time a little bit and talk about how we got from, you know, DHS started here and then here we are right now and we're, we're doing all of this great cybersecurity stuff and we're really getting engagement from owners and operators and everybody's really interested because of all of the threats that we've experienced. But what, what were all the things that happened on the way to that? So that's something we're gonna talk about a little bit more. Now, I, I'm gonna go way back to the beginning. So where, where did it all start? Um, the Department of Homeland Security created in 2002 as a direct result of a lot of the things that happened during 9-11. 
um, I myself was still in the military during 9-11 and experienced kind of the national response plan of our country played out at the highest levels possible. And when DHS was created, I was really inspired to be a part of that agency because there were so many things that we just hadn't really worked through in terms of national response plan that didn't include the Department of Defense, right? That did not include all of the other things that that had to happen to respond to something that was so, um, you know, massive and so pervasive as 9-11. So as DHS came out, I myself uh, really, really wanted to go work there. And I thought it was the coolest thing ever. I still love the entire idea and I love Homeland Security. But if you think about this from a, a more broad perspective, imagine anybody, anybody here who's actually worked for the government ever <laughs> for more than five minutes. <laughs> imagine that you're going to take 22 agencies from around the country who all have their own, you know, executive orders that are ruling them, their own legislative bodies that are telling them what they can and can't do, their own regulations, their own business processes, and you're going to bring all 22 of them together and say, we need you to get on a common operating picture, even though the authorities that you may have had may not be relevant anymore, even though the policies that you know created you may not be relevant anymore. So, we have to start thinking about, before we even get to where we are today with DHS, you have to remember what DHS was built on. It was built on a conglomeration of agencies who all had something to offer to protect the homeland, but, but that by no means, uh, you know, means that it was a perfectly smooth transition, right? Now, I'm going to do something really, really uncool. I'm going to escape and make sure that I turn Microsoft Outlook off because I don't want you guys to be tortured with that for the rest of the time we're on the talk here. So, you know, what happens next? We have Homeland Security. We've got all of these agencies coming together and saying, we have a tough job of, ahead of us. We need to figure out how we can protect all of the things that are important to our country. So, a little bit later, I think it was one year later, almost exactly, um, critical infrastructure came out and people said, you know, I, I, I think we should probably be paying attention to these things, right? The uh, nuclear power plants, the water treatment centers, um, you know, manufacturing, um, transportation, all of these things. I think transportation was probably the most visible and everybody had eyes on it because of 9-11 and because transportation security was crucial and something that, you know, we cared about as Americans. So the Homeland Security Presidential Directive 7 came out and said, you know what, we need to be able to identify, prioritize, and protect critical infrastructure and key resources within this country. And part of that means we actually have to figure out what that is, right? What, what does that even entail? Is that the mom and pop store down the street? Is it all of the transportation, all of the train lines that run across the entire country? Is it maybe something as, you know, complicated as chemical facilities who actually, you know, make chemicals that people can make bombs out of. If you start really thinking about critical infrastructure and what it is, the very basis of our economy and who we are, then you start to realize how scary it is when people want to attack it or want to do bad things against it. So not just identifying what those things are, but prioritizing them. You know, at the time, um, Homeland Security was very small, still as an agency with not a, a ginormous budget and trying to identify which ones of those things we could possibly go out and protect is not an easy task. Uh, lots of lots of algorithms and fighting and, and um, gosh, I remember Pat Burt and I, I'm not sure anybody here will actually remember her, but kudos to Pat Burt for um, being an evil genius way beyond her time. But then we had to figure out how to protect them, right? Because it's important and it's part of our country and who we are as Americans, right? So no pressure, by the way, DHS, hey, protect everything. <laughs> um, all of the things, really, seriously, everything. We want you to make sure that you're protecting healthcare. We want to make sure you're protecting communications. We want to make sure that the dams and the water systems that, you know, take water to 
billions, I'm sorry, millions of people um, on the West Coast, that, that those things are never affected. We want to make sure that as Americans, we are doing everything that we can to protect these key things that, you know, help us thrive as a country and help us move forward. So 16 critical infrastructure sectors were outlined and DHS worked together with um, a lot of different agencies to determine sector specific agencies. And uh, I'll, I'll let Bryson correct me because I'm talking about in the old school days, but I believe they have a new name now. But those sector specific agencies were really designed to say, you have the responsibility to ensure personnel, physical and information security of these things, right? We're not going to give you any budget for that. <laughs> we're not going to we're not going to give you any kind of regulation for that, but through industry partnerships, through working together, this is your your task to go out and figure out how we can make critical infrastructure safer so that we can make America safer, right? So, you know, I know my experience with DHS, but I also, I talked to a lot of people over the last couple of days about, you know, critical infrastructure and in, in the olden days and the difference between information security and cybersecurity as we really see it today. And for everybody who, you know, has been in this field for a hot minute, uh, information security and cybersecurity are the same thing to us. We just, you know, change the way that we look at it and change the way that we deal with it. But right away within the Department of Homeland Security, it was recognized that information security and cybersecurity were extremely important when it came to critical infrastructure. So, you know, wait, what is this, what is this cyber thing? Maybe we should get a little bit more involved in it and try to figure out what we can do to help, right? So in 2013, um, under the Obama administration, an executive order 136, Three six improving critical infrastructure cybersecurity came out, and I I always feel like um, you know this was almost like the cart before the horse kind of thing. You know, we decided we figured out very early, in in you know general terms, that it was actually very important that cybersecurity is established as an underlying dependency for everything that we do. There is not a single one of the sixteen you know uh, critical infrastructure sectors that doesn't rely almost entirely on information security and cyber. So how do we look at this as something different, as something bigger, but something that's interconnected to really everything that's happening? And I think this was a very key piece of legislation, or I'm sorry, executive order that came out that really put into focus the importance of cyber among other things. But even at this point, you know, it's 2013, there's lots of cyber uh, breaches that are happening, lots of cyber attacks that are happening, but there's still nobody really responsible for doing a whole lot about this, right? Lots of different agencies, again, came together to create DHS, and some of them have really great authority. Take the Secret Service, um, for example, when it comes to uh, the Treasury and um, you know financial transactions. I mean, the skill that they had there was, was unmatched when they came into DHS. When you add other you know, individuals, you add the EISAC, you add um, the grid, uh, the nuclear facilities in this country, everybody had been working really hard and, and doing the things that they did best. But the one thing at the, the underpinning of each of these sectors is cybersecurity. And how are we going to address that as a nation? So when do we get our own agency to just, you know, do this, <laughs> right? Um, 2018. So in my mind, I go back in time and I look at, you know, 2002 when DHS was first stood up and, and all the difficulties that they had just to bring, you know, 22 agencies together and try to make that into something that worked and something that was not perfect, but was functional in protecting our nation. And then a year later, recognizing that critical infrastructure is the underpinning, the, the the piece that connects everything together, all of those other things, and recognizing that that critical infrastructure has to be protected in a variety of ways. And over these years from 2002, 
it took us until 2018 to get to the point where you know the CISA Act passed and we were able to have an organization that is focused entirely on this. And I, I really love that the, this quote here that um, you know Chris Krebs said uh, after it was passed uh, through through Congress. And you know, passing this represents real progress in the national effort to improve our collective efforts in cybersecurity. This is such a big deal, you know, being able to recognize at, at this level of any kind of department that this is so crucial that it is actually going to change the way that we function as a government and in our private partner, you know, relationships and, and everything that we're going to do going forward. So. It took a hot minute, right, for us to get there. <laughs> it took a hot minute to get from 2002 um, all the way to 2018, where you know CISA was stood up and it had the ability to start looking at you know government things and looking at ways to engage the the private sector and the public sector and the states and figure out what we could all do together. How can we all work together to make this mission actually you know make sense? But like the agency had always had issues with, and I don't mean this, you know, to be specific to DHS either. I mean, this I would probably say is any massive agency within the United States government is it's not always clear the things that are absolutely needed until it's absolutely clear. So some of the challenges that they faced were operating budget. You know, if you go back and you look at the last two to three years of operating budget for CISA, it's 2% or less than 2% of the entire operating budget for the Department of Homeland Security. So I, I just, I, that really makes me think, and I kind of stick on that, you know, we, we decided in 2013 that cybersecurity was so crucial to critical infrastructure that an entire executive order was dedicated to it. But when it came to actually funding the arm of the Department of Homeland Security that had the ability to do something about that, that funding just, you know, wasn't there as much as maybe it should have been. And then there's always the question of to regulate or not to regulate. And I, I go back and forth with some of my friends in the space on this. You know, it's always, it's always wonderful if you can have a carrot to offer to an owner operator, to somebody who has a very you know, restricted um, way that they can charge people. They have a very restricted way that they can you know, hire people. They have this, this budget that they're operating in and cybersecurity is so far outside of that budget that, that they can't even look at it. So you know, in the history of DHS, they've gone kind of back and forth on you know, what a regulatory body might look like and what it might not look like and and how that works for owners and operators and it's never an easy an easy choice it's never it's never easy to figure out what is better whether that's the carrot or the stick in some cases it definitely has to be the stick right there has to be some kind of regulation with teeth otherwise there's no way that a company can justify spending the money to do the kinds of things that they need to you know beef up security and in the past, we'd had programs that were tied to grant programs, but those weren't really dedicated to helping the owner operator themselves get past the challenges that they face when it comes to cybersecurity. And that's, that's kind of heartbreaking. We've been able to provide grant funding to people who might respond to an incident at those owners and operators, at those pieces of critical infrastructure around the country, but we haven't been able to really impact people that work there and how they can get access to things. Um, I believe I, I had a conversation not that long ago about some of the things that CISA has been doing just to get materials out there so that people can read them and have access to them and start, you know, dealing with what they have to do to make their, you know, a chemical plant or water treatment facility a little bit more secure. But if you are working in that facility and you're already having a hard time being able to, you know, pay everybody to just do the jobs that they're doing, how easy is it for them to spend additional time to try to learn about these types of things? And this, I'm not 
please don't take, I'm not sharpshooting. I'm just saying these are some of the challenges that you have to think about as we, we talk about the history of how we've gotten to where we are now and, and, and why the legislation and the things that are coming out of the next couple, you know, um, bills and the executive order are so important because these are real challenges that have been faced and that will continue to be faced. The authority to execute, you know, when you, um, as a government agency, you, you know, you put your budget forward and um, as a new agency within a much larger agency that's also still trying to figure out what agency it is because it's still 22 other agencies, getting budget is a difficult thing to do. How, how do you justify that the budget for cybersecurity is more important than the budget for keeping, you know, nuclear power plants safe or or LNG and LPG and all of these other things that are equally critical in America, that are critical infrastructure for us. How do you do that? How do you fight with the people in your own organization to say this is the most important thing? There's, there's no easy answer to that. Other challenges, consistent political support. And I think, you know, anybody who's worked in government is going to say, well, that's not just DHS, that's every organization. And you're absolutely right. And there comes a time in government specifically where we have to acknowledge the fact that some things are not political. Cybersecurity is not political. It has nothing to do with, you know, your political beliefs, and it has everything to do with simply protecting our nation to the best of our ability. And kudos, all the kudos to Mr. Krebs for, you know, calling that out and having that intestinal fortitude to say it's not about right side or left side, that it's entirely about doing the right thing. Struggles to coordinate across agencies, you know, with 16 sectors and each of those sectors having a different agency that is, you know, designed to help it uh, regulate itself, that is designed to help it teach itself about all of these things that it's designed to get them all the information that they need to do. Um, it's still it's still a process, right? I know uh, a lot of people here may or may not have participated in my, my favorite thing, the interagency working group. Um, and wow, <laughs> just wow, that, that's a whole different beast right there, right? Um, you know, when you're working across multiple multiple agencies and not just at a government level but at the state and local level looking at tribal level trying to communicate with people and make sure that everybody's needs are met in a world where there isn't enough funding in a world where there isn't necessarily an understanding from the 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 you know the state and the local and the the tribal folks about what it is they're supposed to be doing and there isn't necessarily time on anybody's part to make sure that all of these agencies are doing everything that they can to work together and then of course the the, the other challenge here is how do you get that that business? How do you get that oil refinery? How do you get that um, nuclear power plant? How do you get that water treatment facility that um, that only has two people that work there total at all? How do you get them to buy into something that says, we want you to do this and you have to do this because it's important for everyone, but we don't have anything to give you? And we don't have any way to train you and we don't have any way to ensure that you have everything that you need these are not easy challenges to overcome and i uh, having been at dhs and and working through some of these problems myself i can only empathize with uh with cisa and with dhs and know that they have been really truly doing that the best that they can so what next? What happens as we go forward? You know, I, I, as I started putting this talk together, I talked a lot about, you know, the Groundhog Day and how we keep seeing the same things happen over and over again. And people just talk about, well, we have to share information, right? Well, we just, if we shared information, everything will be okay. Well, I mean, sharing information is extremely important. Yes. But it's more than that. It's the buy-in of the American people. It's the buy-in of everyone in this country to say that this is important enough for us to make massive changes here. And I think we're getting to that point. So what's different right now? What's different today that, that wasn't there for the last 15 years? Well, 
We've got cyber at the White House. We have people who are just dedicated to cyber at the White House, talking to the president, talking to the National Security Council, talking to all of these people about how important and pervasive cybersecurity is. We have a president who is going head first into executive orders, into legislation, into things that are gonna make a change in how we perceive our security, especially our cybersecurity, our information security. We continue to see nation states and uh, cyber criminals, you know, up in their game. We're starting to see more and more ransomware attacks. We're starting to see an underground of cyber criminals and nation states working together to, to really change the way that cyber crime is being done. International tensions are here. It, it is time. It's time. I read just the other day um, this, you know, this article and um, this quote right here, I think it, it, it hits right into the fundamental part of everything that, that I've been kind of talking about up until this point. And that is, you know, everybody right now wants to boost CISA because all of these attacks that we've seen, solar winds, Colonial Pipeline, Microsoft Exchange, Cyber Hijack, all of these things continue to build up and they're not the first, right? It's just it's just the latest in a string of things that we we have to take care of and that we have to look at more closely. So again, as I started getting into this talk, and uh, I really decided that I had to break it down into two things. I think, and I truly believe this with all my heart, that without understanding the history of how we we got to this point and why we're here, you can't really start to make changes for the future. So. The path of DHS, the path of CISA, the path of critical infrastructure and critical infrastructure security in this country has not been an easy one, and it's one that's being written every single day. And when you think about the sheer capabilities um, that have to be thrown at that, that beast just to make sure that we're doing the right thing, it's a lot, and it's a lot to think about. So for right now, this is my high-level overview of what um, what I hope is going to be about two more uh, two more kind of series here that we can talk about and that I plan to talk about on my podcast, The National Blast. And the next one is really to get into all the bills that are on the floor right now that are responding to the executive order, that are responding to things like the colonial hack and others, and make sure that we're making legislation that makes sense, that we're continuing to build on a foundation of, hey, we tried this before and maybe it worked and maybe it didn't a foundation of bringing the right people from the community, from the private sector, from the states, from the military, from all over the world to help understand what these laws look like and what their second and third order effects are going to be. It's all about digging in to what we have ahead of us right now. We have the ability in this community, in this community right here, we have the ability right now to shape the future of cybersecurity and to shape the protection of critical infrastructure in our country. And so I challenge each of you to learn more about it, learn more about where we came from here and learn more about what we can do to make a difference in the next couple of months, because that's what it is. That's where we're at. So let's do it. Make it better. That's all I have. I think um, probably turn it back over to Bryson and at least for questions. So what, what's gonna be in part two? <laughs> what's not gonna be in part two? So part two is actually gonna dig into every single one of the bills that's on the floor right now and cross-reference them from bills and laws that already exist that cover that or that don't cover that. Part two is gonna focus more on why don't we take some of the language out of a couple of these bills and focus them into one that actually makes sense for all of critical infrastructure security and not individual slices that might, you know, make sense for one senator state or for one person's, you know, specific, I hate to say lobby group, but lobby group. This is a whole of nation picture and we, we have to start getting better at understanding the whole of nation laws that we have in place already that have executions that, uh, I'm sorry, that have 
teeth that can be executed on, but then also understanding what we don't need right now, which is more legislation that has no teeth, that has no chance of actually changing anything. So that's part two. So we got Chris Inglis in the White House. Jen Easterly has finally just been confirmed as the next CISA director. I know. We're there. We're there. We have the right people at the right place at the right time, and the right things are happening. And we have to, as a community, we have to step up and we have to make sure that we get it right this time, right? Because it's time. It's time right now. Right and now. I, right now. <laughs> I, I put it in the I put it in the chat and in the Discord. The SSAs are now SRMA, Sector Risk Management Agencies. That's the new the new title. The new buzzword. Yes, I didn't get the part, yes. that far in my history, but <laughs> I still say SSA because it's easier to be honest. Yeah, I know, and it's what I know. So, but yeah, if anybody has questions about this or how you can help, um, we are working to put together um, some cybersecurity folks, um, not just you know policy people or policy wonks, but hackers and CEOs and everyday operators who are doing you know all of these things so that we can help inform legislation that makes sense, not just legislation that makes sense for companies, but that makes sense for those of us who are doing the work too. And on that note, <laughs> love it. So where where is part two going to debut? I haven't decided yet. I'm thinking probably Black Hat. That's what I'm thinking. Ooh. Black Hat, that's a year away. Yes, I'm thinking Black Hat, and I have um, I have some people that I'm trying to uh, bring in to have that conversation with at the legislative level who might be able to provide some insight on the kinds of bills that they're working on and the kind of information that they need from the community that might help with that. That's super interesting. <laughs> be an awesome talk. Right? Awesome talk. <laughs> yeah. I'm wondering who these people are now. Yeah, I know. You're just going to have to wait. So we part two is a year out is what we're hearing. No, no, a year. What do you mean a year? No, like Black weeks. Hat, you, oh, you're you're presenting this at Black, Black Hat. Hat? Oh, oh, okay. Cool. <laughs> so it would it would already be up on the site then. Oh no no no! I I apologize, Black Hat. Please don't sue me. I this is not happening at during Black Hat. This is a conversation that's going to be going on virtually, not not affiliated officially with Black Hat, even though Black Hat, oh. I, love, I would love to do that, but that's not what this is. Got oh, it. Okay. Where can we yeah, get more information? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to talk is a little a mystery? bit. Do we have to like have a password to knock on a door? Yeah, you do. No, I'm actually going to talk about it on one of the upcoming episodes of um, the National Blast, which is going to be out here in the next week or so. And there's going to be information. The National Blast uh, is about to have its own website. It's been a hot minute, but <laughs> that's going to be up. And we're going to talk about some of the things that we're doing at Black Hat and who we're going to be talking to and what we're going to try to do with that. All right. Good time. Cool. Yeah. Ow. Super cool. So questions, anything? Are people like asking questions? Uh, no, uh, <laughs> but we did have some comparisons to, um, uh, cause uh, Johnny's from Brazil. So he was uh, commenting on how different it was to, to hear the insights here versus what he expected. Um, and the difference between state and federal government. Um, and noting the, usage of cyber criminals instead of hackers, which was lovely to see. It's very lovely to see. Definitely. And that's a whole other soapbox that I can get on in terms of legislation. Um, you can check out my podcast. I've already had at least three episodes dedicated to that and, and how we need to do better for our, our um, non-cyber criminals, our hackers who are out there every day, you know, finding great information and reporting it, and then maybe not being taken care of as well as they should be. 
Yep. Legislation, media representation, the whole nine. Just need to kind of all of overhaul it. that. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. Especially, you know, um, one of the things that I'm watching very closely is this whole uh, breach verification piece that uh, Senator Warner and some others are working on. And I think that when it comes to defending the um, hacker, the security researcher, the individuals who are out there doing that, I think breach verification is exactly where that conversation needs to happen, since these are the people who are bringing the breach forward. And they're also the people who are most likely to get, you know, kind of screwed by the companies who simply don't want to admit it right? They don't want to admit that they've had a breach. They don't want people to know that that's happened. So they're going to do pretty much anything that they can to make it go away. So I think that that's where we need to start having these conversations. Yeah, absolutely. Protect the researchers. Definitely. That's part of what we're trying to do at the ICS Village. Really? What is this ICS Village? Tell me more. Yes, would love to love to get y'all's participation. Absolutely. All right, now I'm gonna go um, to Amazon and buy you know a unicorn hoodie because I really feel like like I just failed this this particular part of the the talk today. But <laughs> well, you, you should have a a Scythe swag gift card um, already in your email somewhere. Um, so look for that. Um, so you can buy something off the the swag store there, which is of course all unicorn themed, with the uh, proceeds going to the chubby unicorns. Uh, uh, and then uh, you'll get a, a grim uh, uh, swag bag as well. Okay, is one of the options a hoodie with the the unicorn on it? I mean, because if it's not, that's just your. Okay. Nope, those are my special hoodies. Uh, those are not available on the swag store. I'm sorry. That's unfortunate. Okay, it's all right. I'll be okay without one. <laughs> I believe in you. I believe you can find one. I believe so too. I'm also a crafty bish, so I think I can make one. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yeah, a friend of mine uh, made me one that was 3D printed and it was magnetic so I could actually take them on and off the horns and stuff and switch them out. They had LEDs in there too. It was like really cool. That's pretty cool. If they're magnetic, maybe, you know, depending on your headphones, you can get them to. Yeah. To yeah. Brilliant. All these ideas coming out right now. Exactly. I'm, <laughs> I'm loving the chat right now. It's great. <laughs> Hashtag shameless plug. I'm bummed. I can't, I can't actually even see, I can't see the chat. Where's the chat? You, it's a discord. You have to join our discord server. Oh, I am in discord. Okay. Well, you are welcome to, to hop over there and say hello to folks in the channel. I will be happy to do that. Uh, we can, yeah, you don't want to, here, I'm going to cut off your share so that you don't have that. Uh, Perfect. Here we go. All right. Boom. Uh, there we go. All right. Well, Keenan, thank you very much for Groundhog Day. We look forward to Groundhog Day part two sometime in the next few weeks. Excellent. Thank you guys for having me on. Hopefully you enjoyed it. If not, that's okay too. We can talk more about it in Black Hat. It was super great. Thank you. All right. Bye guys. Bye. All right, Trisha. Are we going to be able to pull this off? I don't know if we can. I don't know if we can, if we can't get the, cause this one needs the timing of the music. There's yeah, it no does. I'm, I'm, I'm a little, I, I was just, I was just, I just had pulled up the lyrics. Yeah, no, I mean, I wrote them. I know how, just how close it is. It's, ex, it's challenge. I don't know if we want to, I don't know if we want to debut this like this. Yeah. You don't want to butcher it this way. All right. All right. Well, let's, let's put a pin in this one. So okay. we lied to everybody. We're, we're, we're we sorry. Did. So does not get to go on. Well, the show is going to go on because we have the the final keynote panel coming up with me, yes. Tim Dean, Chris Trunser, and Matt Toussaint. However, you're going to have to wait for Trisha and I to. And that's if Trisha, if this the offer still stands for me to butcher it with you. Um, we'll we'll record um, our rap song. 100%. Yeah, we can record it. We can put it out. The whole we can have a launch party. We can do the whole thing. Sounds good. Coming to a CD store near you.
<laughs> Could you imagine actually doing a whole album of like cybersecurity parodies? Like, I actually think that'd be kind of cool. I actually can see doing a whole album of that. I mean, in a way that's, I mean, dual core isn't really um, parody, but I mean, it's all cyber themed music. Fair, fair. That is true. I, I don't know. I love parody. What's your favorite kind of music? My favorite kind of music? Mm -hmm. um, I like rock. Okay. Could you give me some band <laughs> like that's, that's really, I mean, anything <laughs> from classic rock, like, you know, quintessential. I grew up on Rolling Stones. Um, okay. My dad had cassette tapes uh, that he recorded from the radio of the Stones, so I used to listen to them a ton. Um, uh, I mean, I guess like my, my coming of age into music was the, the early 90s. So Nirvana, Green Day, Metallica, Megadeth, uh, Tool, Sepultura. Um, these days, the, I think the band, I'm the two bands I'm the most impressed with, like to modern, um, would be uh, Royal Blood, because just the sound that those two guys can put out, as, and it's only two of them, I mm. think it's just incredible. Okay. And then uh, I'll have to look them the up. Rain Queens of the Stone Age. Okay. These are new to me. So I'm writing them down. Okay. Great. Always loving new music. It's great. Super exciting. So I think um, that was the last concert I was at was the both of those bands happened to be together, which is a total coincidence. Oh, really? How yeah. funny. How funny. That is so awesome. Um, love that. Love that. Oh my you? gosh, the last concert, the last concert that I went to was Alfie Bo. Of course it was Alfie Bo. It's always Alfie. Um, I, I, I listened to everything. Uh, uh, he is my all-time favorite singer. I'm an admin on his fan group. It's, it's next level stuff. Um, he's uh, an English tenor. So made most famous uh, from his performance as Jean Valjean in the 25th anniversary concert of Les Mis. Um, <laughs> absolutely incredible singer. Love him. I'm, I'm laughing. So I grew up on Les Mis too um, in the, uh, was that the mid eighties um, when I lived in Germany uh, and we used to drive everywhere and we would have the Les Mis cassette tape in the car and, me and my brother would sing along to Les Mis. So that, yeah, that so was my childhood too. Like the original one with like, yeah. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah. Oh man. Um, I can't believe I'm blanking on his name right now. But the original Jean Valjean, there is this unbelievable um, quartet that was done at the 25th anniversary. And it was the original JVJ, um, John Owen Jones, uh, and another, I don't know, I didn't even, I didn't recognize the other guy. I think he was from the 10th anniversary and then Alfie and they did a quartet of bring him home. And it is unbelievable. It's like Colm Wilkinson, my goodness. Wow. I should turn in my theater card for not knowing that Colm Wilkinson. Um, and he could still, I mean, 25 years later could still sing, bring him home. Just like he did in the like original soundtrack. It's unbelievable. Amazing. Um, yeah, that's so funny. Did you see the movie? What'd you think? Uh, I think you did. Yes. Um, so there was the, uh, there were two that came out, right? Because they did a musical and then they did the one like 20 years yes. ago, which was yep. not musical. Um, I can't remember the musical one off the top of my head, but I do remember um, the non-musical one. Oh, really? Okay. Mine I'm would pretty be sure good. I've seen the musical one. I just don't, I can't like, I don't particularly remember the qualities of it. And if I'm no. being spicy here, so something that I think one of the musicals that everybody likes that I don't is I don't really care for Phantom of the Opera. I think Phantom That's of the fair. Opera is a great technical production, but the the actual music itself is like, mm, Interesting. It's like, is it's it okay. Like lyrically or or like actual music wise? Yeah, just the quality of the music. I don't. I just, I think it's average. It's kind of like, okay. I mean, I don't know why this has gotten as much attention as it has compared to like a lot of what other things are out there. Yeah, that's fair. I think 
it's a it rides a weird line between operetta and musical and it it kind of ties into both a lot of andrew Lloyd weber stuff does that though i think it's very much like that that particular style and you either like it or you don't um mm -hmm. similar in a different way to lin-manuel miranda you know a lot of people you either like love his stuff or you hate it you know what i mean it's not a... oh no he's fantastic in that range yeah. 100%. 100 you're on hey, hello, hello. All right, good. How doing? I hated Hamilton. Hate, hate, hate. I loved the you game. Hated Hamilton? The rest of it set it on fire. I hate, I, I don't like it when they advance the plot with just singing. Like music, music is kind of a bad, like I need you to advance the plot with words. And if you just do it with singing or some sort of, I, I just could get completely lost. And I realized like a half an hour later, I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. I have no idea, and I, I can't. And I didn't. I didn't think the whole whatever the heck that thing was. That said, I, there was some really cool aspects. The King though is phenomenal. It's quite literally the only show tune I've ever listened to in my car by myself by choice. The, the yeah. King's part is that is awesome. They're hilarious. The three. Yeah. They're hilarious. Yes. Absolutely. I'm just realizing how not cultured I am. Uh, so I, I'm taking it in. <laughs> Okay. Hi, me too, Chris. <laughs> I don't know if that's true. Everybody Matt, has their input. inputs a little. What'd you say? Matt, can you turn up your inputs a little? You're a little quiet. Yes. Oh, no, you're good. Chris, you're the one who's quiet. I am? Okay. Give me just a sec. Oh, never mind. Is it me? No, Matt sounds like liquid gold. It's the hair. Like always. It's like Samsung. You cut it off and it just it's turns scroogey. <laughs> um, I cut my hair off. I, I think I'm doing all right. Yeah, I'm going to slowly just like dial it back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You don't want to do it all. No, it's so cool when you go in and it's like the whole thing just goes. Whoosh. Did you guys quit rubbing that in? I mean, stop. Then oh, yeah. It's have, so, so difficult. Hair. Gosh. Uh, you barely. Don't get the other angles. Oh, all right. Thanks. Thanks for showing us. <laughs> we get the back to you got it Thank you, you got it <laughs> that's, that's probably a good segue for the the title of our keto panel which is the fail horseman um and so tim with red siege chris with 40 north and matt with open security and then of course uh, me with grim each one of us has created founded and runs um a um, an offensive security consulting company and we have had many trials and tribulations, starting with huge fuck ups and mistakes, right? And what's cool is we talk about it all the time. And so I thought it'd be fun for us to share a lot of these experiences with the crowd that we've had. Um, and so Tim, since you physically show the most like pain with the loss of hair and the gray, <laughs> um, we're gonna let you 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 kick it off. Yeah, we had. Um... I mean, I'm in, a, I'm in a hotel. I'm actually teaching this week, so I'm, I've cordoned myself on my classroom after finishing <coughs> on time a little bit early. We're, we're okay. Uh, so if you hear other stuff, it's rando hotel people. Anyway, um, I think one of the, the biggest ones early on is is trying to nail down some of the agreements. Like you're like, I, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing here. I, don't, I have no clue what I don't know. And I remember the first one that really bit me in the butt for like. All right, got the contract all signed, like, you know, still early on, still super excited about every single contract that's being signed. And we get to the kickoff call and they're like, by the way, we need off our testing. We're like, yeah, but, you know, the contract's already signed. I'm like, yeah, but we need to change that. Like, contract's already signed. And, you know, I, I don't have the capability to say, no, we're not doing the gig anymore. And they're like, oh, great. Now we're doing this. We're uh, going to stay up uh, all night for multiple weeks and, uh, and then work. And, and that brings a, a little bit of pain. So yeah, there, there's, there's number one for Tim. So it gets to a point where like, you just don't have to work off hours anyways. Cause I think I, we're still there. We still do it just to make people happy. It seems like I, oh, I we, we, we do. So now, now in the contract, if you want off hours, we charge you extra. So yeah. we've had, three ever take us up on that and we try to bring the pain we're like look you want off hours it's gonna be 25 percent and every once in a while they're like fine done you're like oh yeah uh, damn that's it. exactly what we do i don't <laughs> I wanna, to like infosec is so so prone to burnout to begin with and i mean like if you're gonna make your team 
do off hour testing, you're already bur if you're an infosec, you're already burning out, right? Are you really going to do that? So yeah, we do the exact same thing. So we're going to make it as, as painful for you to require us to test off hours as possible so that, you know, we're going to share the burden here. Yeah, we, 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 I mean, one of the things we try to do to unfail that is like, look, we'll, 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 we'll give them some of the, much the money to the consultant. So it's, a, it sucks, but it ideally sucks a little bit less when they can, I don't know, buy fishing poles or whatever the hell. I don't know. I always give them a couple <laughs> days off. <laughs> so, uh, we're Chris, lucky. What's, uh, yeah, no, yeah. Go what, what's the, well, first of all, I think we're lucky that none of us work in IR because uh, you talk about burnout. <laughs> <Yeah>. IR <laughs> burns you out Am I even faster, right? We're talking like <laughs> one to two years of life expectancy because of that challenge. And that was something we did at Grim. <laughs> we actually said, we're not going to do IR because uh, the management challenge and that burnout piece, I didn't, I didn't see how I could do that to our people. Um, so back, back to you, Chris, what, what was, uh, what was one of your big fails? Um, I think especially when we were first really starting, we were trying to figure out like, how do we do marketing? Like, how do we do like get leads and get work? And, um, like still to the day that that's a mystery. I, I would say, I mean, we do, we do a lot of, um, like blog posts and stuff. We're like, do, I mean, do we need to get out there and like pay for something? And one of the first things that we, uh, got suckered into was, hey, uh, we have this like big luncheon conference thing full of like CISOs just for you to talk to all day. It's a 10K buy-in and you can go there for like lunch and talk to people and stuff. We're like, or it's like more breakfast and lunch. We're like, you know what? We'll, we'll try something different, see how it works. Um, worst decision like that we've ever made. Like we went there, we talked with people like Z, like literally nothing came out of it. Um, it was basically a bunch of people that wanted to go for free lunch, which who wouldn't want to go for free lunch and breakfast and kind of just get out of the office. And we spent, yeah, that was probably about 10, a little more than 10 grand just to get in, travel, all of that, and um, had absolutely nothing come from it. And we still get hit up by the, the same organization. We're like, hey, you guys want to come back and sponsor this again? We're like, absolutely not. Like, please take us off your list. Like, it, it's just it was, it was a bad choice for us when we were first starting. And it was a, an expensive hit. To, to and if that. I can add to, to yours, we did something similar. So uh, if you've got a business, one of the things you'll do is you'll get hit from these magazines and they're like, hey, you've oh. been selected for, and, it, and you, you all know it's, it's it's malarkey, right? But you're like, you know, it's getting out there. And, the, and the, you tell them no, and then they cut the price back. So we're like, all right. And, and we, we tried it twice. One of them actually wasn't terrible because they actually keep retweeting stuff for us. And they got a decent following. The other one was complete waste, and, and we're 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 done with that now. <laughs> no, no, hard pass. I, I swear, it's like once a week I'll get something like that, fifteen hundred dollars for your like promotion or possible inclusion, and it makes me feel like every time I see Bryson tweet something with like all the sales people, like all the random sales messages that he gets, I was like, oh my gosh, it never ends, does it? Like it, it never ends. That's 80% of my email at least. Oh, yeah. A good junk mail filter has been slowly starting to go, uh, been worth the effort. Uh, yeah, we, we, we started to adding, I took, this, I took this cue from Dave Kennedy, is we have an, uh, an exchange mail rule that if you, you, you get two tries, you mess up once, we, we keep track. The second time you go in a list and it, it automatically rejects and, and says some inappropriate things in response about spammers. <laughs> Actually, very appropriate because they deserve it. So they, they get a hard, their entire organization immediately blocked. Ironically, I had one of those like talk to a bunch of CISOs uh, marketing emails come in today uh, where they sent okay. me the email and they sent me that same email again within two minutes. So it would have immediately broken your filter. There you go. Yeah. So Matt, what's your, what's your big, uh, your big fail? My turn, I may as well share the love because I've done tests with uh, uh, both Chris and uh, Tim. And so, so one of my biggest fails, maybe the biggest, in fact, was a red team I was doing with Chris, actually. And we were hacking a casino. Oh, oh yeah, I know, fun stuff. You know the story, right, Chris? Yeah. I do remember. <laughs> I that, yeah. Oh, yeah. So we're hacking a casino. You're like, oh, yeah, burst that dirt off my shoulder. This is what I'm doing red team for. This is what I always wanted. Um, and so, so I'm, I'm lead on it and, and, uh, I'm working with Chris and, uh, we've got a web app and they also have the casino that we're going after. And I'm supposed to be doing the web app first, and then we're going to do a lot of the red teaming together, but they're running a little bit in parallel, but it started off a little funky. So we got this, this, this email in from, 
uh, their CISO to, to get this all sorted, uh, to get it started, right? And we do all the scheduling and all that stuff, but they were, he was emailing us from a Gmail. Okay, a little bit of red flags here already, right? But of course, you gotta, you gotta verify exactly who that is. We're on the phone with him, we talked to him. Yes, it was in fact the exact person that we thought it was. It was the right person. It wasn't just some random person hiring us to do a red team for a casino illegally. No, this was actually the CISO. Uh, and the reason why he <laughs> wanted to, uh, to communicate with us on this, uh, uh, this Gmail was because he said, hey, the, the security team, they are watching uh, the email the whole time. And I wanna make sure this is a not announced test because I wanna test them uh, without them knowing. Like, okay, that, I, I buy it, makes sense. And so we started doing this test and we scheduled this red team for, I don't know, three or six weeks. It was actually scheduled, I think it was six weeks. It's actually scheduled for a pretty darn long red team. Yeah, and so this, this, this CISO was really, really, really needy. So like uh, I'm on the phone with him like weeks before the test on an almost daily basis because he's got he's got to like get this thing right and he wants to check this box off and he wants to see if we're going to do that and so on and so on we're being nice about it but like literally by the time we hit the test i'm already like 40 hours invested in this engagement I'm like wow please stop now please and so we start the test and on test day of course he's really really verbose with me again uh the whole time so i'm like i'm literally not getting to test whatsoever um, i'm talking with chris a little bit and he's doing the red team he's got he's got cobalt strike booted up all this kind of stuff and within like two hours and i've basically been on the phone with the guy the entire time over this two-hour period within two hours chris domain admin on the uh uh the the casino the whole thing's gone she's like got it okay hey do you want to start dialing up the noise he's like oh wow you already you're already there huh oh okay um, let me get back to you real quick. He does some stuff. I maybe like throw a packet or two at the web app at this point. Um, and he comes back and he's like, okay, yeah, go ahead and dial up some noise. Yeah, we do. And eventually the blue team, they, they catch on to something. So we just, we're dialing up as much as we can. I just start dropping metasploits in random places to get them to look. They find it. Chris is in the email, right? He's in their email. And he's watching their IR happen. Their, their, their incident handling is like, oh yeah, they see it. They fix it. They think it's completely eradicated. It's like, oh yeah, we're ready to move on. We just like face palm the whole time. It's like, oh no. So first failure, <laughs> casino. Second failure, here gets here's where it gets crazy. It turns out next day comes around and uh the 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 CISO's like starting to sweat bullets and he can hear a lot of like nervous tension in his voice. And over the course of the next couple of days, we realize that this test is not only not announced to the blue team, it's not announced to anybody in management of the casino at all. And he was specifically told not to do a third party test at all either. So we're a couple of days into the six week test and we're like, we are out, we're done, completely done. Um, but also I've been communicating with this guy the whole time. I've barely gotten to do any testing whatsoever. Chris gets to do all the fun red team stuff, hack casino. And I'm sitting here playing with his web app, but I barely got to touch the web app. So I'm like still at the very beginning of the scanning piece because I've gotten to do nothing except talk with him. And now it's like, okay, we're just gonna deliver a report with what we've got. I'm like, I'm gonna do a web app pen test report with a Nikto scan? I don't know. I found <laughs> nothing because it spent no time on it. So I'm like, ah. And it was absolutely the most garbage report I've A ever made. I was embarrassed for it. So, so I actually spent the rest of like the report time that I could do just doing as much OSINT against the web app as I possibly could. Cause we're like, we're not touching any of your stuff ever again. <laughs> also fired the customer. Awesome. So yeah, uh, fails all around there. Except for Chris, he owned the entire. Uh, no, that's that's a rough. I mean, that's a scary one, right? Like you you think you're operating legitimately, like you got the documentation. I mean, legally you should be more than covered, but like you don't know just the threat of a lawsuit. Just I mean, you got to go to court regardless. You're probably gonna win, but now you're still in court. Like that. That's a scary situation. Like I don't want to be in. Like that, that's yeah, rough. absolutely. That's the worst nightmare style. I mean, it's all about negligence, right? And so if you can, sh because it's going to be a civil case, so it's preponderance of the evidence, which means if you can show uh, that you have done due diligence, which we absolutely did, right? We There was this Gmail thing that was a little weird. That was definitely a red flag. Uh, but then we identified exactly who this person was. It was the right person. They were the CISO. Uh, we had every reason to believe that what we were doing was completely above board, which it was just not on the CISO's side. So yeah, we wouldn't have lost, but that's still, that's not a fight that you want to even yeah. have to have. On the bright side, the casino yeah. completely blamed the CISO, which I think that's probably a good call on their part. And it didn't actually turn out poorly. It was just uh, wow, wow. Yeah. So, yeah. I have a, you I guys have ever a have... Oh, sorry, go oh, on. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead, Brian. Yeah, I have a derivative of that one um, where 
uh, it's not quite the same. Whereas, like the so it was for a large auto manufacturer, and we had, of course, we had we had legal approval, which took for forever for that, and the it was an entire car and scope. Um, but what was what the challenge is is I think there were probably about 15 to 20 different product teams that were a part of the scope of the assessment, and they all didn't necessarily agree with this idea of having a third party do this. And so we had, um, you know, we had the le we were we were well, there was no question of the legality of what we were doing, but the the test was a constant fight for documentation and detail because of course you know you you only have so much time to do that kind of test. And the more you have to spend reverse engineering and going and figuring things out, the you know the more expensive and the longer it has, and the more likely your project is to fail. Um, I think the funny cap on that one is we ended up finding, um, and it became a finding in our report, but it was technically out of scope, was because of the challenges we had working with the different teams, we went out and found a Russian file server with all of their like proprietary files so it we ended up like finding the stuff that really helped us do our job because they didn't give it to us but it was some random russian server where it was oh my god <laughs> wow you guys ever have a, a customer give you like out of scope ip ranges all the time yep test our, test our part on purpose yeah, but not on purpose. Yeah. It's mostly. Oh, I've had, like, I've had on purpose. <laughs> really? Yeah, I, I, I haven't either. It's always scary though when we're starting kicking off our initial stuff. Thank God, like it's never hit the exploitation or like any phase like that. It's usually when we're doing scans, like looking at what's going on, and then we're realizing this this doesn't look right, and we have to very quickly try to call them just to see like, what <laughs> do you do you own this? Are you sure you do? And then it's like, oh, I, th there was like a slash. That should have been like a slash 24 instead of a 22 or something like that and it's uh been interesting yeah we had one that they were trying to onboard a vendor and they uh had some they were doing like their internal review on, on the security of this organization right all the questionnaires data center crap right all that junk and they're like yeah we need to test this vendor and we started talking and they started picking up like this, something seems off and it, i'm like and I asked the question like do you have authorization i'm like yeah okay at the surface level, I mean, I mean, why would you not think that they would? But eventually, it's like this, this is a vendor, and we're testing them. Like, do you have approval in paperwork? Like, we had to get more and more and more specific. And eventually, they're like, "Well, no, we don't have that." I'm like, oh my god! I'm like, this is not gonna. I'm gonna get shell on this thing, and we're gonna get arrested. Like, terrible. <laughs> okay. so I got, I got two, two ones in two different directions. Um, international. Right, so the first is um, Canada, while it is our friendly neighbor to the north, trying to do work in Canada is actually really, 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 really hard to do. Um, and it, you know, it takes all these hoops because you have to justify that there is nobody there that can do it to, to get right. it. But that wasn't what got us. Um, we actually had somebody on the, on the flight there got stopped by customs and during interrogation, they realized that they were going there for work. <laughs> we, you know, we had a we had a gig, and so it was uh, he, we we were given the riot act of like, don't you ever dare do this again. Like, we'll stop you. Um, and so we, we learned that one. Um, the second one was oh, what's your flag? Because they'll flag your account. You're, they'll flag your yeah. profile, and every time yeah. now you get that extra round. Yeah, I I, I now have that, sir. Come to this line. Oh. <laughs> Well, I mean, Tim, you naturally invite it. So the, the second one, it was trying to hire um, somebody in the European Union. Um, and it's the same kind of thing. Like once you start looking at, like we, we, we had negotiated, we had gone through things and we didn't realize that the, the terms of trying to work with that country and then the, uh, a you know a citizen of the European Union and it it killed the whole thing because we were just like uh, as far as we can tell even if we tried to 1099 you this is going to take us like two to three months of like dedicated legal effort Ooh. and we had to rescind which which was sucked yeah hiring people is is hard we I remember when we were looking to do um, we were looking to bring on an intern at the time and um, 
uh, we had like a kind of like a test, just like a base, just to see where people are, um, like what you can do, like what skill set do you have? It's like super minimal, probably took like an hour maybe of your time, just so we could see what people are doing. And um, uh, had a bunch of people request for it. And so we had only a couple like responses back. And um, I remember one person I thought like did actually a pretty decent job. And so we, we ended up talking with them. And uh, I get on the phone and, or they, they give me a call back and they're like, Hey, I'm so and so. Um, uh, I just want to let you know, first of all, that um, I cheated on your text. And like, what? How do you cheat on that? I was like, okay. They're like, I had my my friend do the whole thing. Um, I actually didn't like do it at all. And I was like, okay, this this conversation's starting great. And this, <laughs> I, I was basically on the phone for like 30 minutes uh, with this, because I didn't want to be like rude and just cut them off or anything. But there's, it was basically them telling me cut that them off. they. Done. Yeah, they had their friend do the test and uh, they didn't understand it, but they still wanted me to bring them on board. That's like, I I appreciate the effort and I applaud you, but like I, I've never had someone either before then in my career or since then ever tell me that they just outright didn't do the test, gave it to someone else and then still thought that they were like, they, they should be hired there and brought on. So it was a, it was a weird, weird scenario. I've just not had that before. I've had so for uh, for hiring, we always ask for a writing sample, and I'm I'm a little bit vague, like, hey, I want to see what does it look like when you write a report, and I'm kind of vague because I'm like, I want to see what do they think. Um, three times in my career, I had somebody send me an internal pen test report, a okay, from their company, and they attempted to redact it. Redaction is exceptionally hard, um, and in in all three cases, I'm like, cool. I can see this company name and you gave me a hack by numbers. You have violated your company's NDA. You violated their NDA. I, literally the, the phone call, I, I'm much more direct than Chris. And I was like, look, here's the deal. You will never work here because you will, you're, you're going to, you're going to take a client data and just share it with random people whenever the hell you feel like that. But it was literally a hack yeah. by numbers. And one of them had like really, really bad redaction. And they like redacted, they did a search and replace, but all of the image had the company names and domain names. There were passwords in there that probably still were. It was like, oh. like this isn't even a teaching moment. You're applying for a senior position, like you're done for all time. Like, and it, like I said, three times I've seen this. It, it's, uh, by the way, people listening, don't do that. Don't, 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 no. Don't cheat. Yeah, I've seen something like don't that before. Don't your internal private work, uh, do it yourself. Yeah, one of the bright sides about being a smaller company is that I, I don't, I've never hired someone who I haven't known personally um, for at least a little while. So you get to you get to miss out on a lot of those fails. <laughs> um, but that doesn't scale. Um, I have seen something similar to that report though, where I've done a, I've done a pen test for an organization and um, uh, they provision like an internal system to do an internal pen test, which is a Windows device with some stuff on it, and they let you access it. And so I, I log into this Windows device, right? And I'm looking at the desktop, and there's a bunch of things already installed. I see like Nmaps there, so the Zenmap logo is over there. I'm like, oh, they configured this device for me. That's really nice of them. And I open up the My Documents folder, right? And what do I see? It's last year's pen test report. No. No. Yeah. Ah. And guess what? So I open up the pen test report. I'm like, okay, let's see what they did. Let's see what worked last year. And the pen tester got domain admin, and they didn't redact anything in the report at all. So to be fair, I'd never put a pen test report out there where the domain admin password is in plain text in the pen test report. That's don't do that. And so because I mean the idea, of course, is if you find the domain admin password, that should probably get changed, right? So you might think, oh, I can put it in the pen test report because they're going to change that, right? Guess what? No. So the first thing I try on this pen test is I just like, oh, okay, see if it still works. Yeah, it worked. It worked just fine. That's the shortest path to domain admin I've ever had. We had one <laughs> where was, I, I enumerated users and it was another pen test company and I saw an account and it was, a, I enumerated the domain admins and it was a pen test company that, that I, <laughs> we're all probably quite familiar with that was in that group. And I'm like, I'm gonna guess that the password is the same as the username and it worked. And I was like, oh, no. And then I had to write this up and I'm like, so I found this account. For an organization, and the password was the same. <laughs> it was a, uh, it was uncomfortable, but I laughed. It was not that uncomfortable. I just pretended it kind of was. <laughs> did they, did they appreciate the, the like stupidity of that? Like, 
we should never hire them again kind of thing? I mean, I don't know whose stupidity is worse, right? Because like, you, they, I presume they put this in last year's report that we got domain admin and you should clean up this account and they clearly never, I mean, I, 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 there's layers. I, I don't know. It's like an onion that was yeah. dunked in poop. I don't know. To be fair, that's a really common thing that I will see actually, uh, like all the time. Not necessarily that the password is the same as the username, but where there's a pen test company that I can recognize and there's an account that is in Active Directory from that company. It's probably that organization, like the, the, the organization that you're testing, not the pen test company, who made that account. And in the scope of work and the rules of engagement, there's probably a bunch of things that say, okay, you need to take, you need to deprovision all of these things after the pen test um, so we can go back to, you know, standard or whatever it is. Uh, but as the pen test firm, honestly, you should never trust the customer to do the right thing ever. On the other hand, though, it's also a little bit tough because what if you're going back in to do remediation uh, validation? Right, so you maybe don't want to f get rid of the account and deprovision them until after that phase happens. But what if they never actually bring you back in to do that because they didn't actually follow through on the whole scope? Now you've got all of these little things going around. But as a result, I end up seeing that all the time. We have Just related to that. Not with we really have bad passwords. We, we <laughs> ship a, like a, a VM for remote testing. We have a client from two years ago. Their VM is still trying to check back into our infrastructure. Oh, God. <laughs> God. Two years. Two years, we're like, why? What is this IP? Like, oh, right, that's. Mm. <laughs> I, I assume you've tried to inform them. We've we're, we've done other. We, we're doing another test. We finished it like a month ago. We're like, hey, by the way, can you can you deprovision this other box? I'm like, oh yeah, we're we're on top of that. They are not. <laughs> yeah. I've seen that kind of thing a couple times in a little like a sideline manner, uh, where I've identified a like a SANS VM from like a SANS class in an enterprise environment. And as an instructor, I know the default passwords to those, so just log straight in. Um, I've seen that more than once. I've seen that more than once. It's like, oh, your that password and username are sec560. Huh. Well, Oops. since we're complaining about clients now and client fails, um, we've all had the we've all had the experience, right, of the the client who shows up and is like, I want a penetration test. And you're always, of course, like, what does that mean to you? What do you what do you think you're asking <laughs> for, right? Like, let's let's get on the same definition of vocabulary. Um, and the price range usually dictates that answer as well. You know, uh, well, like I, uh, this, this should be $5,000. What do you <laughs> think we can do for $5,000, right? Like this is the, you want me to do, just give you an SS report? Like you can't run your own, like what, what do you want? Um, and uh, that, so that, that like that Delta of definition where, you know, of course, fixing up what a pen test is, what the scope is, what's a red team versus what a pen test is and a vulnerability assessment, why something costs what it costs and the expense and the time that it takes to do that. Um, and um, of course, going back to my, my other automotive manufacturer example, but um, that same problem again, where they, they delay, they delay, they delay. And they're like, Hey, can you do this tomorrow? And you're like, I'm still wait for the documentation because we haven't confirmed scope from the a bill bill to do this properly. I've had uh, happen a couple times in my career. I can't remember the most recent time, but um, we're setting up like infrastructure where we're doing pen test. Uh, it was a pen test against an organization and um, get through the assessment. Like we've got C2 outbound and everything and um, we've been able to do the test and everything went well and it was over with. And so we go through and clean up and we have documentation that we use internally, which I'm sure everyone does, that uh, we check to see, okay, where do we have like access to, what modifications we make to systems, um, and make sure that we basically revert everything back to the original state. Um, so we go through all of that, check everything off and call it a day at the end of the test. And it'd be like two weeks later, oh, this happened multiple times. Uh, that customer would be like, hey, are you guys still active in our environment? We're like, no. And uh, they're like, well, we're, we're seeing systems beaconing out to what you're using for C2. And I was like, there's, there's no way. And so we'll go and check. And um, sure enough, we had like active sessions inside their environment. Like, well, what is going on? Like, how did that happen? We, we had no idea. And um, kill access. And uh, basically two weeks later, uh, same exact phone call again. And they're like, are, why are you guys still inside our environment? And we were like, we just went through this last week. Like, I, I don't know what to tell you. And uh, since then, we, we've learned to tell them to check for this. And they're like, OK, we're going to do some investigation on our side. And uh, in the middle of the assessment, this customer had taken a, a backup, a, a live backup of multiple systems. 
when we had access to their systems. And so about every two weeks, they were rolling back to that snapshot and we would get sessions coming back in in our systems. And um, it was it was interesting because ever since it happened the first time, we've learned, okay, we know we cleaned off. Um, and that's not necessarily like a client fail either. That just happened to be bad timing, but it, it was a, a funny situation where we're like, I, we're really bad at our job if we can't figure out like why we can't get you to stop calling back to us. It was a, it was a unique one. Yeah, I've seen a bunch of barely, fairly good. similar like backup problems happen uh, where uh, in this case it was just they had it, they had a cycle to revert to snapshot on something all the time, but it kept reverting their patches off. Um, there was like a couple fails that were happening at the same time here. So this this organization oh. had like their domain admin had had their password found by the pen tester uh, three years running. And so they were really, really like antsy about I'm not going to get caught this year. I'm not going to get caught this year. And so I find a system and this is this is like yeah, last year or so. So this is actually fairly recent. And um, it's it's vulnerable to eternal blue. And I'm like, what? Oh, come on. Easy peasy. So we, we just <laughs> we get we get in and uh, we were able to mimic cats. Uh, Crunchyroll Guard was disabled and get the domain admin password. And I, I, I happened to do this on a Friday. Like it's Friday evening. And I'm like, ah, man, I'm not going to just get domain admin and then stop. So I continue to just basically finish the entire pen test over the weekend. And on Monday, I realized, because I'm doing reporting, I'm missing a screenshot. So I go back into the environment. Domain admin password doesn't work anymore. Huh. Fortunately, they would reverted the snapshots off again, so we were just able to get it back. In the review of the test, here's what actually happened. That domain administrator, the entire test window, because this was a, uh, like a crystal box test, right? So the new testing was going on. The entire test window, the only thing he did there is he sat there and kept resetting his password every 15 minutes the entire time. So I was really quite lucky to get in uh, and get DA on Friday evening because he went home. And so I didn't, I didn't recognize that this was happening at all until Monday when it didn't work anymore. Uh, fortunately, there was some nasty solar wind stuff, so that was still easy to get back to DA. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, that was funny. That was hilarious. I had a, a, a Tim fail. It was, um, this was way back in the day. I was with Fishnet before they merged with Optip. And uh, we, were, we were doing a physical onsite, which those are a ton of fun. So always rule of thumb, always carry the get out of jail free card with you, right? Let's get out of my car, put it in my bag and realized I was going to walk around. So I left the bag in the car and uh, started walking around and, and uh, try to get in. I get confronted by security. I'm like, hey, cool. Let me show you my get out of jail free card. I'm like, oh, that's not in my pocket. That's in my bag. Cool. Walk me, with me to the car. I, I, I trust me. I'm actually. I get back to the car. I've locked my keys inside the car now too, because oh, no. they were in the bag. So now I'm trying to convince this guy not to call the cops. I'm like, no, no, no. Seriously, <laughs> really. This, this, this is my car. You can believe me. Yes, that's my bag. Uh, and I'm calling my wife. I'm like, look, I need you to like literally drop everything and drive the hour to where I'm working as fast as you possibly can with a set of keys, <laughs> or else. <laughs> oh boy, because I'm absolutely screwed. And the, the guy had like a, the, the, I was working with like, his name was like Harry and he had this like name that was like 15 characters long. I had no idea to pronounce it. Who are you working with? Harry, no, blah, 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 blah. Like, I, 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 I got nothing, right? I'm like, that's in my phone, which I, or in my laptop, which is in the bag with the keys, the get jail free card, all in the car. <laughs> it was so embarrassing. And I got busted. Didn't even get in. Meanwhile, coworker flies around the world and shreds a foreign country. I had a very similar physical security assessment where we uh, we were breaking into a bank, and uh, so we're in the bank, right, branch office, and we uh, we get in easy. It was uh, the front doors. You could just um, do. They were they would open with movement, so we just waited in uh, the, the co-locate areas, and then we just wave something through the doors and we got in. So, so we're in the bank, we're doing all kinds of stuff, and we're about to leave because we're done. And I go to the printer because I'm like, okay, there's sometimes sensitive documentation in the printer. I'm going to take a couple pictures for the report. Um, and the first document that's on top of the printer is a franchise agreement. And I go, holy crap, what franchise agreement on the planet allows corporate to hire random people to break into your office and do whatever the heck they want? There's no franchise agreement on the planet that possibly says that. So I'm like, we got to go. Let's get out of here right now. And we leave. Um, and the next day, I'm, I'm starting to write up the report and all that kind of stuff. And I realize I can't find my notes. I'm a little old school. And I take all of my notes in uh, like like a, a notebook. Um, it's, it's because I used to work in a skiff with the military. So you can't really, you know, you got to write it all down on paper or whatnot. Um, so I take all my notes in a notebook. 
And I realize, oh gosh, cold sweats. I left my notebook with every single step that I did to break into this place in that place. Hmm. Um, I had to ask them for my notebook back very nicely. <laughs> they thought that corporate was allowed to send us in there. So they did give me the notebook back and I never told them that we were not supposed to be in there and we just didn't know. Oops. So now I've added a question to our Q and a when we're setting up a physical test that we will always ask, do you know anything about franchises and does your organization do anything related to franchises? I want to know it all. <laughs> um, yeah, that was an oops. Uh, but unlike Tim, I didn't get caught. So. There you go. <laughs> Tim, you're on mute. Yeah. Since we're being recorded, I can't say too much. Uh, I had a coworker do a test, and the uh, the organization was renting the, uh, the the place from the uh, the government. Didn't disclose that ahead of time, and oh. uh, had to frantically leave the country, and will never go back. It's a great story. <laughs> Not right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that is a better story, story. I want to hear. It is a really good story. Uh, I, I have, a, I guess, a similar one like that where I was somewhere and um, I think we take for granted in the United States that like our our government stuff, like things that are classified are treated as classified and they're marked and they're only available in certain places. And, like that's obvious. Well, um, this this country, this place had top secret documents like on a, somebody's random office wall <laughs> and i just like walked up to him i'm like looking at him i'm like uh what's that and he the guy was like oh yeah you shouldn't be seeing that i'm like <laughs> that, that was it like it, it was like it was an entire it was an entire sketch of the intelligence organization uh oh. which i had nothing to do with so we're clear like i i wasn't affiliated with that it's just this guy happened to have that in that and i had access to it and so I was just sitting there. I'm like, this has got to be the worst op sec of all time. <laughs> so I, I, uh, we, we all, so a friend of mine, actually, I think most of you know him. Um, I don't know if I, I can think I'd probably tell Mark's, Mark's name. He was teaching a class in a skiff, not cleared. So a little siren is on, right? And he pulls up the article, like the Snowden thing had recently uh, happened. Well, in the news article on the website, it shows a picture and it says like secret above the picture and someone's like sorry um we have to pull this down because there's uncleared people in here and they can't see that he's like i mean i'm the uncleared person it's it's me who you're afraid of seeing that but i'm the one that's showing it to you and they're like no, can't do it sorry but the, the lights on you 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 we have to shut this down. Nobody can look. It was this whole weird circle. He's like, yeah, but, but I'm the one with the, yeah, it, it was a lovely entertaining circular reasoning that uh, ironically works in the government stuff. Uh, you said the word works. Were you sure that that's the word you were trying to use? That is not the right word. Not the right word. <laughs> Work efficiently, like uh, quickly. Probably not that often. But I have personal. You see that in, I've heard it in conferences where someone will say, they would grab something from Snowden and they're like, well, I'm going to have to show you secret documents. So if you're government people, you have to leave. So you see a bunch of people who are like, I don't, I don't, I don't know what to do here. You're like, fed, 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 fed. <laughs> yeah, no, so this is actually, this is true. Um, even if something is on the internet, if it has been marked as secret or top secret, somebody with a clearance technically is not supposed to look at it because that violates right. your clearance to look at something that is readily available. Right, but they, yeah. they were trying, at the talk thing. They're like, "Wait, what's worse, outing myself as someone with that, or sitting here, brain hurts?" <laughs> it, it also works with labeling too. So, so one of those pranks that you would always pull in like a skiff is if somebody was like working on a document or something and they printed it out. Uh, what you would do is you would just like grab a marker or a sharpie and you just like go uh, S I T K T S right on top of it, and they can't take it out of the uh, the skiff anymore because it's it's marked. It must be true. Well, I heard somebody was, they grabbed some of those stickers and like, it'd be fun to put this on my laptop. And then oh, had yeah. a, a big red sticker on his laptop at the TSA and the TSA is like, mm, we're done here. TSA. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's contraband, right? I mean, technically, they, I mean, I'm sure some of those guys were former military in some shirt, like so they're some way, shape or form. So they're like, I don't know what to do. Brain lock. We're taking this right now. It was a, yeah. 
<laughs> they it took was, my laptop. Yeah, they they missed my giant like multiple stickers. Yeah. It was like all <laughs> over the back with different, you know, green and orange and red. That's when you grab another one of those stickers and you just slap it on their back. Yeah. All right. Well, bringing this to a close, uh, Tim, you got any <laughs> last ones? I, I have. Yeah, probably. I, yeah, but I don't remember. <laughs> All right, no problem, Chris. I mean, I, I just can think of like personal fa failures that I, I, I have to ask like Tim for help. Like, I, I feel like I'm pretty decent at like hacking stuff, but when I see the like SSH port forwarding like madness that like Tim or like everyone else does, I'm like trying to pull out a calculator and like figure out what like what what I'm doing that. That that and using Microsoft Office products like intelligently has probably been like some of the biggest issues that I have. Whereas like, all right, I need to like pivot table, like pivot table. Like, I, I can do this. Like, I, gotta myself. I knew or, it was like, Excel that you were out. talking about because you're a business owner. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, yeah. I, we're on the same page there, but that's about like, okay, can I please figure this out and not take like three hours to get this done right? But uh, people that's, ask that's like, like my. People ask, like, what are you really good at? Excel. Oh, like Excel payloads and macros? <laughs> Just numbers. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, you got anything? Yeah, Tim will like this one uh, real quick. Um, so I was doing Red Team with Tim. And um, so so I'm sitting here, and I was I was like, I'll pick up. Yeah, you know, it's exactly what I'm going with this. This is a pickup Red Team, kind of. So uh, so Tim was there. Uh, Joe Vest was there. And they they were supposed to be there. But last minute, they're like, you know what? We need to just add a third. We just need to get a third in on this. And like, hey, uh, who's gonna, who's good for a pickup Red Team? Matt, come over here. Come over here, Matt. And so I fly out there. Uh, we're in the middle of flyover state, uh, Indiana. And uh, I'm doing Red Team with Tim. And I show up, and I'm like, oh, hey, Matt. We didn't know you were going to be here. Uh, we don't have a plan for any of the Linux systems. Have fun. And so I'm like, okay, um, Netcat, SSH, Wizardry, that kind of stuff. And um, I get access to a bunch of things. Like I'm hacking away and I'm winning. Like I am owning everything. And Tim's over here sitting right next to me and he's doing a lot of PowerShell Empire, but he's trying to make a lot of noise with it. And he's just not getting anything to work at all. And he starts getting more and more and more and more frustrated. And at a certain point in time, he just starts getting shells out of nowhere, but they never fully stage. And he's like, gosh, I don't even think I loaded anything. I don't know where this is coming from. But what? I, no, I had and I'm on the other I, side, and now I'm getting more frustrated because I'm like, I was hacking all kinds of things so well, and I was getting access to different stuff, and I was doing uh, you know, all kinds of stuff, right? And now nothing's working anymore. And I look over at Tim, and I realize that he's getting shells from me because I have fat fingered my L host and I'm like hitting it over here, hitting it over there, left, right, center. And Tim's just like shell, 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 shell. Well, Matt over here is like, man, I need to hang up my red team card because I suck. <laughs> so, there's my fail story. Yeah, the, 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 oh, just dude. to add to that, I had, I had Metasploit running in another tab and then I flipped over to it by accident and I just see pages of <laughs> new session, new session. I'm like, how many digits can you get in sessions? <laughs> <laughs> Session 5000 has opened. Yeah. Bryson, well, what about you? Oh, uh, my last one. I'll, I'll end with a, a business one, um, which is, I think, something we can all appreciate uh, in, in the beginning, right? When, when the company starts and the honeymoon period ends and you start to realize nobody ever pays you on time, um, you start meeting all of the different vagaries of customers who um, refuse to pay you for something or take advantage of your something. Um, and then, of course, like I said, just the, the general, they don't pay on time. And that was that was the first moment where we almost broke. Um, and I can't remember if it was, uh, I want to say that it was like Christmas of 2014. And we were two days away from um, like not being able to make it. And I started dialing for dollars because I had six customers at that time. And I was just like, if one of you just gave me a check, if just one of you would please give me a check. Like I can get through payroll, like I can, we can make it another payroll period. And then like, you know, you know, as you know, right, it's one problem at a time. And so I dialed for dollars and it was like right before the deadline that somebody e, -E deposited me money um, on a personal appeal uh, to allow us to keep going. Oh, I feel for you. I, know I went related to that. We had two different accounts because I like them to deposit into one account so they can't. And I'll immediately sweep that over. 
ZDA. Uh, but right before payroll, I reversed all of the, I did transaction in the reverse order. So I literally every overdrew every single account. And, I, and I'm in Singapore, so I'm trying to get this done really quickly because I'm like, oh crap, time zones, this is gonna happen. Literally overdrew every single account because everything transferred the wrong ways, except for this one stupid account that had all of the money. Oh, so dumb. All right, well, gentlemen, good to see you all again. Callie, hold on, relax. <laughs> it's my dog, Callie, K-A-L-I, um, which is a CTF challenge for those of you paying attention for one of our challenges. Uh, so good to see you all, and I look forward to the time that we can do it in person, because I definitely want to hear the rest of Tim's forum story. Same, same, same. Yeah, hard same. <laughs> it, you need to hear that awesome. story. Thanks a lot for having us. Thanks, everybody. So we're going to be closing out our fifth GrimCon here. Uh, thank you to volunteers. Thank you to the MCs, my fabulous fellow MC, Trisha Howard, the other unicorn, and Meryl oh, and Wade on track two, and Dwayne with the workshop and uh, Texas Cyber Summit, and also hacking is not a crime um, for making this an awesome GrimCon. Um, all the videos except for. Um, John's will be posted to the YouTube channel. And that last week of December, six months from now, will be the next GrimCon number six. So if you know anybody who could benefit from getting that first talk, taking that first leap on the stage, we want to see them. And I'm going to hold Trisha to it. Trisha is going to come on the cooking show next year. And we're going to record that rap. And yes, we will. 100%. Yes, we will. Do you have any final words, Trisha? No, just thank you so much uh, for letting me hang out with you today. This was like, this was so much fun. And, you know, thank you so much to uh, the Grim team and uh, all of our speakers. It was super, super awesome. Wrote down some amazing things. Uh, and as somebody who dipped their toe into speaking, keynote speaking at GrimCon, I can say uh, for new speakers, if you are interested to type, tie into what he was saying, um, it is a super safe and awesome place to do it here. So if you are looking for a place to uh, kick off your, your speaking shoes, Grim is the place to go. And also uh, shout out to uh, Show the Mic and Cyber, um, who was our partner on the new speaker track. Um, fantastic work from them. And um, I'm forgetting somebody else. Oh, and of course, the check out the swag store with the proceeds going to Black Girls Code. Yep. Awesome. Dance party. It's happy hour time, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, Dan Weiss's happy hour is, is kicking off now. Um, the link is in the Discord. And then Kenny and I are going to be making Asian wedding soup on Unicorn Chef in 30 minutes. Cool, cool. Well, it's a pleasure as always. Okay. See y'all. See you on the Twitters. Bye. Bye.